Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, thank you for being here. Uh, inshallah, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm expecting more people to join us, but we'll go ahead and begin. Um, I want to first thank the NCC, the Mayor especially, and um, the Midwest, and all of the staff and volunteers for facilitating the event. And also a shout out to Amina, my dear friend, who uh, is the reason why we're here. She reached out actually, I think a couple months back, and said, you know, have you thought of doing a parenting workshop? And I had in the past, but mashallah, I think with her little nudge and push, uh, that's why we're here. And uh, the aim really is to give us um, an opportunity to to meet with each other, to learn from one another. You know, they say it takes a village, but unfortunately because of our lifestyles, we're all very um, in our own worlds, and sometimes we forget that there is a village outside. Um, so hopefully by ha having a space to dialogue, we can actually implement what that means, which is really leaning on each other, learning from one another, um, and just, inshallah, doing this together. Because as we know, we're in need of jama'ah, and uh, we need each other, inshallah. So um, before we officially start, um, there's an outline you can see right there of what we're going to try to achieve today. Assalamu alaikum, welcome. Um, so my background, for those who don't know me, I um, am a Bay Area native. I um, pretty much raised here. I wasn't born here, but I was raised here. And then for about nine years, I actually left and I went to Southern California. And um, alhamdulillah, while I was there, I had my own children and I also started a preschool co-op for three years and I worked closely with young children. And before that, actually, I, I taught here in the Bay Area. So I taught at different Islamic schools. So alhamdulillah, I have uh, experience teaching and being around children. I love children. Um, and so, you know, this uh, workshop really comes from my heart, uh, because this is hard work for me, uh, just anything that has to do with children. Um, uh, so we'll, uh, you know, that's just my, my background. I also am a mental health advocate, I'm a writer, um, I, uh, I edit, so I do a few different things, and I, I give presentations. I have talks here the second Thursday of every month, and we do programs at Cali, uh, with regarding women, and, and um, you know, for women, I should say. So alhamdulillah, that's, that's pretty much my background. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. Um, so before we actually continue the, the presentation, I wanted to just ask you guys, and I like audience participation, by the way, so I want you to participate. Um, let's talk about the ideals that we create about marriage, life, and parenting before we ever get married. What are some uh, dreams that people have about what married life is going to be like, um, and what the family, like what a, what your perfect, picture perfect Muslim uh, American family looks like. What do you think? Give me some answers. What do you think of your spouse? Um, I think that, you know, as an American Muslim, you think that you would be integrated into society, mm -hmm. as well as be able to retain your Islamic identity while navigating in society. Mm -hmm. So having both, sort of that balance, right? And uh, what about your actual like life being married? What are the sort of again? I, I want to talk about like what we dream about. You know, little girls or little boys or maybe not little boys. So much. Little girls tend to dream about their their weddings and what life is going to be like, right? But what are the constructs that we have about marriage life? For example, um, when it comes to your spouse, what do what in one line? What do women usually say? There's you know I. I want my spouse to be my what? Soulmate. Soulmate. Very good. What else? <sighs> Women tend to want a particular quality in their spouse. Backbone. Backbone. I'm sorry, Backbone. 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 Very good. <laughs> Oftentimes, we hear that women want a best friend, right? They want to marry their best friend, right? Um, men, on the other hand, I don't know if I hear brothers saying that as much. I think for men, it's a little different. Right? They might not necessarily want that. But they want a woman who they're happy with, but also who has the approval of his family, right? his family especially. Right? I think that's an ideal partner right? for uh, for adults. So they want someone who can make, you know, just give him some balance there. Right? And so what we do, we tend to dream up this perfect idea of what a Muslim family is supposed to look like, right? And when it comes to our children, they are everything, right? I mean, 
they're perfect. First of all, they're geniuses, right? Every <laughs> of course, of course. We all assume and actually th believe that our kids are geniuses, whether we say it or not. Like, oh my God, did you see that? And every moment is captured. And so that they're, they're, you know, much more from the beginning. You know, that's what they are. But then we also set them up with a lot of expectations, right? We want them to have the best edad, with their elders especially, uh, do their, all their work on time, be very responsible, clean, know when to recycle, you know, be conscientious. We want all of these things. And on top of that, we want them to want to go and pray. So we dream up all of these ideals, which are much more love wonderful. Um, and, you know, we imagine, again, when you're thinking about your family life together, you're imagining, I'm sure, meals together, breaking fast together, praying together, right? When you're intending to start a family, inshallah, those are the things that you should be aspiring to, that you have a strong family unit, and, and there's just much so much connection happening, right? Um, and so, you know, there you go. And I chose these images, by the way, there are star to, to kind of go with my time. I chose these images because they're, you know, they're animated, they're, they're dreams, they're, they're visions that we have, uh, but they're not always necessarily true, right? Even if we have the best of intentions, um, are intentions good intentions enough? Right? Are they enough? And do things always go as we plan? Not necessarily, right? And that's why more important than, than anything is how we respond, right? Because things might not go the way we want them to, but how we respond to what is happening to us, right, really says a lot about what, whether or not we're going to, to have difficulty and challenges or we're going to, inshallah, have success. Because if we focus on our own responsibilities and our duties and leave the rest of all this front that we submit, inshallah, this is where the, the, the this is where we will 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 find that just by letting go of this need to control outcomes, right? Because a lot of us, when we build up a dream and an ideal, we're stuck on the outcomes. And the outcomes is what we want. And so that can inform our parenting. Because it's like, I have this ideal of how everything is supposed to go. And if it doesn't go that way, there's something wrong. But if you're doing everything, inshallah, in your power correctly, the outcomes you leave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And this is a part of submission. That we just realize we can't control everything. Right? But we can definitely control our own selves. So... The point here is that good intentions aren't enough. They're obviously important, right? We believe in the matter of the yet, and we believe in this. But um, the problem is when we take, again, these good intentions and attach them to these dreams, and then we treat marriage like it's a right, like it's something that I'm entitled to, right? That it's, or, or family, you know, that's something that I should just, I deserve. And the reason why is because, um, you know, we, we live in, in a, in a or, or there's systems around us where everything's based on, you know, on it's a merit system. So if I do good, you know, I get this in, re, in return. And that's sort of how we think about even when it comes to our relationships. So when you walk into a relationship with that mindset or, you know, starting a family with this mindset, that if I do everything correctly, it's go, if things should go as planned, it kind of sets you up to have an entitled sort of, you know, um, mindset going into that. And that right there is also a problem. We can't be entitled to anything. Because marriage is not a right. It's a huge responsibility, right? And if you really think about, subhanAllah, marriage preparation. For example, how many people in this room are single, not married? Okay. I mean, we should see more single people here, right? Because we take more time sometimes to things are very interesting people. We take more time to prepare for travel, for even like a meal, right? We'll look up recipes, we'll call people, we do research for things like that. But when it comes to parenting, we often do it when it's too late. And, and by that I mean when you see, you know, two plus signs on a little, you know, stick too late. You know what I mean? Then it's like, oh my God, I got to start worrying about parenting. And then even then, our view is so limited because we're stuck on baby, Right? Preparing for a baby, we're stuck on oh my god, the, you know, cribs and like strollers and diapers and bottles, and we're stuck on that. But subhanAllah, if you actually step back and said, is there a greater thing that a human being can do than to uh, be responsible for a soul, right? Is there a greater task that we have? So parenting is this incredible responsibility, and yet. 
we don't prepare for it enough. And that's why usually in parenting workshops, you see parents who've already had their children, and I'm not humbled that you're here, but I wish that we were we had singles and people who are just starting out their married lives, you know, prior to even having children. Because that's responsibility. That's really looking at this like this is a very weighty thing, right? And and we have to, you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reminds us again and again. You know, he says, "Hasib al nas wa an yatlaku an yaqulu amanna wa hum la yuftanun." Do people think that they will be left to say we believe and that you will not be tested? So this is why why is he telling us this? That you're going to experience tests in your life, and in order with any test, right? You better prepare. And you can't prepare for those tests if you're just walking in with that dream, like with your mindset, you know, just caught up in a dream. And I think that's the problem with the society and the world that we live in is they look at this, you know, um, marriage and family life, and they idealize everything and romanticize everything to the point where it just becomes, you know, something that it's like any any goal, you know, that you want, just want it, you know, because for what it is, you know. But when you really step back and say, wait a second. This is, you know, it completes half of our being marriage, first of all. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala also tells us, you know, in another ayah, and know that your possessions and your children are a test, and that Allah is immense, you know, and, and that with Allah is immense reward. This is again another reminder for us that these are things that we will be tested about. So don't just get caught up in the fantasy, and the movies, and the films, and the songs, and and the picture wedding albums, and the pictures of what a family is going to look like. Actually, take it very, very seriously, and. Do the preparation beforehand. That's where we should be, right? And so, um, so what does that mean? It means that in order for us to really take uh, parenting and really understand that it's a, have the seriousness of it, we have to first and foremost realize it's completely tied to how to, to our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You can't expect to be a successful parent, or successful really in anything, if we're being honest, without working on yourself, right? And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in another ayah in Surah Baqarah, He tells it, this is an exchange, right? That's happening between the angels, Allah and the angels, when He tells them that He's going to create islands them. There's this beautiful conversation that happens, and He says, "You know, we call on the Lord of the Angels to bring us to the Land of the Khalifa." قالوا أتجعل فيها ما يفسد فيها ويسفك ويسفك الدماء ونحن نسبب بحمدك ونقدس لك قال إني أعلم ما لا تعلمون. So what is this? He says, Oh Muhammad, mention Oh Muhammad when your Lord said to the angels, Indeed, I will make upon the earth a successive authority, a leader. And they said, Will you place upon it one who causes corruption therein and sheds blood while we declare your praise and sanctify you? And Allah said, Indeed. I know that which you do not know. So this verse explains very clearly the purpose of our existence and our creation is that we do everything work towards this goal of actually becoming leaders. So every one of us, not just the men. You know, Mashallah, I know that's you know we have obviously roles uh, for for in, 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 in our work, in our families and our communities and our societies for for men and women. But in this context, this is applying to every but one of us, all of us. Our leaders, and this is what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling us that that He's even you know putting telling the angels that you don't know what I know about my creation, that they have the potential right to be amazing. But if you don't you know see yourself as that, and especially in the context of a family and marriage, and you're just thinking, oh, I'm just going to go and you know it's just part of life. Everybody gets married, everybody has kids, and you're not looking at it like no, 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 no. You have to go there with the mindset that you are being held accountable. And that you are will be held accountable, then you're going to set yourself up for, for failure. So, um, and then also, you know, in addition to, to 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 these to this ayah, we also have to remember that we took a very serious oath with Allah Subhanahu right? In the primordial realm, when He asked us, you know, "Alas tuqirabukum," and we said, "Bala." This is before the dunya started, when the souls were created and we were all gathered. We had this covenant. We had this exchange. So this is again to remind us that He put a responsibility on us, even then in that realm, and we acknowledge that. That yes, you are our Lord. We worship you. We obey you. And part of obedience to Allah Subhanahu is taking these verses to heart and actually reflecting on them and seriously. And again, to go, you know, just 
stripping the mind from this idea that, that, you know, I just, because my parents want me to, and because, you know, I want companionship, I'm just going to get married for all these worldly reasons. It's an amana, and we're going to, you know, talk about that, and what that really means. Um, so, this is another hadith that is it's, uh, very powerful, because it reinforces this idea that, um, you see, there we go. The Prophet ﷺ said, Right? What is this? Every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. It's one of my favorite hadith because if you really look at the description, I mean, it's such a beautiful analogy. But let's look at the full text because this is just, that's just a part of it. He said, Every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. The leader of the people is a guardian and is responsible for his subjects. A man is the guardian of his family and is responsible for them. A woman is the guardian for her husband's home and his children, and she is responsible for them. And the servant of a man is a guardian of the property of his master, and he is responsible for it. No doubt, every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. Now, this is again so crystal clear, subhanAllah. We are literally told to rise to the challenge and become Leaders, right? Because um, what is when you think of a shepherd, what is he doing or she? What what do they do? What do you imagine them with? What are they holding in their hand? What's their purpose? To guide them. To guide. To gather them in a, in a certain way. Very good. Keep them safe. Keep, keep them, them safe. safe. Very good. Mashallah. So what's what do they hold in their hand? What's what's that called? The staff. The staff. Very good. So the shepherd has a staff or a crook. Now, if you pay attention closely, it has like a hook. What's the hook for? It's a long staff, right? And it's multifunctional, but what's that hook for? So, three different things that the shepherd does with his staff. A, he uses it as a long arm. Okay, if you're looking at, uh, obviously even in this image, hundreds of animals, and if he just puts his hands out, oh, come over this way, you know, only the people, or the, the animals right in front of him are going to be able to see, right? So it's a way to get have reach, okay? I want you to pay attention to the words I'm using. So he extends his arm to have reach. Then the crook is for animals that fall, animals that go astray, okay? Sometimes the sheep or goat, for example, fall into a bush, or they fall over a cliff and they're you know, injured, or the baby goes away from its mother. So to wrangle an animal with your own physical force is difficult, but that crook helps them pull by the neck, pull by the ankle, and so that's part of it. So that gives them control, okay? Reach, control, and then it's also used as a walking stick to, cut, to, to feel the terrain, right? Just imagine, you're, you know, you're in charge of guiding Groups, a large group of animals from one place to the other, whether it's to you know feed or whatever. Your job is to make sure that the terrain with which they walk upon is safe. So they're also securing them, not just safe from actual physical land, what's going on with the ground, but also from predators, right? So to be vigilant, to make sure that you know that the, the shepherd knows what animals and threats are out there. Are there snakes? Are there wolves? What's out there? Foxes. Also to know. Um, if uh, also if if those animals are present, they uh, you know the shepherd needs to know how to protect, right? So they have the rod, so they have the staff, and then they have another. It's like it's like a club kind of that they usually hold, and that club is to if they need to kill a snake or if they need to you know push a predator away or intimidate them somehow, they have that. So these are tools in their hand to know, right, to, to protect their their herd. And so, again, this analogy is powerful because you can apply it to parenting so easily. We need to, as parents, make sure that we have reach with our children, right? And we're going to talk about what that means. Basically, open communication, right? If you can't reach your children because, A, you're unavailable, you're too busy, or you just don't know how to communicate with them effectively, right? They're going to wander off, right? And that's what so many parents are dealing with, where there's a total... A block. They can't reach their children. Their children have no respect for them. They disregard them. And a lot of kids are doing this. They're lying. They're, you know, doing things behind their parents' back because it's like, yeah, whatever. And, you know, this is where we as leaders have to not blame the children. Look to ourselves. Did I 
do this? Did I, you know, extend my arms and let them know I'm here for them? Or did I just, you know, let them wander off and now I'm, I'm worried and freaking out? And this is what a lot of parents find themselves in. So we need to make sure we have reach and then control. If they fall, what do you do? Right? If God forbid something happens, do you know what to do? And this is where, you know, in the next slide we'll talk a little bit more in detail, but that's why that crook is so important. If you don't have a way to pull them out of danger, right? If you don't have a way to control the situation, if it's get, you know, then what do you expect? You can't be, you can't give them the next most important thing, which is security, right? And that, so those three things are what a shepherd's aim is. To make sure they have reach, to make sure they have control, and to make sure they have security. And that's also why they walk, you know, ahead. And that's, I think, the point that I really want to drive home, is being ahead. Okay, you don't let the herd just go out and then you follow them. You as the shepherd have to be ahead. So when it comes to parenting, that's why doing the education before you're actually in, in it really matters. And so I, I took a little uh, survey before some of you walked in. Are there any single people here? Like we're not married. Really hoping for at least one. <laughs> I'm gonna make an example out of you, inshallah. Um, but you know, I was just saying that it's so important we do this type of education before. I mean, have that over here. But that's what effective leadership is. That you recognize this is a huge amount from all this time that I'm gonna be held accountable. I better educate myself before I get into it and really focus on the right things, right? And so, what does that mean? Um, well, to prepare for leadership, A, you have to understand yourself. You cannot like go into any role if you don't know who you are, right? And this is a, a, a core belief of our tradition. Whoever knows himself knows their Lord. So self-awareness, self-knowledge is very, very important. And what does that mean? Practically, you should know your personality type. If you have, Raise your hand if you've ever taken a personality test before. Good, and you should know that, and that should be you should be well versed in explaining your personality to the people in your life. Raise your hand if, as a family, you've ever taken personality type tests before. Okay, so that's your homework. Okay, do that. Take personality tests with your family. Every single person in your house, you should know their personality type. They should know your personality type. It is very important. Know your t the temperament. What does that mean? There's an entire body of science that, up until recently. Educators and psychologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, people in mental health field used. And it's called the four temperaments. And then, you know, there's been a, a clear sort of divide between tradition and science. And so anything that even had a hint of, 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 of religious tradition or anything like that, it started, you know, it's, it's being moved out of, of, of scientific literature and science and, and stuff. But these are things that they were, they were using not too long ago. Um, so look up the four temperaments. And there's tests you can do online to determine what your temperament is. What is all this for? It's because, again, if you don't have self-knowledge and self-awareness, how do you possibly go and, and, and have the confidence to raise another human being? Or not just one, but two in some cases, three, four, five, some of our moms, like eight, ten. Like, you're, oh my gosh, what a task. You're going to try to raise eight to ten children and you don't even know yourself well. And unfortunately, you know, self-knowledge wasn't a you know, priority in it for, for most of, you know, our parents and, and, and the older generation. Because it was survival, right? They didn't have the luxury of sitting there taking personality tests, right? Like, and sipping their coffee. They were like, I got to live, you know? So, but we're not in that position. That's why for us, it's honestly like, it, it's pretty, like, if we're, if we're behind on these things, we have no excuse. And that's part of passive parenting, which we're, we're going to talk about. But... Knowing yourself, knowing um, your basic <coughs> needs. Okay, for example, and I know like people joke about this, but it's actually really important. Raise your hand if you're somebody who absolutely gets hangry. Like if you don't eat, like it's a like you get it's really affects you, right? Okay, so now I want you to think about this. If you know that about yourself and you skip breakfast and you ruin your day and have a headache and you come home as a cranky parent, right? You didn't fulfill your own need. You have to, it's just not, it doesn't make you selfish. If you know, like, I need to eat at a certain time, and I have to because otherwise I suffer and I just kind of let go, and then I, it's, it just it comes out in really wrong ways, take care of your needs. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? And, and it's actually 
you know, like they say on the airplane, you know, put the mask on first and take worry about everything else. When it comes to parenting, you have to do that. You have to know your own needs, make sure you take care of those needs. So that's why it's important. Like, you can look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs to kind of see where you are. But the most important thing when it comes to parenting and, and knowing yourself, you have got to know the diseases of your heart. If you don't, please look into the, getting this book. Because it's called Purification of the Heart. And it's Masharat al and it's all about the diseases of the heart that every single one of us have. We are all infected, probably with all of them, to a certain degree, but some more than others. And again, as a leader, if you're not aware of your own diseases, right, if you're not aware of your own uh, spiritual shortcomings, and yet your task as a Muslim parent is to raise another human being and give them guidance, does it make any sense if you're totally oblivious? To your own faults so you have to be this is what self-knowledge is being aware of your own diseases being aware of your own limitations right and once you've taken care of your needs and you're work in progress so it's not like it's like oh okay i've resolved it no 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 you have to be willing to continue that work but once you're 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 that aware of yourself at least you're asking these questions then you need to look at again those in your care what are their needs right what are their needs so for husbands this is really important that you pay attention to the needs of your wives. Not, and, and you know, it's very natural, it happens where we focus on our own needs first, but if you pay attention to your partner's needs first and they're doing the same, guess what? Everybody's needs get fulfilled, right? But if you're paying attention to my needs and they're paying attention to their needs, nobody's needs are getting fulfilled, but that's usually what we end up doing, right? Where we just sort of like, oh, I want this, and I expect to do that, and it's a lot of I, I, I. But really paying attention to the needs of your partner is important because it makes you a team, right? And you can't, you can't be effective parents if you don't work together. It's just, it's not going to happen. Um, you're, you'll, event, some, something will fall apart eventually because children pay attention and, you know, it's just, it's, 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 then you, it's like picking and choosing and it just causes the, so you want to really take it seriously where you pay attention to those in your care, and it also extends to your children, looking at what their needs are, and understanding the potential dangers and threats. And we talked a little bit about that earlier when you referenced the shepherd. The shepherd knows to look out and what to look for. Do you know what's going on with your children? I mean, do you have any idea what kids you're exposed to, for example, online? You know, people need to know this. And I know so many parents who are willfully ignorant. They admit that they don't know anything. I don't like social media, I'm not on it. But you know what? Don't be on it for yourself. But if you don't know what's going on, and then you have a teenager, you know, a few years, if you don't now, in a few years, they're going to come to you and say, I want Snap, I want Instagram, or if, if they even are, they might be like over by then, and there'll be a new app, right, because mm -hmm. they're getting turned over so quickly. But like at some point, they're going to ask for these things, and if you're clueless, and so many parents are, I've done parenting workshops on social media, and I can't tell you even afterwards how like devastating it is to have parents come up and say, I don't know what to do, my child is completely addicted, they, um, they, they're on everything, and I don't know. And you know, a lot of moms and, and dads who are just, you know, maybe for language barriers or whatever, you know, they just don't know. They have these horrible situations at home where their kids are exposed to everything, you know, and they, didn't, they don't know what to do. So you have to know what are the potential dangers and threats out there. What are my kids being exposed to? You just have to realize sometimes life is going to throw you really difficult situations, but you have to know, A, how can I prevent these things you know, from happening? How can I protect them? And what, what resources are out there, right? So seeking counsel when needed. There's so many parents and families that are suffering because they don't reach out. And this is why you know, I've been doing mental health advocacy, health advocacy for a long time, because in our community we have a problem. And this goes back to what, what I talked about in the beginning. We're so stuck on the dream. We're so stuck on selling that perfect image that anything that breaks that up, even if it means having a healthier family, is just too intimidating. We don't want people to know we have problems. So we don't talk about anything. anything. We hush hush or we try to self fix. And I've seen things just spiral out of real control. I've had moms call me in panic over really, really terrifying things. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this. Like, what do I do? When it's like, wait, 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 this problem has been going on for how long? What? Over a year? Over two years? And now you're trying to do something? So we have to wake up and say, part of being effective parents is we need to know, A, what the, you know, as I said, 
what the dangers are, but also seek counsel when it's needed. And then, of course, like I said before, ultimately you have we have to rely on God and submit to His will. Outcomes we cannot control. You can do everything perfectly as a parent, and the outcome might not be what you want. That's not on you. If you were effectively leading and you were doing everything perfectly and something happens, that is not on you. You don't have to look at yourself like you failed. Because if you were responsible and you were doing everything right and you taught them with love and compassion and you, you know, you know, embraced them and, and, and showed them the beauty of your son, the outcome is not on you. And so that takes should take off pressure. Because I know a lot of parents, especially of teens, blame themselves. What did I do wrong? And you just start, you know, just leave the outcome to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, pray for the best, ask for the fair, do everything in your power, but don't focus on that. Because if that becomes your focus where it's like everything has to be perfect, then you know, again you're missing it. You have to focus on yourself. What are you doing? So and then you know, just to, to further emphasize, before as a as a strong leader, you have to know your responsibilities first and then your rights. So when it comes to your children, First, study the rights of children over the parents. Don't focus on, you know, because bitter blood is exploited in our cultures. It's 100% exploited. So much spiritual abuse happens because parents use this, you know, beautiful part of our faith to exploit their children, right? And it starts very early. Like, you see, you know, authoritative parenting models can be very toxic to, to even little children. Start barking orders at them. You better obey me. You better do this. I mean, I've had, you know, again, really horrible cases where parents have, um, you know, used, abused their authority based on, I have rights over you, you know, Jenna's under my foot, if you don't obey, you go to hell, and it's like, stop all. that's what you say to a four, five-year-old child, like, what's going on? It's not effective parenting, and if you're doing any of that stuff, stop, like, children are beautiful, and they're pure, and they're fitra, and they don't need to hear harsh language like that, so, but if you're going in again, with this construct that, you know what, I'm entitled to things, right? I'm entitled to my children listening to me, they are obey me, and, and you come with that attitude, then that's all you care about. And then what about their rights over you? Do you even know what they are? Have you ever studied or taken a class? There's, you know, classes on this material. There's books written on this material. But again, this is, you know, where, where we as responsible leaders and parents, it's our charge to do these, this work. We have to be looking into this stuff. And so, you know, um, and, then, and then also, does culture define your parenting model, or does Islam? Be honest, right? If you're, you know, parenting based on what your cultural attitudes are and expectations are, and that means that you forego clear, you know, rules in Islam, that is a huge problem. And I'll, I'll give you an example. For example, double standards, okay? Raise your hand. If you, especially I'm talking to the women, as you can see, I'm looking over here because this happens a lot in our cultures. Raise your hand if there were total double, double standards between the way you were treated and the way your brothers were treated in your household. Okay? Like rules. Okay? For example, chores, right? Did your brothers have to wash dishes and set up the table and, like, you know, do things like that? I mean, if they did, mashallah, good parenting. But a lot of our, our in our homes, my, if you knew, and I, I tease my, my sister-in-law now a lot, and she teases me, if you knew the way that we were raised, like, we were serving, you know, serving the boys, you know, and when they come to the house, like on a tray. <laughs> I never got that. I walked in late after a work shift, was like, go get your own food. It was serving, yeah, I mean. So, definitely double standards with things like that. Chores, absolutely. I don't think I ever in my life saw my little girl do anything like like any menial task, like any, any domestic task. <laughs> I just really can't reflect. But we used to have to vacuum, clean the bathrooms, make our beds, make his bed. So there's de definitely double standards, right, in some of our cultures. Even with curfews, right? Curfews? I mean, I couldn't be out past this or my parents didn't care what the, what the brothers were. So this is cultural. Boys, girls, the same stuff. What this said, washes dishes, they have to wash dishes. Fold laundry, fold laundry. Take out the garbage, take out the garbage. Cut the grass, cut. You know, this, this division of labor based on gender is very odd because, again, again it, goes, it goes against the son. The Prophet son used to wash his own dishes. He used to mend his own clothes. So, are those too girly for, for boys to do? It's ridiculous. But again, this is where culture, you know, takes over. And if those are the types of things that are going on in your home where there's definite, you know, 
separation based on gender, you have to go back and say, "Am I? what am I doing? Am I creating maybe some resentment and entitlement, right? Am I, create, am I planting seeds that are going to be really disastrous for my children as they grow up? Because my daughter is going to be resentful and I have a boy who's just like, hey, where's my tray of food, you know, or, you know, <laughs> picking on his wife and expecting all these things because I contributed to this cycle. So you have to, you know, again, think about this. This is really where you as a parent, you have to be responsible. And then being the guide who you want your children to follow. You cannot, you know, they need proper guidance, but you can't, you know, they learn from imitation, they learn from listening and observing. So you can't say, oh, do as I say, not as I do. It doesn't work. It's like literally hypocrisy. That is the splitting of the effect. But a lot of parents, that's how they parent. Because I said so. No, break it down. Explain to your children the wisdoms of things and be fair and be equitable and don't be a hypocrite. If you say something, do it. If you don't do something, don't, you know, tell them not to do it. That's how it should be. Don't do it. Don't, you know, tell them not to do it. But you can't be doing it. So be really sincere in terms of setting a good example. And then this is, you know, the next point is really important and we're, we're going to get to that, which is tailored parenting. Okay, tailored parenting is really accepting the idea that no two children are the same. The one-size-fits-all model may work when it comes to rules and just sort of set, setting sort of, you know, like house rules, but not when it comes to one-on-one -on -one connection with parenting. You have got to focus in and know who your children are, okay? And then, you know, we talked a little bit about earlier, but knowing the dangers that lurk, and if we have time, we'll try to get to the um, temperaments, but let's just quickly, uh, this is, again, the characteristics of an effective leader. Just to summarize for you, these are things that you should ask yourself, do I have? Do you have strong communication skills? Okay. Are you able to really communicate effectively? Do you know like how to articulate what you're feeling or is it a struggle for you? And if it's a struggle for you, it's not something that you can't work on. Sometimes people just say, well, I don't know, I can't, I don't know, I just, I'm a person of few words. Okay. And that's it, and conversations end that way. But you probably do have a lot to say, it's just a matter of the media, right? So strong communication skills doesn't mean strong speaking skills necessarily. Maybe writing is more effective. Maybe you do need an arbitrator, a mediator, but that's effective communication if you even recognize that, right? That I need to work on, maybe I can't get through to my child or I don't know how. But you have to know if these are skills you have. Are you passionate, you know, as a parent? Who, are you truly commitment or are you checked out? Just be honest because you can't, again, solve something if you're, you know, Resolve issues if you're not willing to be honest with yourself and look at yourself like really clearly in the mirror. If you're like, yeah, I'm kind of not interested, you know, I'm, I'm in a mode where I'm, I want to do my own thing right now. Okay, and parenting is kind of like a burden, you know, it's like, oh, too much. I have to cook, I have to clean, I have to help them with their homework. I want to be doing my own thing. Like, be honest about that. That's saying that you right now are in a place in your life where you um, need more, right? And honestly, if it's, you know, you can, everything, it's very subjective because every situation is different. But there are a lot of people who have been sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing. So they do get to that point where it's like, yeah, I had children, I stayed home, I didn't work, I put aside all my dreams, I didn't go to school, I didn't work, I didn't do anything. And now I'm at a point where I really want to focus on that. It doesn't make you a bad parent, okay? That doesn't make you a bad parent because in Islam, alhamdulillah, or multifaceted in all parts of us should be celebrated. Just because you're a parent doesn't mean that you can't also be uh, an entrepreneur, an artist, you know, have your own you know, thing going on. But I think, again, culturally, these are things that we're told. Like, if you're a good mom, you just sacrifice your life forever. Just die serving your children. And, don't, and your husband, of course. Don't do anything but, right? And if you're a father, too. If you're a good father, your whole life should basically be like, like you should be working until right like, before you enter Right? I mean, these are the cultural crazy ideas that we, you know, have and we perpetuate. But what about human beings, like on an individual level? Like, am I an effective parent if I am checked out? No. So maybe I need to work on balance so that I can find the time to be committed to my children when I'm with them, but also pursue my passions. This is self-awareness, self-knowledge. This is the type of stuff that you need to look at. Positivity, you know, and of course, if you're happy and you're feeling fulfilled, you're going to be more positive. Innovation. This is not bid out, okay? So don't get me in trouble. Innovation is a word that like, everybody freaks out about. I'm talking about like being creative, okay? Learning how to be creative with your children, finding new ideas and ways to teach them things. That's, you know, part of effective parenting. But if, again, if you're passive in your parenting, you're not checked out, you're too busy, you know, trying to figure your own self out, 
or you're like really just overwhelmed. Maybe you're carrying burdens. Maybe your parents are older and you're working, and you've just got a lot of responsibility. It's gonna be. It's natural that these things aren't gonna really, you know, come out. But how do you how do you fix it, right? And then collaboration. So being, uh, you know, looking at your family as a unit. It's very important that we kind of this authoritative model of parenting, as I said before. Is kind of, it's, it's, it's very top down, right? But when you actually look at your family and you talk in a language that's collaborative, especially if you have teenagers, this is very healthy because they they feel like they're part of the team, right? And they're not you're not just barking orders at them and telling them what to do or disrespecting them. They're actually like, yeah, this is our family and we want success. And so collaboration is really important. Okay, any questions? There are a few more slides, but any questions at this point? Can you remind me again what innovation is? Sure, innovation is being creative. Like, yes, coming up with like creative ideas of, of things to do with your children. But this also takes you back to knowing your children's interests, right? If you're not paying attention and you're just like, just go to school, do your chores, you know, do this. And it's just kind of like this very dry existence for them. And there's no time where you can actually connect and say, you know what? What are you interested in? Let's go to this museum. Let's go try this class out. Let's try doing something. You know, then it becomes again very like you're not you're not in it. Whereas innovation requires you to be present. It requires you to be in it, right? It requires you to really pay attention to your children to base what you, you know your connection on what they need. Any other questions? Just ask you about the situation you mentioned earlier sure. about that one girl mm -hmm. um, who took the class. Yes. So in that situation, I know you said that you know there's some. You know, you try your best as a parent, and then ultimately you just submit to the whole of yes. and obviously you prayed for her. And, yes. But how do you manage the relationship with the child at that point? Very good. I mean, subhanAllah, they're still your children, you know, and even, I mean, I've had people, you know, um, approach me with really, you know, difficult situations, and they don't know what to do because it's affected their heart, you know, towards their children. They feel betrayed. It's very normal. But... And just like we tell our converts, you know, to Islam that, oh, you have to still be respectful and maintain those relationships, inshallah, we can't be hypocrites. We have to do the same thing. We, they're still our children. We still have to leave that door open with them. And just really look at them like, you know, it's, a, it's, it's difficult. And I, I know people who, who, who are going through this right now. Um, but honestly, it's a matter of what's better for them, that you push them away, that you judge them, that you're critical of them. And you basically throw them right back into the arms of those who are, you know, willing to take them from you. Or that you leave the door open, leave the lines of communication open, be understanding, be respectful, and show them that, you know, through thick and thin, I'm still mom, I'm still dad, right? Inshallah ta'ala, maybe somewhere down home, maybe it won't be sudden, maybe it won't be, you know, for a while, or maybe it will be a long while, maybe they'll, Allah will, you know, let He's, he's a muqallib al you know, he's the flipper of hearts. And the power and the law, uh, uh, the power and law of a parent is, you know, unmatched. So there's so much that we can do if we just step back and realize outcomes are not responsible for outcomes, right? I cannot control outcomes. If Allah wills something, He wills it. What I can control is what I do. And my, you know, response should be of compassion, Mercy, and of course, making God and asking Allah. Yes. So the thing is, this uh, conversation uh, sometimes it brings me because I'm a migrant. So I know I feel like if I was in that situation, I'm not going to blame I'm going to blame myself. Yes. I'm the one who brought them here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I I feel like okay, it's so hard. How can you deal with it? So, right. You are the one who put her in that situation. Well, it's your fault. You're in the Malam right? So Allah's not going to judge you based on you making a hijra and coming to another country. You know, for maybe, I'm sure your intention was not to have your children, God forbid, go astray. Right. Yes, but there's dangers even in Muslim countries. Nowadays, if you do, if you look at the polls, there's huge numbers of people who are completely deflecting from Islam coming out of. <laughs> Muslim majority countries. So Allah is the only one who guides. It's not necessarily the people you're around or the where you are, you know, your location. It's a, guidance is from Allah SWT. And that's why again, your job as a parent, if you're a follow, you know, following along, 
is to look, be that shepherd, right? So yes, you bring them maybe to somewhere that there's more dangers, but if you're on top of those dangers, if you're ahead of those dangers, if you put things in, in you know, like if you have things in motion or systems in place so that it prevents harm from coming, you're doing your due diligence, right? So for example, bringing them inshallah to the masjid. This is a huge blessing that we have. So there's so many people, why is it that, and we talk about this, every Ramadan, this is mentioned, that we have this influx of people who come and they sort of disappear, right? We have to be, we have to go out there, especially if you're a regular attendee, alhamdulillah, and you do come to the masjid. You have to encourage your family, take your children to the masjid. This place is not easy, the dunya is not easy, you know, living in this time of day, it's not easy. The masjid will keep them, inshallah, grounded, and I'm going to talk about that, you know, reflecting some statistics that are really, inshallah, hopeful, to just give us more encouragement that there are things that we can do, making sure that the company they keep, that's why that friend, that sister who came to me, the company she keeps is very important. As parents, you should absolutely know who your children's friends are. You should know who they talk to. If you don't know, oh, like, what, what's her name? What are you talking to? Oh, okay. And that's the conversation. Then no, 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 no. Who is she? What are her parents like? What does she do? You have to like literally request like buy a dad from every friend. <laughs> no, really, like of your, you have to because I, I can't. I mean, it's just proven. There's so much like research out there that t- talks about the enormous influence that you know peer to peer, you know, kids have over each other. So you're literally handing them to complete strangers if you don't know who they are, and then you expect them to, to you know, to just come home and, and, and obey every single thing you teach them if you don't know who these people are. So these are the types of things that we have to do, right? And if you're doing sometimes, I know you said be your child's friend. Yes. I agree with all of that. But sometimes when you give them choices, mm-hmm. they sort of start leading you. Right. So I'm one of those parents who's very authoritative. Mm-hmm. I am my dad's child, so I just say it, and it has to happen. Mm-hmm. And alhamdulillah, so far it has worked. Alhamdulillah. And I did advise a friend to try that with her kids, because her kids do not want to come to that. Yeah, like mentioned. Mm-hmm. So now she kind of changed, and I'm seeing her kids here. Alhamdulillah. That's I said, don't give them choices. Like right. We have probably don't get choices, so let that be <laughs> here for them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is like a balance. Eventually, communication and giving choice of yes. the yes. Yeah. No, no. And as far as the authoritative model, there's a time and place for it. Absolutely. Right. But I think it's when it becomes the only model with which you parent. That's an issue. And we'll talk about why, because the effects of that on every stage in childhood are, are lasting, right? And we're going to get to that. But if you, you know, know that these are the characteristics of an effective leader, then the next step is accepting again. The parenting is 100% and I'm okay? And if you see your children as just extensions of you, this is a real serious problem. They're not, they're not, they, they might look like you, but they're not yours. Your kids are not yours. You can't have this attitude, I do whatever I want. No, you can't. They don't belong to you. They belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khalas. He literally is giving them to us for an appointed time, and he will hold us account for how we took care of that amana when it's time to return them. So if you really, really believe in that, then you take things very differently, you look at them very differently. But if you just think, oh, they're just my little minions and I get to tell them to do all the time, and then you exploit them, you abuse your authority, and it just becomes a very toxic environment. But if it's like, wait a second, this is always kind of property, right? And even though they came from my body and I helped create them, I, I need to really, really be careful about what I do with this. It's fragile, right? It's fragile. The children are fragile. Then you... you you parent with more presence. You actually account. You hold yourself accountable. I mean, we just lost, you know, a child this past Friday, right? Oh, I come here. Come on. He's only about 13 years old. And according to everything that people have said about him, mashallah, he was like a little angel child, right? He was mu'adab. He was beautiful, shy. He just had the most excellent manners. He was. He loved the Quran. Sweet. He just did everything right, inshallah. The parents were clearly doing everything right, but, you know, why did Allah trying to take him? Because he can. Tell us. They, they belong to him. He can take them whenever he wills, and we can't question his will. And that's Iman. Iman is believing the children are not ours. They are Allah's, just like we belong to Allah. And um, well, we have to take that charge seriously. Uh, the Prophet said, 
آية المنافق ثلاثا إذا حدث كذب وإذا وعد أخلف وإذا دون الأرقام. What does that mean? The signs of a hypocrite. Okay. Whenever he speaks, he tells a lie. Whenever he promises, he always breaks it. And if you trust him, he proves to be dishonest. So may Allah protect us from being part of this category. The trust he's given us, right? Children are in trust. And the way that we prevent ourselves, again, from, from faltering and, and abusing this trust is by what? Fear Allah. And treat your children small or grown fairly with equal justice. We have to be fair. We have to have equal justice. There's a lot of favoritism I know that happens in families. And if you're one of those parents where you do favor one over the other, you're going to be held accountable for that. If one of your child is like prodigal and perfect and just sweet and you're just like, sure, you can have ice cream at night. <laughs> Go, candy. And then the other one is like, Mommy, you know, maybe they're bratty and they did something that upset you earlier in the day. Like, no, nah, you can't have any. <laughs> That's so wrong. Stop the love. So many parents do it. They totally play favorites with their children. And this is a direct command from Allah. Fear Allah. And treat your children small or grown fairly with equal justice. That's why the, what we talked about earlier, the double standards are so toxic and so harmful. Because a lot of children get mistreated because of double standards. So parents, you have to be careful. And then, you know, another hadith that really um, emphasizes how we're responsible for so much of what happens to them. No child is born except on al-fitra. Right? Every child is born on al-fitra. And then the, the parents make him either Jewish, Christian, Magian, you know, and it goes on. So what is this telling us? All of our children are born pure. Whatever they come out to because of our negligence, right, is on us. But what I was saying earlier, if you're doing everything right, you don't blame yourself. It's when you're negligent, when you're failing, when you're not present, when you're completely letting the television set or the phone and the internet, you know, parent your children. Yeah, you're going to be accountable. So that fear should strike you. Like, stop for a lot. I need to take this more seriously. I need to start doing stuff, right? And that's why, you know, knowing your children's rights, you know, they're mandated by God. Children have rights. You have to give them their hawk. So fathers, you, you, I mean, this is, you know, in the Quran, bearing the costs of their food, clothing, on equitable terms. So being fair with your children in terms of what you provide for them, their sustenance. You can't get your favorite child the Nikes and then take your other child to, like, pay less, you know. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> equitable terms. And the Prophet said that one of the rights of children over their parents is being given a nice name. Okay, I mean this is for those who are expecting, make sure that you give your children names that reflect what you want to see in them, inshallah. Not just what grandma wants and you know sometimes there's politics that people force people to do things, but you also have to think like I want my child to reflect. For example, when I had my second child, my first child is Yasin. And so my second child, I wanted to name him Mateen. Right. <laughs> so original. So I was like, see, Mateen, how cute. And then Hamid, I asked our, my teacher, and I said, you know, is this a good name? And he said, no, don't name him Mateen. Why? Because Mateen is about might. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, one of the attributes of Allah, but it, it, it describes like, like strength and might, and it's almost to be feared. And you don't want that to come out in your child. And so I was like, oh, no, you're right. So, alhamdulillah, it was good nasiha, and I changed his name to something totally different, Ismail. Alhamdulillah, you know, and, you know, he was born literally smiling, like he had a huge smile on his face when I first saw him. And mashallah, he's a very smiley kid. I mean, not the Ismail, like, you know, it's, it's a play on the word. But mashallah, like, he, he's, uh, he's true to his name in, in many ways, but that's just one of them. So naming your children is really important. And then having a good education, you have to provide for them. Make sure that they um, you know, are, are learning good and learning well. And that doesn't mean just picking the top 10 school or schools that have a top 10 rating, but it's actually looking at the character of the teacher, right, that is going to be teaching your child. Every single person that comes in contact with your children, you should vet them and know who they are. If you allow them to have that access to your children's heart, especially young kids, 
right? If you, and I know, you know, sometimes because parents work and they have other obligations, it's just like, it's okay, we'll just have so-and-so watch this person, so-and-so watch this person, you know, our kids. But you have to be careful. Every single person that comes in contact with your children, if they don't have that character that you want your children to eventually reflect, you're exposing them to stuff. So this is just mindful parenting. You know, they're making sure that education is just, it's not just beyond uh, the classroom. It's like really a matter of who's teaching your children and uh, anything, right? And being careful about that. And then um, back to the tailored parenting. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. Even, I mean, there's research and research that shows that even identical twins in the same home with the same exact parenting, eating the same exact food, doing everything, come out completely different, right? Because no two children are the same. So when we talk about tailored parenting, this is what we're talking about. A, and these quotes from Ali Ibn Abi Talib are really important because someone mentioned earlier, and we have to think about this. We all do it, right? We all eventually model parenting that are, you know, that was done to us onto our children. One way or another, it's like, oh, I'm turning into my mom, I'm turning into my dad, you know, and things that we thought we would never do, we end up doing, right? And this is a form of passive parenting, okay? Because very clear. Do not raise your children the way your parents raised you. They were born for a different time. And that doesn't mean across the board, like you can't take things that your parents taught you. It's a matter of really focusing on the nuances, on the differences that your children, the, the environment, everything that's changing around them, and making sure that you're, uh, you know, as you're parenting, you're, you're sensitive to those things, you're aware of those things. Because if you're just, you know, modeling the same thing that was done to you, 20 years ago plus, it's not going to be effective. And I've seen this happen, even in my own family, you know, where it's the same sort of, uh, you know, again, model, but it's like it's not working with this generation of children. You have to do something different. And then clear instructions here for us, and inshallah, we'll get to that, are, you know, how to look at your children as they go through different stages. So those first seven stages, I'm sure we've all heard this, but we're going to talk about what this means. Play with them until they're seven. Discipline and teach them from 7 to 14, and then befriend them at the age of 14. So whatever age you find yourself in, there's something in this for you. So let's look at spirituality in early childhood. So how many of you have children between the ages of 2 and 7? Okay, So this is a very tender age, okay? What do they need the most? They need love. They need safety. They need guidance, right? So knowing those needs, right? Paying attention to what they need. Now, what tools can you use this, you know, to inculcate the love of Allah and the Prophet in your children? At this age, storytelling, okay? With animation, you have to be willing to be silly. Okay, I, I ran a preschool for three uh, years, and one of the funny things that we noticed was, you know, you, again, it comes back to, you know, we're just so worried about our image. That some moms were like, they, they look at us like we're crazy when we're like, ah, you know, we're dancing and we're like doing all these faces and we have like puppets on our fingers. And, and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm in the world that your children are in right now. I'm in like play world, I'm in animation world. But they can't do that. They're like, I don't know how you do that. Like, I just can't. I can't do that. I can't do those voices. I can't get, you know, down and like do all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, that's sad because your children need that. They're, they're, they're living in a totally exciting universe and you're not willing to go to their universe. But yet you want them to do everything perfectly, right? And you know, read the Quran perfectly. Don't make mistakes. You know, um, say salam to every single person. You know, so we have all these very, very strict rules that we want our children to follow because it all reflects good on us. But we're not willing to meet them where they are at, and that's why storytelling is so important for children. Um, and this is my own advice, you know. But they have such an incredible imagination. So stories of the prophets. Um, or stories from the seat of, of what happened in the cave of Hiram, right? But this is a really incredible story. If you actually think about it, and this is where innovation kind of comes into play, think about how can I tell the, retell this story in a way where my children will get it, right? You don't have to get into this deep detail of the prophet was, you know, worried about the polytheists and Mecca. Like, you don't need to go from that angle. Just say, he used to go on a mountain because he wanted to get away from all the noise and just... That, you know, life was just really just too busy and crowded, too many lights, uh, not lights, but, you know, just too many sounds, and he wanted to get away, so he went on the mountaintop, and he'd go there for, like, 40 days, 
you know, and kind of really get expressive about how you tell this story. And then just describe what happens. Like, can you just imagine in a time and place where they don't have artificial lights or anything like that, that all of a sudden this being of light enters this cave and it's almost blinding, you know, to the Gulf of Assam. And then this whole exchange happens. This is how you tell a story to a child, right? You bring them in to this magical world. Why do you think all these cartoons and movies, you know, CGI, why do you think it's so po Why do they make millions and millions of dollars every year? Because children love that type of wild, you know, magical sort of uh, stories. They love those types of things. We have those that are real. And we don't tell them. It's not in Mirage. I mean, an animal that has wings. Right? And I've done I've done these, so I'm telling you like what you see. The children are like they're just like as you're describing what's happening, they're just in complete captivated mode. If you want to get a child's attention, you tell them really powerful stories. But subhanAllah we have that. Or even uh, other stories, you know, about animals that speak. It's all in the Sira. There's animals that spoke to the Prophet, to Prophet Suleiman, ants and you know, camels. Animals that literally spoke. These stories that our children should know. Rocks, mountains, trees that spoke. Again, bring them into that world of wonder, of awe. This is the age to do that stuff. Okay? Stories about Jannah. You should absolutely be talking about Jannah to your children at, at a young age. Just get them like, and, and, you know, I was at this funeral yesterday. Alhamdulillah, a friend of mine was sort of worried about whether or not she should take her kids. And I said, you should take your children. I take I take my children to funerals. Why? Why are we running away from funerals? <gasps> no, start, no, stop for a lot. Life and death, it's like a cycle. It's just part of what happens in this world. And we don't fear death. Death should not be something you teach your children to fear. Okay, that's very borrowed from like Western society. Death is a transition. It's a move from one dimension to another. And of course, time and place for everything. I mean, you know, if, if they, you, you have to know your own children. But generally speaking, if you make death, you know, about going to Jannah and meeting Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, it's not something that they're going to fear. Okay. But if you make it about going dirt six feet under and having dirt thrown on you and worms eating your body, and then angels come and Jahannam. Like, there's parents who talk to their kids about Shaytan and Jahannam when they're like four and three. You have no business talking to them about to him and shaitan and throwing, like, you know, threatening them, you know, like with, with like, do you want to burn in a fire for doing that? Like, what is that? Like, stuff for a lot. But there's parents who use fear tactics to try to, you know, teach their children. At that age, that's horrifying. Because just like their imagination can imagine all the amazing things, they can also imagine the monstrous things, the things that are dark and, and, and just not. You know, so stop You have to stay away from those topics, you know. Um, and even introducing concepts. Like, I remember, mashallah, the best advice I got from, from Sheikh Hamza, actually, was not to introduce lying to your children in this age. Like, if they tell you something and you go, are you lying? This is terrible. Because you're literally introducing to them a concept of deception, which is a purposefully, like, evil act. They do not lie in that age. They're innocent. They're living in an imaginary world. So if they drop a glass and then you say, did you drop that? And they say, <laughs> that is not the same as deception. Because in their mind, they might have created a scenario where they truly don't think they did. Now, are the facts of those the facts? No. Maybe they just, you know, are created again a fantasy of like, you know, they were playing uh, with an imaginary friend and an imaginary friend dropped it. You each know, never know. But for, for you to introduce this concept of deception at an early age, it's ruining that fitra that they have because you're actually blaming them for doing something that's intentional. Right? Do you get it? Because to deceive and to lie is intentional. Like you're purposefully doing that. But children don't do that. They're just in a different, they're in an alternate universe, basically in that imaginative play world. So that was really good to see that, subhanAllah. So don't introduce concepts like that, or like I said, sin. Because even sinning, like they don't understand what sinning is when they're young. Why why, why talk about sinning? Okay? And that's different from like saying, we don't do that. Like you can say, we don't, you know, eat pork. 
We don't do those things as Muslims. But to introduce the concept of a sin when it's too early is might confuse me. Any questions about that? Um, I have a question. Yes. So when they um, when they bought something, they say they didn't do it. Then what do you say? So in that case, you can you know again ask them. Say, then what happened? Let them explain, and you might get a really cool story out of it, <laughs> and it might make you laugh, and you forget all about how it doesn't matter, because it's like, wow, I was really imaginative, right? But as long as you know that they're young and innocent mistakes happen, and you have to be forgiving and compassionate, and not like, how could you, you know, if it was unintentional, accidents happen. But let them explain to you what happened, and just kind of go with it. I mean, I've had exchanges with my kids, too, it's like, oh, really, really? <laughs> But, you know, you kind of just let go after a while and you realize that their intention is, maybe they are, are scared and they're like trying to, you know, get out of a punishment. And even that, there's innocence to that, right? Uh, but to actually blame them to purposely deceive you is, is, is not fair. But mm -hmm. well, sometimes they like to hide the truth because maybe it was not, not the, the punishment, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, she wants to please you. So mm -hmm. she did some something wrong, yes. and when you uh, ask her, to do you do that? Yeah, she doesn't want to tell you. So yeah. she lied. So I feel like sometimes, sometimes. It's ah! so yeah! Well, you have to then at that point say, "You can tell me the truth." And I'm like, "Even our kids, uh, my husband's here. We have a very clear rule with them. You, the, it's very clear that you will, you will, if you tell us the truth, it's better for you." Like, even if it's something that you're you know, afraid of, or you, know, you think it's bad, it's better for you. Like, we, we, we will forgive more, like, we're likely to forgive more if you tell us the truth. So you create that very safe environment for them, because if it's, for her, it's a choice of, like you said, pleasing you, or, you know, misleading you. You have to say, don't mislead, like, don't let that be an option, ever. Tell me the truth, you know, tell me what happened, and it's okay. I'll, I'll, you know, we'll move past it. But if, you know, if it's a matter of seeing your disappointed look and you scold her afterwards, right? That's what she doesn't want. Like, mama's suddenly disappointed with me and now she thinks, like, I should do this. And we tend to do that, right? It's natural. It's like, how could you do I shouldn't have done that. And now you're reprimanding. So she doesn't want to do that. So you just say, no, no, tell me the truth. I'll let you more. And then you hug them. Tell them, good, I'm so proud of you for being honest. This is a way to encourage them. And inshallah, you plant these seeds young, then by the time they're teenagers and they're in high school, that is set in, it's imprinted, imprinted in their mind that you're forgiving, that you're willing, that it's better to tell the truth, right? That in any way, like whatever the, 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 the case may be, there should be no option to, to not tell the truth. Like the only option is to tell the truth. But that, that's going to be much more, I mean, if you think for a high schooler or a teenager, there's so many opportunities to see that in life. Don't you want them to feel like, no, 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 lying is not an option. I have to tell my mom the truth. Right? I have to tell my dad the truth. Like I have to, there's just no, that's what I would want. So I want to create that from a very young age. And that's why, in short, we don't, we don't, again, punish them or assume anything about their intention. Just focus on, you know, corrective behavior maybe later. But in that moment, let them just applaud them for being true. I think you want to ask about the concept of sin. Yeah. You said we should not introduce that to them. So the thing like the the example you mentioned, we don't eat pork. So yeah. she asked me why we don't eat pork. So because I'm not that. Sick. Yes. So what how what would happen to people who doesn't do that? So Allah will get angry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's honest. That's fine. Yeah. Allah uh, will be unhappy. So making Allah happy and unhappy is fine. I think the concept of sin, the reason why is it's so tied to morality. When we tie it to morality, then you have you're opening up a can of worms in a discussion that's going to get sort of confusing. For example, gender relations. If you introduce an idea that's too early for children, how do you justify why a woman can't wear? Like if you say it's haram for me not to show my hair in front of another man, why? What are you going to say? Allah said so. Okay, but beyond that, they keep probing. <laughs> you see, now it's like you have to explain modesty and haya, but what's the point? Because, uh, oh, I never mind, you know, so if you're introducing concepts that are too early for them, because now you have to explain, but that's what I'm saying, is that when you when you say things, frame it from the, the, the that language, it's going to make them want to know, but if you 
focus on the positive. Like we, we do this because it makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. Not because we do it because it's gonna, you know, there's a sin attached to it. You see what I'm saying? Like you wear hijab because it makes Allah happy. Not because it's haram to show my hair. Do you get the difference? It's the way you present it. In the first example, you're presenting it as an act of duty, and devotion, love for Allah, and that's it. It's all pretty simple. They get it. But when you say we don't do it because this is wrong and it's a sin, see that language? Now they're curious. Well, why? And then you open the dialogue and it can get to a place where it's uncomfortable because you don't know where to go. How do I, you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> I've done so. But not all things can be addressed the same positively. Because sometimes, for example, yeah. my, my, my daughter told me I'm in love with someone in my school. Okay. Just a so, Okay. <laughs> What should I do? Oh, that's a great, great. You know what? So that's actually a really good example because a lot of songs, even like movies, popular movies, there's you know all this like love, love, love talk. And children, you know, they we understand that line very clearly, right? As adults, if a little girl says I'm in love with someone, that means something to us. But does it mean the same thing to the child? No. No. So don't react like it means the same thing. Because people go, oh, oh, who is he? And then you go, you call your husband, oh my god, he's going to go to school. <laughs> and then you go, freaked out. Because I'll be out of And then you go, it's like, that's your reaction. Then clearly, you're, you're treating it like it means the same thing to you. For her, it might just be an innocent phrase that she heard someone say. It just means I like them. You know? I, I just asked him this. What do you mean? She said, I'm, I'm unhappy when he's unhappy. I like to be with him. But it's so... It was so much. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I couldn't reply that. And then he's telling me, okay, my friend is telling me, okay, I'm going to say, you know, I'm showing you to friend. They all love you. So I have to tell you, no, no, so wonderful. No, 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 no. You know what, that's sweet rap, you know, but you don't have to sit there and make it to, out to be something that it's not. Because again, we're introducing ideas that unfortunately in this society, they're already doing it. You know, they're already forcing this down our children's uh, throats, all the bad out the films and the songs. So we can't contribute to that by freaking out. And I think that's why our reactions are really important. And so when they say innocent things like that, you have to learn on the fly how to just spin it back to something innocent. And not let them, you know, get carried away with it, you know. So it's yeah, it takes some creativity. So that's where the innovation part comes in. All right. So the next stage, right, is the middle childhood, and this is, you know, from seven to fourteen. What do they need? Pre-adolescence need. They need love. They need respect, and they need reassurance. This is very, very important. Cool. Yes. Uh, I think what's right here earlier about the girl who's actually. So, you know, it was a, uh, I mean, obviously at that point she, I had told her, I said, you know, I'm happy to, to speak to her, She's because I knew her daughter, she used to come to our halakas, um, and so we did, we actually had a conversation, and a Part of the issue that she had was that she had actually a friend who was gay, and the verses in the Quran that spoke about those things bothered her. So we addressed that topic. Alhamdulillah, it helped. And then I put her in touch uh, with other people that could, you know, that could help her further, sort of. But I think it was helpful for her to hear that it wasn't just a black and white issue, which is what she was presented. Like I have to choose. This or 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 you know or, or not choose it, but rather no. There is actually you know don't um, let's frame it in the correct way because yes, even though it's something that we are very clear about in our tradition, individual people we don't condemn, right? We can't do that, and I think that really helped her heart because she was just worried about her friend, you know. But you know it got into her. I mean, it really affected her faith. So this is why again, as parents, we have to know, as I mentioned earlier, that when you're out of your, you know, wheelhouse and you don't know what to do in terms of a situation, you have to know who to lean on. You have to know who to call on and, and, and know who, who are the mentors. If you, if you don't have, like, a person in your family or for, in circle that you can reach out to, to for guidance on certain things, you should look for one, right? And there's, mashallah, especially in this community, we have Khalil Center right there that can help with a lot of, you know, things, just the angst, you know, things that a lot of teenagers especially go through. Uh, peer pressure, all the stuff that we talked about, 
But even you know younger kids, if, if there's anything that comes up, there are resources here, and then you have teachers here too, mashallah, right? That can help. Um, but anybody that you know who has experience with children, just and, and if they have their own children and they you see that mashallah they've successfully raised their children, those would be good people to just have in your you know speed dial if you ever need to, inshallah. But we're going to get to to that uh, like demographic in a second. So this particular uh, the middle of childhood, it's really important that you again know what do they need. They need love, respect, reassurance. And the, the, what they, the best way to reach right this age group is by storytelling. Right, This is a good time, I think, and, and even our, our, our tradition is to teach them, start teaching them like fit and concepts that really make sense, right? Because their imaginative brain is now, like, they're in reality. They kind of see things for what they are. They start to see things for what they are. So this is a good age to start breaking things down and actually giving them answers, going over. If they were memorizing, for example, surahs at a younger age, now maybe it's time to talk about the meanings, right? Because when they're younger, they won't get a lot of the concepts of, you know, in the surahs. But when they start to think and reflect on the world around them, their own place in the world, this is developmentally what's happening to them. Um, then it's then you can reach that that part of them, you know, and you can actually start breaking things down. So storytelling is very good. Um, stories from the Quran and Sira that, that display um, things that they also appear to or appeal to, like valor, nobility, courage, honesty, uh, honor, bravery. These things appeal to kids in this age, right? So you want to look for stories from the Sira that talk about that, like winning. Because they're alive. Think about their world. In their world, it's like, you know, when they're young kids, they're all playing together, and then all of a sudden, you get into this, you know, middle school sort of age, and it's definitely, you know, winners and losers. That's how everybody starts to see things. So that language, it's it's affecting them. They see, you know, they, they might be the underdog, or they know kids that are being bullied, or they know bullies. So they the, the, when you speak to them about things that are, that they can uh, relate to, it actually get, gets their interest. So speaking about stories about victory and overcoming hardships, those are really good ways to, to reach them. And then, like I said, um, you know, fiqh and, and, and you know, explaining the wisdoms behind what we do, what we do. That's important in time uh, to start doing that. And then practical rules and tips, life skills, to boost their confidence. You know, this is a very, very vulnerable age. And the more they can do that's unique and different, the better for them, right? So if you can teach them things or expose them to things that kind of set them apart from other, from their from their peer groups, it boosts their confidence, right? So um, this is again where you have to get a little bit more creative, and innovation really matters in terms of your parenting. And remember, they're watching every single thing, so you have to be authentic. And then the last group is the adolescents, right? And this is why, uh, this is, you know, in the, in the quote of, uh, you know, Ali, he, he tells us, right, that this is the age where we have to befriend them. Why? Because they need love, respect, and empathy. This is where their, you know, adulthood is imminent. They're about to, you know, embark on, on their own journeys and lives, and they really need, like, someone to hold their hand and help them through that. So you can't, that authoritative modeling of parenting is, is in my opinion, very destructive at this age. You're, it's, it's not healthy to be barking orders and shouting and slamming doors and just arbitrarily throwing rules out to your children. You have to explain to them things. You have to respect them. You have to respect that they are adults from the Islamic perspective. Once your kid hits puberty, they are adults. They're accountable to Allah Subhanahu. They have to pray there five times a day. They have to fast. They're adults, and that's why even you know, historically, children of you know in those ages they got married. They were actually treated like adults. Some of you know their their battles that were led by I think eleven or twelve year old boys. You know, so they were treated with a certain sense of respect, and we don't do that anymore. We you know we really unfortunately treat. Children who are under 18, like they're deficient, and they, you know, they don't know anything, and we know better than them, and we talk down to them. And that's why you have so much resentment in a lot of households from teenagers towards their parents, because there's no respect. They don't respect their privacy, their need for just being by themselves sometimes, right? 
even their physical needs. They know how we've talked about being a, a good leaders. You know your own needs, but you also know the needs of your children. You have to respect, for example, like there's articles now that are popping out everywhere. But like, for example, children, especially teenagers, one of their primary basic physical needs is what? Sleep. Sleep. I can't tell you how many times I've personally witnessed parents really getting upset at their children and calling them names because they want to sleep. And they'll deride them in front of other people. Lazy, you know, sleeping, no sleeping in, just talking down to them as if that, you know, is, is not important. Like they're totally useless because they want to sleep in and actually really just enjoy sleeping. They need to sleep. There's a lot of things going on. And kind of, I liken it like, you know, the infant stage, infants sleep a lot because their brains are transforming, right? Their physical bodies are transforming, so that sleep helps them. For teenage brains, it's the same. They are going through major physical, physiological changes, and the brain needs sleep. But if you disrespect your teenager and make them feel like they're lazy because they want to sleep, how do you expect there to be any sense of, you know, like, you respect me, or, you know, like I want to connect with you. That's why, you know, they'll just go to their room, you won't talk to them, they'll give you one of their answers, maybe. They don't feel like you really see them for who they are. They're just extensions of you, if they're not perfect, there's something wrong with them, and then you, you get mad at them, right? And that's where that whole ideal that we create is so destructive, and we have to stop that. They are an amana, we are meant to do everything in our power to raise them to be decent human beings and, and inshallah, excellent servants to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's our, our obligation. It's not so that they, you know, go to the best schools and that they're perfectly polished everywhere and they look amazing in every picture and whenever we take them around, there are trophies that we just sell, you know, carry around with us. But that's the kind of attitude a lot of parents have. So when your, you know, child doesn't do what you want them to do, and that you think they should do, then it's just anger that comes out, right? But if you actually saw their individuality and learned about their personality and their differences, you would see that they have different needs. I remember I gave a similar talk um, a while ago at another event, and this mom came up to me afterwards, and she was totally in tears. She was just like a mess, and I, I, I said, what happened? And she said, you know, after listening to your talk, I realized, like, I, it's my fault that my... my her second son, that she has like a really bad relationship with him. She said, I, all I did was basically compare him to his older brother, uh, who was more extroverted, outgoing, athletic, you know, kind of had sort of, you know, he just did more, and he wasn't like that. He was shy, he was introverted, he was not into sports. He, he was more like a book sort of worm. And she thought he was like, there was something wrong with him. So she basically, you know, just labeled him, you know, would, would fight with him often because he wasn't like his brother. And so she realized, like, you know, she just, she didn't respect him and she didn't really see him for who he was. It was like, you're not like this other child that I consider perfect, therefore something's wrong with you. And this is why we have to get out of that mindset. This age is so, so important that we really pay attention to who they are. So friendship, mentorship, it's really important. If you can't be that friend, for your children in this age because of whatever reason, you know, you're not available, you have to make sure that they have decent or appropriate mentors for them. Do it, be active. There's mashallah, you know, they have youth programs here, there's Tali, there's SRBIC. We have an abundance of programming, but it's just a matter of are you a passive parent or an active parent? Does it matter to you or does it not? So if it matters to you, then you go out and look for people. Or you look for individuals and you say, you know what? I really like you. Would you be willing to be like, you know, a mentor to my son or my daughter? You know, that's what needs to happen. And uh, some parents, honestly, it's better that they outsource that. And, and that's when, again, knowing when you're beyond, beyond, you know, it's your scope, knowing that you can rely on other people. That's that's part of, you know, effective leadership. Classes and experiences this is a really good time to do things with your teenagers. So, brothers, if you have sons that are, you know, uh, teens, Look for programs that are designed for father-son experiences. This proves on really, really effective. Okay, because you're saying, I see you, and I care about you, and I want to do things with you. Right? Yes. Yeah, we do that with our kids, but if someone that we have three boys and a girl, 
and our middle boy gets really upset any time we take one of the other kids, mm -hmm. but when it's his turn, he's okay with <laughs> But like, when I say upset, like really, really, mm -hmm. it blows up and we just oh, stop no. right now. Oh, that's we decided lot. to just stop doing that and just do everything together. Is it because in your absence there's something like that? Does he, do the other kids pick on him? No. Is he being bad by his own siblings? Because that happens. <laughs> no, I don't know. I'll get into Actually, yeah. yeah. Out school for one, he's the one who forces everything on mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. and he usually gets away with it, which I think because my husband always lets it go. Yeah. And I think this is part of the reason why um, he behaves this way. Because he's gotten yeah. away with it for so long. Yeah. And, and I keep telling my husband, you need to just mm -hmm. yeah. this behavior really good right now. Right? Yeah. Why don't we just decide to stop to mm help -hmm. deal with the way we What about doing one on one? Because I know two on one, it sounds great, but maybe so, it would be more effective if it's No, it's actually my husband. I am him? Yeah, because he works a lot, okay. so I, I make I make sure that he spends time with the kids. Okay. So I hold him just so you can get to know them. Right. Make each one That's nice. a certain okay. day of the week and just be with them. So usually Wednesdays mm -hmm. or Fridays, he takes one of them out and hangs out with them and nice. has dinner with them by himself. Mm -hmm. But for some odd reason, when he's not the habit store. <laughs> So maybe, well, you know, this would actually be a good exercise for you to empower him, like, you know, and say, Muhammad, we realized that it really bothers you, and so we decided to stop this, but we want to work with you. Like, maybe we can talk about a, a setup that would help you. What do you think? Can you give us advice? Let him rise to solve the problem for you, right? And see, maybe he might be creative and say, well, you know, what would help me when you guys do do that is if you do X, Y, and Z. And see if you can actually work, right? This is where collaboration can really come through. Because you might say, well, okay, I'll be okay with it if you give me this, you know? And if it's worth it for you, that's what he does. It's a idea. This is negotiation, but you know what? That's okay. The game is his first thing to go, but I tell him you already had your dream. Yeah. But you know, it's okay. And this is negotiation and teaching them how to negotiate fairly and honestly and, you know, being... It's good for life skills. It's good for him to learn that, you know? As long as you're happy with the conditions and he's happy and it's mutually respected, I'm good that. But that's where you, you're you teaching him, like, I respect you. There are needs and the fact that this really bothers you is something that's important to me. I'm not going to be dismissive of you and tell you, oh, well, well, what's wrong with you, right? I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to honor that, you know, maybe there's a, you have a psychosomatic response, it's a stress response, it makes you sick. You know, there's something happening here but I want to, you know, we still want to do this, but how can we do it with you? So that's a conversation that might work, inshallah. We should try that. So, you know, and that's where, you know, discussions and debates are also really healthy for this age group. To actually have discussions like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Just see what they say, because what that does is it tells them, I respect what you want to say. I'm actually interested in what you have to say. I'm not just, you know, I know it all, you're just a little kid, you don't know anything. Which is unfortunately how a lot of parents, you know, are with their teenagers. Like, you don't know anything. I have to teach you everything because you don't know. Well, that's not true. Our kids are very bright, mashallah. And they actually could teach us a lot if we listened. And sometimes just listening, I mean, mashallah, even with my own young children, sometimes they have literally blown my mind. Because they'll say something where I'm like, wow, I would have never thought of it that way. So we have to be willing to see that, I mean, you know, as they grow, they always have perspectives that we can benefit from. Okay, so then, what where are the biggest threats? This is again part of being an effective leadership. You need to know what the threats are. Shaitan and nafs, first and foremost, we know this. Abu and Mubin, our own nafs is our own enemy. That's why purification of the heart diseases that matters to know this stuff and teach it to your children. Bad company, get rid of bad company. You don't need bad company. Shaitan can come in the human form and in the spiritual form. That is a fact. There are shayateen amongst us. So people who take your children and basically try to, you know, encourage them in the wrong path, get them away from your children. You have every right to, to police that. Media and pop culture, you got to be on it. You have to know what your kids are listening to. If your kids have, you know, iPhones or access to music and you're not reading the lyrics that they're listening to, that's very dangerous. The lyrics are demonic in many of these songs, like literally demonic. And you're and they're just like, oh this is good. And all they're listening to are like demon verses and you're just like, Oh, it's okay. And I give my words and no, it's not cool. See what they're doing, pay attention. Um, internet and social media, I've talked about this, but you have to be on your game about this. 
There's websites like Common Sense Media. If your kids ever want to download an app or a movie or anything, you can go and quickly do a search and see if it's safe. See what other parents are saying. See what other kids are saying. Vet things before you go, okay, that's fine, whatever, I don't care. Okay, is it free? Okay. You know, that's shouting across the room. That's what parents do, right? It's like so passive. And then, you know, people need to know, like when I do the social media trainings, there are vault apps that parents are clueless about. Thousands and thousands of vault apps. So it's a vault app. It's an app that is a fake. It's basically like a calculator on your phone, and then you click on the calculator, and guess what? It's actually a portal to something far more nefarious and dangerous. It gives you access to chats. It gives you access to store pictures and videos. You have to know. You have to know this stuff. And what developers design them like, like it's nothing. Like they're just producing mass production parties because it appeals to kids. They know how to hide things from their parents. So there's people who are making a lot of money off of these you know, apps. But you need to know this. So there's you know, articles that talk about how to, um, you know, basically get ahead and know even, like, what's going on, not just on social media, but what trends are happening in schools. You know, they have all these weird trends that they do, like a marshmallow thing, and they're like, you know, there's just weird pictures, like, things that they have to do. What are the trends that are catching on in schools, and are your kids participating, or are their friends participating? Kids have died because of their uh, fall into, again, pure, you know, accepted behavior, and they think, oh, it'll make me cool and popular if I do this, and next thing you know, they're in the emergency room, basically flatline, because they did something without proper judgment, and that's where, as a parent, you have to think for them and be ahead of these things. Let me see your phone. Make sure you have really good policies as far as social media is concerned in your home. They shouldn't have the phone in their rooms. They shouldn't be accessing things in the middle of the night. No, no, and no. And all, like, computer access should be in common areas. So if they want to do homework, fine. The computer's right there in the middle of the kitchen area space, living room. Everybody can walk by it. There's no, like, we try to screen time. I'm just like, no, what is that? So we have to have better rules when it comes to these things. And then, you know, knowing what pressures are out there and what they're expected to conform to. I mean, we talked about this, but identity politics is a big thing right now in this, you know, country. And it's confusing a lot of teenagers. They don't know. Who would I identify with? How do I identify with? What gender am I? Now it's like it's getting out of hand. So you need to know what's going on in the society around you because when they go to public schools and they go to the colleges and universities, these are the conversations that are taking over our classrooms. It's not even about education anymore. So it's social justice causes and things like that. So if you don't know and you're checked out, then good luck. You know, you're gonna have issues. So you know, teach them their faith properly, how to protect themselves, model the behavior you want them to follow, empower them with strong, effective tools in their toolkits, right? Build their confidence, encourage trust, communicating effectively, identifying their strengths and weaknesses. And, uh, you know, something that I don't know if we'll have time today, maybe for our next session, is the four temperaments. I actually really wanted to introduce that to you guys today, but it's a lot of information. But just to kind of give you some hope, you know, it's really important to know what's going on between teens or, or youth that are religious and identify religiously and those that don't. And this gives us some hope, inshallah. 54% of teens devoted to God say they are very happy, while only 29% of disengaged say they're, they're very happy. So they're basically clear difference right there. In giving your child being at an early age and positively introducing things to them and really just doing it the correct way, inshallah, they'll, they'll be happy with children. That's what we all want. We want our kids to be happy. Bismillah. Is that good? Alhamdulillah. So, you know, in addition to the staff, the shepherd also holds another tool, which is called a rod or a club. So, again, you have to think of yourself in these terms. I have to make sure I have reach control safety down. Now, what can I do? The rod, the rod is there to 
literally ward off, uh, you know, any predators or anything that's dangerous. So please, if you see things that are clear and present risks for your children, you have to speak out. You can't just be passive and go, uh, I'm not sure if I should say anything, if I should do anything. You have to be of that mindset that I need to shut it down because, you know, if I give um, this any more time, it might turn into something worse. And I shared last time, for example, you know, there was a, a mother that I had met who, whose daughter, who was a middle school aged uh, girl, and she was, uh, she had made some friends who basically started making her doubt her own sexuality as a 12 year old girl or 11, you know, middle school. And, um, and I had, the mother asked me what I should, what she should do. And my advice was very clear. I was like, you need to remove her, these people from her life. There's no, you know, question in my mind that as long as they remain in her life, she will continue to have problems because, you know, if you have friends like that, God forbid, who are putting all these thoughts in your mind that you, they're not, they, she didn't, you know, come up with them. They're, you know, planting these seeds. Like, well, how do you know? that you really are straight unless you experiment astaghfirullah with someone else that's the only way you can definitively know these are the types of thoughts that this poor girl was exposed to which obviously caused her a lot of confusion now imagine if the mother just maintained those friendships or allowed her to continue to you know hang out with those people you don't think that it's going to spiral into even worse things you know more experimentation with drugs alcohol god knows what else so you as the parent have to know how to immediately shut things down that you know are dangerous for your for your children. Yes. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. How do you go about shutting it down without revealing your Right. Right. So I mean I think every you know, in this situation it was the schooling environment that her daughter was in. So that, I mean, that's a logistical issue that, you know, if you really as as parents sit there and think like, you know what, if the environment is like this and there's a, this is common practice, maybe we need to consider just pulling her out of that school, right? So it's kind of an easy fix. Every situation is going to require that sort of, you know, you know, tailored response. So it's hard to kind of give across the blanket because if it's family, it's obviously going to be closer and it's going to cause more problems or if it's someone in the community. So you have to really, uh, you know, um, be thoughtful about how you approach these things and maybe seek counsel. But I think having this sort of, uh, you know, I don't know if I should do anything because of a fear of a consequence, I think is far more dangerous because the consequences should be very clear, like allowing your children to continue to be exposed to these types of threats is far worse than any fallout from actually, you know, stopping it. And and it's because their soul is at stake, right? I mean, people stuff for all nowadays, you know, like I said, this this is such a common thing now. It's these are topics that are very, you know, talk, talked about loosely uh, in you know amongst our children. And so if you allow them to to be exposed to this more and more, that's exactly what Shaitan wants. He wants to normalize all of these things, make it not a big deal. Um, and as Allah, it just starts to chip away at their their heart, their their faith. And so that's why it's sort of like, no, I have to shut it down because the more they're in that environment, the more you know, there's risk for them losing their soul, literally, from a, from an Islamic perspective, right? So. I would say again, it's going to require a different response per situation, but just to be um, be as as uh, thoughtful as process. Uh, I mean, as possible. So um, then we talked about, Bismillah. You know, so uh, once you see yourself again, that parenting isn't just this dream that I live, you know, that I dream up and that I I imagine, and it's all going to go exactly like the script that I want because I am who I am, and my wife is who she is, or my husband is who he is. Um, and we have the dua of all these amazing people. Those are all great, but the responsibility is still on every single one of us. And when we see that, then we look at, well, okay, now that I see myself as this leader and I have to protect the people that are under my care, how do I do that? You need to know your responsibilities first and then your rights. So you need to know what are the rights of children over the parents, because that informs you what your responsibilities are, right? If you know what the children's rights are, then you know what you have to do as a parent. Then what are the rights of the parent over the child? Unfortunately, the script is totally opposite now. All parents go into parenting 
knowing very well what their rights are over their children, and so that's all they repeat to them, you know, you have to obey me, you have to listen to me, Jenna's under my foot, and we're just like constantly using, you know, scripture to uh, tell children, to put them in their place, and let them know clearly that we have all these help over them, but we need to also be very informed beforehand what our rights are over them. And then, also we talked about, you know, does culture define your parenting model, or does it slam? Because if you come from a specific cultural understanding of parenting and there's a conflict there with uh, Islam, you have a decision to make. What's it going to be, right? Uh, and we talked specifically about double standards and the danger of double standards. Because in many cultures, this is um, common, right? That there's double standards for the way boys are treated versus the way girls are treated. And people don't realize that these are not Fair. And when you have things that are imbalanced and unfair, they have consequences to that. So if you, you know, prefer your, your, your sons and you're always letting them get away with everything and you're um, treating them like they basically do no wrong and then you're hypercritical over your daughters and her every move is analyzed, you're going to create real problems for them in their adult life. Your boy will grow up to be a man who is very entitled and he wants you know, he's, he has a lot of expectations from his wife, and it's going to cause problems for him in that regard. Um, and also your daughter might, you know, grow up very resentful because she was suppressed for all during her childhood. She wasn't allowed to do anything. You know, there were curfews imposed on her. There was always rules. She had to do more chores in the house. She was always, like, treated a different way than her son. Then you don't think that's going to cause resentment, right? it will absolutely cause resentment. And this is where, you know, she might also, you know, it, it just breaks things, the relationship down between parent and child. But if you abandon cultural, you know, standards and say, what is the standard of Islam? Then you see that it's just all the way across. Boys and girls are treated equally as children. They have the same, uh, you know, obligations to their parents. They should participate in the household the same. And men shouldn't, you know, or uh, a voice should not be prevented from doing domestic work. This is not girls' work. To wash plates and do fold laundry doesn't make your uh, boy uh, feminine. These are attitudes, unfortunately, that are very, very, uh, you know, just damaging and, and wrong because it's completely against the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu washed his own dishes. He, he sort, he's, you know, uh, he was known to patch up his own clothing. So, astaghfirullah, whose, whose standards are we accepting? The, the greater society around us who really, you know, um, sort of, you know, poses boys and girls against each other and makes everything that's, uh, that girls do low and just, you know, like, we don't want to, you know, participate in those things. And so, if boys are taught that, then they learn to disrespect women's work and they learn to see themselves above, above and better. But if it's like, no. This is the sunnah of the Prophet and we all practice it across the board. Then it again brings that balance. And so inshallah you raise men and women who have respect for each other and who aren't being pitted against each other like the society wants, right? So always maintaining that balance. And we talked about um, the importance of, you know, being, you know, true to whatever you want your children to do. Model it first. You can't expect that your children are going to raise, uh, you know, grow up to be these model citizens and perfect you know, um, in every which way, if you don't model that behavior for them. So it's very important to be, you know, to, if you want your children to be properly guided, to, to know that they learn by imitating, listening to you, watching you, observing you. And so you need to check yourself and all the things that you want for yourself, make sure that you're doing them as well. And we also talked about tailored parenting and making sure that we know that no two children, even if they're in the same household, even twins uh, are the same. And you have to know uh, how to, again, when we talk about reach, control, and security, it's going to be different in some ways per child, even in the same household. Communication styles for boys and girls, for example, are going to be different. And you have to do that research and do the reading to know how to uh, talk about certain topics with each child differently, right? But also, which we're going to get to, inshallah, knowing your children's temperament, knowing that 
you know, how, um, how are children different, uh, you know, in what ways, and, and knowing and understanding how their personality types um, present themselves uh, differently, but knowing, again, how to reach different personality types, which we'll get to, inshallah. And so then we talked about, you know, the five characteristics of an effective leader are strong communication, passion and commitment, positivity, being positive, not being this negative person, and then, you know, authoritative model of parenting where you're just barking rules and orders constantly and you're always in a negative state. It's going to be very difficult for you to get the respect of your children if you're like that. They may fear you and you may get them to do what you want in the moment, but you won't have their respect. And if you do it with young children, for just wait and see what happens to you when they get into their teenage years. If that's your model of parenting, where you're just angry and negative and yelling, and it's just like, just constantly like that, don't expect anything but the same to be shown to you when they hit those teenage years and they're slamming doors in your face and they're just not responding to you anymore, right? Because you've they they're modeling what you've shown them, right? That I'm just gonna be negative and angry and I'm shutting you out and what I you know the conversations get shut down it's going to all repeat itself so positivity is really important to when you're parenting to really watch yourself and make sure your energy isn't down and negative all the time innovation to be creative so a big responsibility you know and uh, we talked about this too is we have to be willing to you know read and and get creative in terms of you know all the things that we want from our children whether they're really young and we want to teach them different things, but we have to do that. I think our problem is, and it's just the, you know, circumstance that many of us live, we're living in difficult times. It's especially Bay Area life. A lot of us work uh, full time. So it's almost like we're in this constant, you know, rush or race and, and we don't have the time to do certain things. But if you can, um, you know, if you're, if you're always outsourcing everything that when it comes to your children to other people and you're not taking certain things on your own, it's going to cause a problem. You won't have much because you're, you're breaking down that relationship. They need you more than anybody else. So there's times, yes, where you need, you can rely on other people to, whether it's dropping them off, um, you know, to childcare or schools or Sunday school. But if you're not doing anything of your own, that's unique for you and your child, then this is, you know, going to cause, it's going to break down your relationship. So you got to have to start thinking innovatively about how can I make time for my children? How can I do certain things that are just me and them? And I'm not always, you know, just rushing from one event to the other or one thing to the other. And they're kind of, you know, we're like ships passing, you know, during the day or the night. And that's what families a lot of times happens. It's like we're all over scheduled. We have too many things going on. But where is the innovation is where it's like, no, I have to do something. So I have friends, for example, who make it a point where, you know, once a year, for example, they will, um, you know, take a trip maybe, like a, a weekend trip or a day trip with uh, with each child, just separating, you know, the, the children. So it's not, it's, it's to show that child that I see you, you matter to me, and our bond is really important. So just you and me, we're going to go, you know, for a day trip somewhere, and we're going to do whatever you want to do, and I'm going to bring you into my world, or I'm going to go into your world. This is innovation. It's really thinking outside the box instead of, you know, always, um, like I said, uh, just you know, the default setting, which is just to do, uh, you know, same routine every single weekend or every single week. Think creatively about how to reach our, your children, inshallah. And then collaboration. This is, again, um, you know, knowing where, if you, if you do need help with certain things, knowing who your collaborators are and working with people, whether they're educators, whether they're other, uh, you know, maybe mental health, uh, people in the mental health field, People who know about children that you want to learn from, um, read from. There's people like Leonard Sachs. He's amazing, and he's come to the Bay Area several times. Uh, if next time if he comes, I highly encourage you to attend his talks because he, even though he's not Muslim, he's you know still a moral, ethical person. He sees the dangers that are happening in the society at large, and he's really trying to get parents back on track to take control again because we've we've lost control, right? So he's someone who we should definitely look to his books. He's written amazing books. Look to his material. But there's people like that that we should know about, like who, you know, whether they're, you know, again, authors or educators or therapists uh, outside in the, you know, or or here in, in our communities. But make sure that we know who to rely on. So um, again, those are the five characteristics of an effective leader. And then reminding ourselves constantly that parenting is a trust from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We will absolutely be asked about every single thing that we do and when you weigh that constantly on your heart 
then you don't look at your children as being little, you know, sort of servants that are just there to make your life easy. But you look at them like, I have to do everything in my power to, uh, to love them, to guide them, to, to give them uh, the foundations that they need to take on this very, very dangerous world. And so it's all on us. It's, and, and it's a, it should weigh us down. It shouldn't be something that we just use to kind of justify exploiting our children, which unfortunately a lot of parents, you know, it's like, I made them, I brought them into this world, I can do whatever I want with them. And we said, no, this is, that's, to you have to reject that thinking 100%. They belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he gave it, them to us for an appointed time. We don't know how long, but if we accept that this is a huge weight on our shoulders, then we'll take this as, seriously right it's not we're not passively parenting we're going to be actively parenting every day okay and then um you know ch that children's rights are mandated by god so knowing what those are um the prophet said said um sorry hold on Fear Allah and treat your children small or grown fairly with equal justice. So this again brings back, you know, what we talked about earlier is just making sure that you're really fair with your children and equal with them, not preferential treatment. Just because one child maybe really is sweet and very obedient and they always do what you say doesn't mean that they get more rights and more sort of, you know, you give them, you know, uh, more privileges uh, just because, you know, you like them better. And it's true that you will have uh, that. It's just a reality of life that some children you will feel stronger bond with than your other children if you have multiple children. But you have to be fair and, uh, and just when you're parenting. If you're using, you know, um, them again uh, in this way where it's like, oh, because, you know, I like you better or you do more things for me, therefore you get this and this, you're setting a really dangerous precedent and you have to be a, for yourself. You know, you have to really... Be careful because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you to account for that. Equal justice all the way across and, and be fair. Um, so the, the, and these are from, this is from the Quran, so the Baqarah, the Prophet, is, uh, or excuse me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the father will bear the costs of their food and clothing on equitable terms. So this is just a reminder for the brothers that, you know, providing for your children um, is, uh, is on you. This is, you know, one of their rights over you. And then um, another uh, hadith, the Prophet said, one of the rights of children over their parents is being given a nice name and having a good education. Uh, you will be called out with your names and your father's names on the day of judgment, so give nice names to your children. So just making sure that their education, who they're learning everything from, is, again, in line with your belief, with, your, with what you want for them. And that is what active parenting is, making sure you're, you know, if you have young children and they're in first grade kindergarten, knowing what their teacher is going to be exposing them to. I think it was, um, I think it was Fremont, right? Recently they had a vote where they were going to start introducing, you know, um, was it, uh, there was a, it was something about marriage, I can't remember, but they had a huge vote that they had to take with the school board because they were trying to introduce, you know, certain concepts to children at a very, very young age about different types of families, right? And so, alhamdulillah, you know, people showed up and they were able to shut it down. But some parent, the, the sisters that I knew who were involved were very disappointed that more Muslims didn't show up. As we know, there's a very large population of Muslims in the Fremont School District. But they weren't probably even aware that this was being proposed. So this is the kind of stuff that we have to, as parents, again, be ahead of. No, what, is our, what are our kids being exposed to? And that's a right. It's one of the rights of your children, that their education is solid. So making sure that, they, you know, you, you know that. Um, so yeah, we talked about this, but again, these, this is, uh, another reminder that there's no, you know, no two children are the same. And, uh, these are two beautiful quotes from Ali Ibn Abi Talib, who said, do not raise your children the way your parents raised you. They were born for a different time. And this is very important because a lot of our parenting is modeled after the way we were parented, but this is again, a form of passive parenting because you're just repeating things that were done to you even things that you didn't maybe even like as a child you think ah, it worked for me because I turned out okay and I'll just repeat it to my kids but we're living in very different times and so being more active as a parent you're looking at the world around realizing children are totally different now than they were 10 15 20 years ago and 
basing your parenting on what needs to be done now. And then, you know, this is another hadith that a lot of our understanding about how to reach children and how to teach them, you know, from different stages is is uh, is rooted from from this quote of uh, Ali uh, Ibn Abi Talib again, Allah, he said, play with your children till the age of seven, discipline and teach them from the age of seven to 14 and befriend them at the age of 14. So, and then, you know, we went into the different um, stages and what we should, what our mindset should be. So in that early stage, between two and seven, play. Everything should be play-based. We should really be reaching our children with, um, with just, you know, their imagination. They're in a world of imagination, and we need to reach them there. So storytelling with animation, song, rhymes, and obviously modeling good behavior. These are ways that we can teach them, right, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, giving those, you know, uh, or creating a connection with Allah and the Prophet and We have to be willing to meet them where they're at, and they're in that imaginative state. So actually getting really well-versed in how to teach children in that younger age, these are the things that you'll learn. Storytelling is huge. But not just, you know, reading a book, because we're all very good at reading books. We can read and we're great at that. I'm talking about animated storytelling, where you actually bring a story to life and really um, bring them into that age of wonder, right? Children, why do we, they love cartoons and Pixar movies? It's because they tap into this, you know, love of wonder and magic and this world that's just beyond their, you know, imagination. And so when we create that in our storytelling and connect it to Allah and the Prophet you're having the same effect. So when you tell stories from the seerah that are miraculous, bring it to life, right? Don't just say, oh, you know, Islam Miraj, the Prophet jumped on a horse and it had wings and it went, you know, like make it so dry and boring. Bring it to life, you know, bring that, um, just that, 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 like that vision, uh, that those visual effects into their mind so that they can actually imagine it. And if you can draw even better, you know, if you can actually draw things while you're telling, that's amazing talent. Why not use it? But using that, and then songs and rhymes, being, you know, willing to just sing things to them, getting them, like, mashallah, you know, for the maulid that was here last night, bringing them to places like that is really beneficial for their hearts. Children love songs. They love movement. They love all of those things. So exposing them to that is really important. Um, Ta'lif, which is not too far from here, especially on a Sunday, about 20 minutes I do that drive from Pleasanton in this area they have weekly molens and it's a beautiful if you've never been there you should definitely attend because there's children everywhere and they are all you know they're much to praise the Prophet but they you know they love it and exposing your children to that is great so those are things that we can do from a very early age to attach their hearts to the love uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu and obviously love of Allah Subhanahu and of course modeling that's for the younger age for that middle, the school age children from between seven and fourteen, we're, we should be in the mode of teaching, okay? Because now they can actually take instruction. Before seven, they're just in play mode, but at seven and beyond, they actually can, you know, think on a different level and actually, you know, you can reach them by teaching them and really breaking things down for them. So storytelling still works. Um, metaphors, analogies, really kind of tapping into their more logical brain where they're, where, you know, thinking things on an abstract level and they're able to think things differently than when they're children. You know, just kind of, you know, again, looking at see it or Quran, whatever it is that you want to teach them, but doing it, having that understanding that now they're open to these types of things, right? And then uh, still, modeling is very important that we continue to model uh, really good behavior. So uh, also in this age, um, you know, teaching them concepts like fiqh, you know, and really bringing down, breaking down the why of what we do, right? Um, because in the beginning, it's just we're just teaching them what what it is. They, they they may know Quran, but they have no idea of the meanings. They might not know all of the different beliefs, you know, because they're too young to sort get certain concepts. But once they're a little older, you start breaking things down. Breaking, you know, this is why we do certain things. So fit, and then also I I, I encourage um, sharing stories that display things that appeal to this age, right? Uh, stories that uh, talk about valor, nobility, courage, honesty, bravery. A lot of kids in this age, because they're dealing with their own insecurities, they might uh, see bullying going you know, uh, around them. They might not have friends that are sort of, you know, being mistreated a certain way. It appeals to them to have stories that talk about, you know, um, 
about valor, about winning, you know, instead of always seeing things that are kind of in that negative light around them. So you want to expose them to that, you know, inshallah. And then um, I also think it's really important at this uh, stage to teach them practical rules and tips and life skills that boost their confidence. So I was actually telling my husband, you know, that I, I think middle school children should totally, parents should really look into putting them into classes for to boost their confidence that, uh, you know, we teach them public speaking skills. And so we were just having this conversation, and then he attended, actually, um, there's a, have you heard of uh, Toastmasters before? How many have heard of Toastmasters, right? So a lot of professionals use this, and people who, you know, are trying to obviously get their public speaking skills set. But he said he went to one, and there was a, a man there who brought his young, like, 12 or 11-year-old kid. And I was like, yes, that's a really smart parent, because he, he's realizing, if I give my, you know, middle schooler who's full of insecurity an opportunity to actually work and hone in on that skill set, it will boost their confidence in ways that you can imagine as they grow into the high school age, and, you know, college and on, and on in their professional careers, just to be able to be comfortable speaking in front of people and, you know, having their voice and knowing how to do that effectively. Why not start early? So these types of life skill sets are really important or just anything that you, you know, uh, a skill set, you know, if they're in a sport or, or something else that they can learn that kind of, again, is special, it's their own thing, um, you know, nurture that. If they have an interest in something like that, nurture that because it does help boost their confidence in an age where their, you know, shaitan is just really tries to break their confidence down. And I know because I work a lot with teens, and this is, we all remember, right, adolescence is a really difficult time for kids, but if you give them things that, inshallah, can offset that, it really helps, and but it also creates a nice bond because it came from you. You saw a talent. If they like to draw, put them in arts classes. If they like chess, give them, you know, play with them. Let them get so good that they beat all the adults in the family. It's good. It's good for their confidence. But because you did that, you see, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're tightening your bond with your children. So this is innovative parenting. It's thinking, I need to, you know, look at where my kids are and the different unique talents that each has. And I'm going to nurture each one in their own way as best as I can. But I want to do that. I don't want a teacher or someone else to take that, right? I mean, it's, it's okay if, uh, if those opportunities are there, but it's much more special if, if it's coming from you as the parent. But you have to think of these things. Um, and then the teenagers, 14 and beyond, the, the theme really should be to befriend. We have to befriend our children. Again, this is an, a time where... Unfortunately, you know, in the early age stages or early uh, years, parents are the main influencers over their children. But there is a time where friends become the main influencer. So even, you know, like the, whoever your children's friends are, they can absolutely over, you know, ride you. You know, in your absence, this is where kids learn to be more deceptive and to lie and to start doing things behind their kid, parents' backs. Because maybe they were peer pressured or maybe, you know, they just listened to someone who gave them bad advice. How, how does that happen? It's especially, and, and it's actually worse if you have this authoritative model where you have no personal um, or sort of friendly connection with your children. And it's sort of like top down. Like, I'm your parent. That's it. You just follow my rules. And I don't really, you know, want to engage with you on a more deeper, you know, uh, level it's just follow the rules and that's it if you have that type of parenting style then for sure your kids are going to be under the influence of their friends more than you but if you realize like you know the teenagers this is where I really really need to be close with my friends then you'll take you know the time to start doing things more you know with you and them and uh, you know so for example you know I suggest um, taking classes and doing experiences together so you and your children if there's a class or something that you think would be good for them, doing it with them, not just dropping off and going, I'll see you in a couple hours. No, going with them, accompanying them, sitting with them and learning the same thing. And then using that as an opportunity to discuss, to dialogue, to debate. It's really good to encourage um, your teenagers into discussion because what you're saying when you're open to have discuss discussions with your children, with your teenagers, is that I actually respect your point of view. I want to listen to your point of view, even if you think they don't know what they're talking about. And it's like internally you're just like, oh, here's those teenagers going on about things they don't know. 
it's okay. You know, let them get it out. Let them feel that they're validated, you know, when they're talking to you. Because sometimes, again, we talk at our teens, like, yeah, 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 you know. But this is very unhealthy, and it's actually going to cause more division and more, you know, um, just distance. So the opposite of that is true. Engaging them, having discussion. What do you think of this? What do you think of what's going on, you know, with, with the world or whatever it is, any news story that's going on? But letting them know, I respect you, okay, because this is one of their primary needs in this age, that you respect them. So these are, you know, the, the, the different things per age group. Um, and then we just kind of went over some statistics. So this is encouraging for parents who are really trying to raise and children who are rooted in their faith, okay? Because there is clear difference between children who have strong faith and homes that faith is important, whereas homes that are more secular and it's like, you know, it's not really a, a big thing, you know, a primary thing that's... Uh, that's talked about or relevant into the fa in the family. So here, 54% of teens devoted to God say they are happy, while only 29% uh, are disengaged. Okay, 47% uh, of religious teens think about the meaning of life. So alhamdulillah, if you plant these seeds early on, you get your, your teenagers actually to think about life seriously, to weigh the consequences of their decisions. You know, to have this sort of, you know, mindset will prevent and pr protect them, inshallah, from what the culture outside is telling them, right? Which is YOLO, FOMO, right? You only live once. Uh, these are the things that teens are getting bombarded with. Like just, you know, do whatever you want. You only live once. And that's honestly the, the most, one of the most destructive messages, but everybody, all the, you know, um, the, the, the people in media, the, the, you know, the icons that a lot of teens look up to, whether it's social media or musicians or artists or whatever, this is their way of life. You know, it's promoting this attitude to just live in the moment, uh, feed your nafs, basically, do whatever you want. So you have to think, how can I offset that? Is giving your children a really strong foundation early about God and about their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the numbers speak for themselves. When you do that, it does, inshallah, protect them, right? Um, they say here, 95% of devoted teens feel it is important to wait until marriage. For sex. I mean, that's really big, and that's to our advantage, because they're, you know, you're giving the, them those those things early on. That by the time the topic becomes something that they're again, you know, uh, confronted with, that they alhamdulillah have, you know, their their conscience is clear, and they know exactly that it's not something for them. Um, and then, as far as the last statistic here, according to the Journal of Adolescence. Findings demonstrate that religiosity measured as perceived importance of religion, attendance in worship services, and participation. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not reading the same slide. Pardon me. Here, the, here we go. The, very, the, the one in the yellow. Um, so uh, findings demonstrate that religiosity measured as perceived importance of religion, attendance in worship services, and participation in a religious youth group significantly contributed to explaining variation in six youth risk behaviors. Smoking, alcohol use, truancy, sexual activity, marijuana use, and depression. So to bring them to the masjid, to attend those classes with them, to uh, constantly remind them, again, of the importance of religion and having a connection with Allah, um, it's going to protect your children, inshallah ta'ala, from a lot of the stuff that teens are, are that are plaguing teen culture. Okay? So it's, it's, a, it's good news for us, inshallah, as long as we do what we're doing. So now, this was a... A summary because I wanted you to follow the conversation uh, for mo those of you who weren't here for the last time. A summary of what we talked about the first session. Now, part two, the outline is a little different, um, and we're going to try to get to as much as possible. But let's go ahead, Bismillah, and uh, jump into here. So, spiritual principles and practices for every Muslim home. Every Muslim home should really think about where they are when it comes to these issues here. Number one, to love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wholeheartedly and practice daily gratitude to him, okay? Now, we obviously know, inshallah, we know the importance, the five daily prayers. This should be something set in stone in your home where, alhamdulillah, everybody prays their prayers. And you should, you know, encourage this as much as possible in congregation. So, obviously, during daily hours when kids are in school, you're at work, it's difficult, but in the evening, 
if you can make Maghrib and Isha together and even Fajr before they go to school, that means you've done three prayers as a family together and two of the prayers are not done together. This is still huge and you should make this part of your family culture where it's just this is what we do. We pray in Jama'ah. We, this is the importance of prayer and not like everybody for yourself. And Oh, you know, you just kind of walk in and I got to pray real quickly. And it's just disjointed and disconnected. It doesn't give your children the sense of how important prayer is if everything's rushed and nobody's really communicating about prayer, you know, or if it's just like, yeah, did you pray? And you're just shouting from across, you know, the hall as reminders to each other about prayer. Why not? Plus, it's time for prayer, everybody together, right? It should be done as a family. And it keeps you in check and it keeps them in check. Um, love of recitation of the Quran. This is really important. You know, I used to teach Quran to little kids. And, uh, you know, I always remember that parents, some parents would come, you know, first couple of weeks or a few weeks into the school year. And they'd be very, very concerned about how many surahs their children was memorizing. You know, their child was memorizing. And as a Qur'an teacher, I would have to stop them and say, listen, this isn't a HIFS program, okay? If you want HIFS, put them in a HIFS program. We're teaching your child to love the Qur'an, okay? And so that is a process. It's not, you know, you know like focusing on memorization alone isn't enough if you want your child to love the Qur'an. You have to, again, bring those stories to life. Make the Qur'an relevant to them. But in addition to that, teach teaching the recitation of the Qur'an like an art form instead of the subject is a really beautiful way to make it an enjoyable experience. So teaching them how to recite beautifully, teaching them to, um, you know, to, to find meanings or, uh, you know, certain meanings of surahs uh, that, that really speak to children's hearts, you know. There's so many things that you can do, but it all takes, again, your, you know, some, some creativity on your part. But I would have to tell parents, and I remember having to actually do, like, assembly, sort of, to just address this issue. Like, listen, it's so important that we teach your children adab with the Qur'an, to really know what the Qur'an is. This is the greatest treasure we have, to know how to treat it, to know how to walk with it. I've seen kids, you know, in many spaces, you know, they're going maybe in Sunday school or wherever. They have no, they're just treating the Qur'an like it's another book. They just tuck it under their arm. And they're walking around with it, sometimes dangling it, astaghfirullah, by their side. This is unacceptable. We have to, as parents, teach them this is the greatest thing that we have, and you have to honor it. Hold it with two hands above your waist. Make sure you're in a state of wudu. Be very mindful and respectful when you're touching the Qur'an. And then when you recite it, you bring your awe. You know, this is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't um, sit there distracted, looking at your phone while it's like, okay, you know. And it's like, this is what, unfortunately, again, what so many kids are forced into because their parents aren't really watching over them or they're just outsourcing the subject to other people and they're not really aware of what's going on. But walk, you know, go into certain spaces and you'll see, you know, really tragic things. I remember one of my friends, she was in a, in a masjid um, and she was working in a room adjacent to where the Qur'an teacher was teaching, you know, the students. And she was just listening to um, the banter that was going on between, be, before the, um, I mean, during the, the class. And when the Qur'an teacher was present, the kids were just like frozen, you know, model. They were listening because they were afraid, right? She said one time in particular, she said, stuff, oh, they left, the Qur'an teacher left, stepped out for a moment. And as soon as he walked out, the kids started saying the worst thing, like, I hate this, you know, in Safra, they used a curse word, class, why do my parents bring me here? And they're all, like, angry and bitter, because, you know, their parents are just maybe, you know, it's after hours, after school hours, it's like a convenient drop-off for them, and they're just, you know, they think, like, oh, they're going to go learn Quran. If your child expresses to you a disinterest in learning the Book of Allah, or is frustrated every time you tell them to go learn then you're not going about it correctly. The, for, there's a the problem. There's a disconnect. They're not, if they're like, uh, you know, and that's their attitude to the book of Allah, but you still force them to do it, what are you doing? You're creating a total negative association. I had a, a, a student once tell me that her friend, stuff for a while, I mean, this is what goes on in our community, but her friend began to cut herself 
uh, because she'd been traumatized her whole life. And one of the main reasons was because her mother was so hard on her when it came to Quran that even as a young three, four-year-old, if she would make a single mistake, she would chase her around the house, beating her, hitting her. So if you hit your children, astaghfirullah, yell at them um, and force them to learn the book of Allah and then, you know, guilt them the entire time, you're making terrible mistakes, terrible mistakes, because you're literally giving shaitan ammunition to make them, astaghfirullah, hate the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're, please be mindful of who you, how you teach your children Qur'an and who you allow to teach your children Qur'an. Make sure that they're gentle and that they're loving and that they do it with beauty because it's the book of the most merciful of the merciful. You can't remove mercy when you teach the book of Allah and compassion. So be very careful with that. But a big part of how you beautify the Qur'an is to, again, approach it not as just this subject that has, you know, it's all a numbers game, but rather, you know, make it a beautiful experience. Recite with them, teach them to recite, and go easy on them. You know, it's unless you're trying to produce the next, you know, Mishadi Ali Fasi, don't look at just numbers because the these verses will 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 they'll be responsible for them. Whatever they've memorized that they're not acting upon later in life. You know, they're going to be held accountable for it. So you have to be very careful with just trying to, you know, get to like, oh, I, I just want them to finish so then I can have like this big party for them and, you know, hold them up as a trophy into, in front of the community. Your priorities aren't right. It's very important that they love the, the book of Allah. So make sure that when you're teaching them Quran, that it's done in a really beautiful setting. And our teachers advised having some treats out for them, their favorite treats, always making really positive associations. You can do dates if they like dates. You can do cookies. You can give them candy. But like having that out as part of the experience, right? We're learning Quran and, you know, inshallah, this is what we will have to look forward to, bringing stories to life. These are all tips, okay? So, and then dhikr, you know, I, I'm, uh, I've talked about this a lot, but it's very important that we do the protective du'as every single day, okay? So, um, how many people here do awrad every day? Like you do a, a, a word as a family. Okay. Alhamdulillah, good. So the awrad, there's different ones, but our teachers here, all of our teachers here, they all recommend that we do the word al-latif, which is the word of Imam al-Haddad. You can do a search for it. There's PDF files. It's all available to you for free, and there's YouTube videos. It's an 18-minute recording. Every single day, this should be part of your household, like, you know, experience. Well, in our household, for example, we do it at, I mean, uh, excuse me, in the morning while I'm making breakfast for the kids. We have a Bluetooth speaker. We play it. It's resonating in the whole house. Everybody hears it. And it's just 18 minutes, but it's protective dawahs. And I promise you, if you get into the habit of this, you will see the blessings in your own life, but also your children, even in the younger ones. They will memorize it without even knowing they're memorizing it. They might not speak Arabic. They might not have any idea. They might not even be reciting along with it. But if they're hearing it every single day, you will ask them, you know, in a few months' time to recite parts of it. They will know it. So this is beautiful for them and for you because it's like they can be coloring. They can be playing with their Legos. They can be eating breakfast. But it's just, inshallah, reminders. And it covers everything you can think about in terms of, you know, all the potential problems of your day, and it's asking Allah to protect your everything, you know, protect you from, from worry and depression, anxiety, protect you from debt, protect you from physical harm, protect you from every evil in his creation. And you're just, it's all from the sunnah. But these are things that we should make as a practice in our home if we want to protect ourselves and our children from all the harms out there. We are empowered with these du'a. The Prophet left them for us for that exact reason. They're protective du'as. So if you're worried about, oh my God, I'm worried about my children, but then you're not doing this, there's a, there's a problem. There's a disconnect there. You, you can't be with them all the time. You can't oversee their every movement, but by it's kind of like putting them in this protective force field around them before you send them off to school or wherever they go, even if your kids are a little older and they work. 
alhamdulillah, put, make this a part of your culture in your home, in your, your family uh, life, that you, you do daily awrad every day. And uh, to be honest, 20 minutes of your time is nothing. If you consider the peace of mind you have to know, alhamdulillah, I've called on Allah to protect my children very specifically with very specific God. And I, inshallah, I, I put my trust in him. Okay, so it's very important to do that. And then to be devoted to the Prophet ﷺ and committed to following his sunnah. So important that we, again, model this behavior ourselves. So taking on the attributes and the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ for ourselves and then teaching our children the importance of modeling that, being gentle, being soft-spoken, just all the things that you associate with the Prophet ﷺ, being compassionate, speaking kind words, being generous, right? All these things that we love about him and that brings us to tears when we read about him. We are supposed to model it. It's not just that we look up to him and we're in awe of him and that's it. The objective is that we're doing it. So we follow his sunnah in every which way as much as possible. And this is for the brothers and the sisters, right? Um, so... You know, and this is a direct command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in Surah, uh, uh, chapter 59, verse 7. He says, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ Which is, and Allah says, and whatsoever the Prophet ﷺ gives you, take it. And whatsoever he forbids you, abstain from it. And fear Allah. Verily, Allah is severe in punishment. So following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is exactly that following his way and abstaining from what he uh, prevented us from abstaining from. Um, and then daily salawat, right? Um, very important, again, for us to realize how uh, how much we should be calling on uh, or, or, or bringing in the salawat into our homes, making sure that our children are reminded of, of how important he is in our life, he's a central figure in our life. We should be remembering him. We should be seeking, uh, you know, uh, just that connection with him. But if we're not doing these things, and then we're constantly, you know, saying, you know, when we're bringing him into our life, and when we're trying to make him, um, you know, the central part of our our family, we cannot do that if we don't realize that he. And everything he did from, you know, the moment he woke up until the moment he slept, he gave us something to model. It's recorded for us. There's no other tradition you'll find that has as much detail of how the Prophet ﷺ lived. But if we're not doing these things, and then we're saying, oh, he's important, it doesn't make sense, right? How convincing is that? If you're not doing anything, or you're very minimally following his sunnah, when you wake up, you don't say the du'as that you're supposed to say. When you go to change your clothing, there's du'a for everything. Going to the restroom, leaving that restroom, eating food, finishing your food, leaving the home. If we're not putting these sunnahs in place, but then we're trying so hard to convince our children how important he is, how convincing is it, right? You're not, you can't sell something that you yourself don't even believe. So it's so important that if you want him to be followed and respected and loved, that you first emulate that in your own practice. And so make sure that you're, you know, doing the things that are necessary for your children to say, okay, you know, that they, they can follow you, but you have to create that. So that's where salawat is very important, making sure that your children, um, you know, are, are doing that, but you are doing it as well. And there's actually a really... Um, I can read a few of them, but here's some of the benefits of just doing salawat on a daily basis. Um, first of all, you're responding responding to the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah commands that we do salawat, right? Um, and then you're also, uh, the angels, the angels do salawat on the Prophet There's ten blessings from Allah for the one who invokes one blessing on the Prophet So there's immense reward in that. Uh, he who sends blessings upon, upon the Prophet Allah raises him by ten degrees. So your rank will literally be raised just by making this a, a regular practice. Um, he's also written for him ten good deeds, erased from his record ten bad deeds. Uh, you receive intercession of the Prophet okay? Um It's a means to have your sins forgiven, to have your worldly needs met. Uh, it's a means to draw near to the Prophet on the day of resurrection. And it, it, it compensates for giving charity for those who are too poor to give it. 
So if you're not in a means to financially give much, just do salawat and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you that same reward, subhanAllah. It's a, mean, it's a means of fulfilling one's needs. It's a means to receive the Prophet's blessings, right? Especially on the day of Jummah. Every time we recite salawat on the day of Jummah specifically, he by his own tongue will respond salawat back onto us individually by name. So just imagining that the Prophet will say your name and say your children's name, right? I mean, that should just blow our mind. But we, if we're not doing it together as a family, then again, we're not creating that you know, that, that love for him. And it's all on us. Our, it's our duty as parents to be doing these things and teaching our children to do them as well. Um, it's a means of salvation from the horrors of the day of resurrection. It's a means uh, for the Prophet ﷺ to return blessings. So we just said that. Um, it's a means to remember something which has been forgotten. So if you've ever tried to remember something and you can't, this is the practice. Just do salawat on the Prophet ﷺ. If, uh, or if you've lost something, there's people who, if you lose something, they'll tell you, just do salawat on Nabi, and you'll find it. I found in my own personal life, and this is like, it's amazing how often this happens for me. If I'm ever in a parking lot and I need a space, especially like, you know, during like the Christmas shopping season, it's like almost impossible uh, to find a parking spot or in a place where it's really difficult. SubhanAllah, and as soon as I begin salawat, every single time without fail, not only do I get a space that opens up, but it's usually amazing. It's like in the first row. So do it. I, it's amazing. You just see Allah just opens doors for you. And I've done this so many times where I know it's completely an opening from, from just doing the salawat. But these are things that, you know, if you put it into practice, you realize that there's immense benefits that you'll feel in your children as well. They'll feel that. They'll experience that in their hearts and, 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 and everything. It's just you're opening so much better to your, um, to your, to your home. Um, there's so many mashallah in this list. It refines the worshiper, worshiper's character and manner. So you'll just benefit by becoming better. <laughs> you know, you're, you'll emanate more nur. You'll actually start emulating, you know, other qualities of his. Because if you're taking on the practice of doing salawat and and your connection with him is stronger, then inshallah, naturally, you know, you're going to start following more and more of his sunnah and taking on more and more of his qualities. So it's like just all the way around an incredible benefit for you. But I would really recommend, and I've written about this too, about, you know, giving children their own tasbih, making it a special, you know, sort of um, thing for them where they actually get to go and select their own. They get to pick the beads. And this becomes something that they can have that's their own, but that you, you know, give them, encourage them through incentives to do their salawat, you know, but inshallah you should you know, make this a regular practice. And then also Friday especially should be a really special day. It's, you know, the Prophet said it's the Eid for the believer, so really making it a fun day. My kids, for example, I don't give them devices regularly. We have a no device rule during the week, but on Fridays, select games that they really like, I will allow them. For, because it's Friday, and I want them to make those positive associations. And I tell them, this is because of Juma. They'll get lollipops on Friday. They'll get you know ice cream, certain treats that they really like. But I always remind them, it's because it's Friday that you're getting these things. This is the blessing of the day of the Prophet so said It's the day he was born, and so we always try to you know excuse me, he was born on Monday, but we always remind him this is the day of you know salawat for the Prophet so said So. To remind him, to remind them that this is why it's such a special day. That's why you're getting these things. It's really good because you're making again positive associations with him and with with uh, with the day of Jamal. And then to understand that these are principles that we should all definitely teach our children and understand them first and foremost ourselves. The concepts of ihsan and itqan. Ihsan, which is to do things with spiritual excellence. Okay. And itqan is to do it meticulously, but also thoroughly. So whatever, you know, we, when we do something, first of all, again, it goes back to us. We have to model this if we're going to be effective at, at teaching our children. But there are concepts that if you start applying it in your home and everybody falls in line, it's just a benefit all the way around. So you know what? Let's just start doing things really well. So if we're going to do something, if we're going to cook a meal, we have really good ingredients and everybody's, you know, all hands on deck. We're all doing it as a family. We just, we're, we're always mindful. We're present in the moment and we're not, you know, t short, you know, taking shortcuts here and there. 
but just making this uh, just a part of how you conduct your, yourself in every which way. If you, um, you know, clean something, if you like a chore, if, if your parents or if you yourself are, are you know, delegated to, to, to do a certain task, that you do it so well that it's impressive. And then that, you know, is something that they'll model. So it's like, oh, if you're cleaning the bathroom, you know, do it really well. Show them this is how I want it to be done. Make sure that everything is clean. It's not just like this, you know, quickly wipe down and, you know, I'm out the door going back to my games sort of experience that a lot of kids, unfortunately, do, right? And then the parents walk in and, of course, we're never really happy, but we're like, oh, we'll just take it. No, you should bring them back and say, well, do you really think this was done with Ihsan? I can still see a big mess here. You didn't even touch this. You didn't do that, right? But remind them that they didn't really do a good job and make their standard better. And then, you know, the same for yourself, have the same standard. But teaching them these concepts early will, inshallah, you know, benefit them in many ways, spiritually, but also in their work, in their school, because you're not, you're teaching them not to just, you know, um, be sort of like live in this sort of a blase sort of mindset, because that's where our culture, every, nobody's doing things sincerely or really with wholeheartedness anymore. It's just like limited effort possible because we're all spread thin, everybody's tired, exhausted, right? But it really does affect your spiritual state if that's just who you are and that's how you live, where it's like you're not really putting your, you know, your full effort into something. So try to teach that early on. And then tafakkur and tadabbur, this is to reflect and to think, right, to contemplate the consequences of things. So for young children, you know, just teaching them to think about things and when they make mistakes, if we're just focusing on the punishment and not really teaching them how to, you know, realize what, like, to dig deep, realize the source of why they did what they did, but also to weigh consequences before they act. So preventative measures, right? When you teach them to, to do this, then they'll weigh the consequences of every act seriously. And they'll think about maybe twice about doing something they shouldn't do. Because you're teaching them that this is something we should do as Muslims. We should reflect on things and we should reflect on the consequences of things. So obviously as they get older, when certain topics come up, this is easier to do because you can kind of, as a family, have a discussion about certain things. Um, but it's just important to, this ter these terms, for them to know what they are and then to, for you to put them into practice. Uh, muraqaba, which is to meditate. Okay, to watch over one's uh, spiritual heart. This is also another very important thing that they should be lear learning even at a young age to really just, you know, think about their connection, you know, with Allah, to think about these things, to think about the, to know the diseases of the heart, for example, right? Um, how many people here have the book, The Purification of the Heart by Sheikh Hamza? This is a wonderful book that every family should have. And you should actually go through and look at the diseases of the heart and talk about them. And say, you know, like how, you know, anger. Anger is a big thing that a lot of kids struggle with. But really looking at that as a disease and talking about that, how that affects, you know, your spiritual heart and what, you know, what the remedies are from the sunnah of the Prophet, how should we deal with anger? But like, you know, giving, getting, giving them topics like this to really reflect on and identifying that as this is a process in our faith. We do this. You know, we should do this. We should do muraqab. We should think about these things. And then muhasaba, which is self-inventory. Very important to teach your young kids to look at their day every single day and um, and figure out, you know, where they, um, what their high points were, what their low points were, where they, you know, need to improve. But making this like a daily sort of practice. And you can either do that as a, you know, as a family where you kind of talk about things maybe over dinner, like have like a, you know, a sort of line of questioning, like who wants to share, you know, maybe their high point of the day. And is there anything that, that you're not proud of that you did today? But these could be very important family discussions, right? But it allows them to, again, learn this skill set that I need to take myself into account every day and to really think about my, the, you know, what I've done and, uh, and make this a spiritual practice that they continue well into their teen years and, and adult years, inshallah. Um, and then teaching them also, uh, because, you know, kids need to know the balance of how to be, to be generous, okay, with their time, with just who they are, without, you know, um, you know, without affecting their, their spiritual heart. 
So giving, being generous is very important in our tradition. We should know that. Um, and, and, you know, you can teach them all of the hadith and the ayahs that are related to generosity. But to be also mindful and wise about how much they give of themselves, of their time, of their money. You know, sometimes kids get taken advantage of, um, you know, because their 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 hearts are so pure. So just teaching them to give with prudence, to not give everything uh, right away, you know, that, that's important. And also another very important concept that they need to learn early on is to mind their own business. Okay, this is a principle in our faith, you know, that we, you don't, nosiness and getting involved in things that are not for you to get involved in is not part of our tradition and unfortunately a lot of kids get pulled into very dangerous things because you know they're they're either nosy or someone's pushing them into doing something you know uh, friends especially you know they're getting involved into maybe another person's drama right a lot of kids are peer pressured into getting involved in, in things that are not there like that have nothing to do with them because maybe, you know, again, it's, it's something that's happening in their peer group with their friends. But just teach them that as a principle, we don't get involved in things that have nothing to do with us. And you shouldn't either. Okay? If you see something that's happening in school, it's a fight. People are fighting. It's not for you to go and see what's going on and, like, dig. Or if, you know, some, something's happened with a friend, for you to start calling up and what's going on, what's going on with her. Just mind your own business and live like that. You know, it protects you and it's just part of, again, our tradition. And this is, again, based on the hadith, um, which is indeed among the excellence of a person's Islam, is that he leaves that which does not concern him. So it's really a matter of, you know, um, for us too, as adults, I mean, if we're nosy and we're, you know, on social media, I mean, that's another big part of it, right? Like, within our friends and peer groups, one thing, but also if you're just looking into everybody's business and constantly wanting to know things and that's how you're living, then your kids are going to follow. You know, if you're talking about other people and what they're doing, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about so-and-so? It's like you're modeling the worst qualities for them. So just mind your own business and teach them that you shouldn't be, you know, worried about what other people are doing. Focus on yourself. Um, and if they have, like I said, social media accounts, really monitor what they're doing, why they're watching certain things, why they're following certain people, what's their main objective, but controlling that because it's a very serious issue. Okay, so now um, in the time that we have, inshallah, let me see here. So I wanted to talk about here, um, it's hard for you guys to see this, so I'm just going to go to the next slide. The power of five, okay, so there's a couple of things that, um, are relevant to what we're talking about here. Experts say that maintaining this magic ratio of five to one, uh, it's of positive to negative comments is really healthy model for all relationships. So going back to your parenting style, if your negative, you know, comments and whether it's with your spouse or with your children, if you're more negative, then you have to take yourself into account. Is, is it? You know, how off are you from this ratio? If it's more negative than positive, you're on a very destructive path. For your marriage, it's not going to go well. And this is based on um, uh, Dr. John Gottman. He's a leading psychologist, psychological researcher and relationship expert. He basically studied 700 married couples. And, um, you know, they, he, he watched, they were given prompts and then they were allowed to discuss uh, things for about 15 minutes and then they went back and they watched the tape of their interactions and he was able to with 94 percent accuracy determine which couples were going to last and which ones were going to divorce just based on watching them for those 15 minutes because they picked up on how many negative exchanges they had versus how many positive so you in your marriage with your marriage and with your children you have to see where am i in this ratio do i you know, am I very hypercritical parent or hypercritical spouse where all I'm doing is nitpicking and nagging and finding things to criticize? Or am I fair and balanced? Do I praise just as much as I criticize? But try to, this is the, the magic ratio, they say. If you can stay within this where you have five positive, and then maybe you can be, you know, because we're, we're, you also don't want to, you know, completely... Um, gloss over clear issues. You have to call things out if you see them and their problems. Being critical is important, but also you know being 
tactful, not being harsh, but still being uh, constructive criticism is important. But keeping this ratio, five to one, it's, uh, it's just something to remember. And then the five love languages is also very important. How many of you have heard of this, the five love languages? Okay. So this is another really important, you can do a, a, a search, and, or there's books, you know, John, Dr. John Gray, um, he, I think that's the author, he, he wrote uh, this book that talks about basically every single person has different ways that they um, communicate love and that they receive love. So not only do we communicate it or we give love differently, but we also receive love differently. And you have to know your own love language and uh, your partner's love language, but also your children's love language because children are different. So when we talk about tailored parenting, this is part of it, to really recognize that not all children receive love the same way. So the first uh, love language is called words of affirmation. So if you're the type of person that really responds to words, like praises, compliments, if someone writes you a card or a letter or sends you a nice text message or email, or it's just sending you a really love, loving message, and that really means a lot to you, that's one of your love languages. It means that you need a lot of feedback. You need positive feedback. So if you, for the sisters, like for example, if you cook a meal, okay, and I'm, this is my, one of my love languages, and I've set it out and my husband doesn't say anything, <laughs> it instantly bothers me, right? Because I expect, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for him to go, oh, this is so delicious, right? So he knows that, and he knows that I'm, ex I'm waiting for it. You better say something. So, alhamdulillah, we're very clear on our communication, but this is for me. I told him, I said, words matter to me. So I, I'm expecting certain things, um, you know, communicated. You can't just eat and then expect me to know that you liked it, right? Tell me that you liked it. Tell me what you liked about it. And I'll know if he didn't like it because he either says very little or nothing at all. So, uh, but this is one of uh, my love languages. Another um, love language is acts of service. So if you really appreciate when your partner helps you with certain things, whether it's chores around the house or just you know, different responsibilities and things where they're willing to always take care of certain things for you, and that matters a lot to you, then you can empower your partner and your children. Like, listen, I might not need compliments, and don't, like, flower me with all that stuff. I need you to take care of stuff. So if I give you a responsibility to do it, because that, I you know, removes stress from my life, then now they know that this is the way that I can actually show, um, you know, show you love. Gifts, if gifts really matter, and you're the type that, mashallah, when you give a gift, you go all out and you're very thoughtful, you shop at specific stores, you package things beautifully, and there are people who are like that, they really are amazing at gift giving, then this is likely your love language too, and you really appreciate when someone goes all out and gives you like an amazing personalized gift, or just something that tells you that they were thinking of you. It might not even have to be anything expensive or anything like that, but just the fact that they went through that trouble, right, to go and get you something and thought of you in, when, in your absence, that means a lot to you, then that's your love language. Quality time, if none of those things really matter, you're not looking for compliments, you can do things on your own, gifts really, you don't have that much value for material things, but you really want to spend a lot of time together, um, and you want like physical, you know, proximity, like you don't even have to be sitting next to me, but just be in the house. You know, I need to see you. I need to feel your presence in my life. Don't be always leaving. Then that's probably your love language. And then physical touch. So if you're affectionate and you really respond to that, that's your love language. But all of these are so important to identify in ourselves first, identify in our partners, and then in our children. So there's actual, you know, you can... Take, there's quizzes that can kind of help you determine what your love language is. I would definitely encourage you to do this with your children. And you'll see what it does, again, is it helps you to customize your, your you know, parenting with your children better. Because you'll know, like, some kids, they might want gifts more, whereas others want, you know, quality time. But it may, makes a big difference in your parenting style. So these are just, you know, the power five, two little things that I thought were good takeaways for you to think about. When, uh, when, when considering your, again, parenting style. Okay, so any questions before we get to this? Because this is the, the topic that I've been waiting to get to, the temperaments. Any questions before we get here? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
so it's kind of Right. Right. MashaAllah. You know, doing the bare minimum, which is what that hadith was, right, isn't the same as saying that I'm not, um, because we're, we're not talking about necessarily quantity. We're talking about quality. So if you're going to do the bare minimum, then you better be doing it really well. So if you're just going to do your fard prayers, let's say, and you're not going to do sunnah, then you better be doing them with absolute khushu if you're going to use that hadith, right? Because you can't just use that hadith to say, well, I'm just doing the minimum, because that's not the standard of the Prophet's lesson. The Prophet is making it easy for people to say that you don't have to do beyond that quantitatively, but the quality, you, there's no argument there, right? You have to have khushu, you have to make sure you're present and mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all those things, so that's where you, I would focus on, you know, because sometimes children, they can be very smart, right? And they think they've outsmarted you and they come with all these quick comebacks. But you have to also think like the mind of a child and say, I see what you're doing here. You're looking for a nice little shortcut out. But I'm going to remind you that the Prophet Sallallahu didn't give that, you know, that, that hadith isn't related to us so that we can just use it to, you know, basically take the easiest route. It's actually made to simplify for people who have maybe challenges and difficulties. But the quality of standard is not compromised, right? And so remind them that you have to do whatever you do. If you're going to pray a certain amount or fast a certain amount, whatever it is, just make sure it is 100%. And that's a hisa, right? The quality is still there. That's a good question. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, so the four temperaments is um, a topic that, uh, you know, it's highly encouraged to study when it comes to, again, in individually for us to know ourselves really well, our spouses, but also our, our children. And so what is it? Um, so it or originated um, in ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia many, many, many thousands of years ago. And it's very, uh, it's, it's linked to the, or the science of the four elements. Okay, And this is around 400 BC. So the four elements are earth, air, water, and fire. Um, and this was um, the, you know, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. He basically came up with this theory based on, you know, his um, just looking at, at different human behavior and emotions. And he said that based on either an excess of or a lack of certain bodily fluids, people behave differently. Okay. And so he looked at blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And these are the four fluids that he was looking at different, again, people and saying if there was an excess or, or you know, there was a shortage of these humors, he called them, then people would behave differently. Now, centuries later, Galen, who's another Greek uh, physician, he came up with a typology of temperament based on the same science. And he said, he went to the next level and said, he classified um, human behavior as either hot, cold, dry, or wet. Again, this is related to the four elements. But then he gave them names. And he said, people based on, again, their different levels of these fluids in their body, they behave differently. And their typographies are sanguine, choleric, melancholic, and phlegmatic. So basically, based on where you are, where your fluids are, you're going to behave a certain way, and it's going to fall in line into one of these four temperaments, they called them. Now, Ibn Sina, who we know uh, as Evi, or Evi Chen or Ibn Sina, he's a, you know, uh, he, he's the greatest or one of the greatest you know, physicians uh, in Islamic uh, history. He extended the theory of temperaments to encompass emotional aspects, mental capacity, moral attitudes, self-awareness, movements, and dreams. So they're all kind of expanding on this science, right? And then later on, um, other phys Muslim physicians... Uh, and, um, in, in addition to Ibn Sina, are Abu Bakr Muhammad Zakari al Razi, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, and then Jalal al Din al Suyuti, they all also commented on this science and used this science of the four temperaments. Okay, so this is a very a big part of our history. So, what are they? Here are the four uh, temperaments again the choleric, the sanguine, phlegmatic, and melancholic. So every person, according to the science, falls into predominantly one of these temperaments. So all of us here, as we read the descriptions, you're going to find, okay, that actually sounds like me. 
Um, and you'll once you get more well versed in this science, then you can study it for your children too. It's very important to know your children's temperaments. So the first one is called the choleric. Okay. So what? Who are the choleric? So you know the names are are kind of difficult sometimes for people to remember. So just remember the animal that's associated with it. Okay. The choleric's animal is a lion. Okay. And they are extroverts. Okay. So if you're an extroverted person, you might be a choleric. Um, they're reactionary, so very quick to react to things, fiery sort of energy. They're rational and not very emotionally expressive. So if you're not someone that's, you know, easily or you just don't, you know, express yourself very well emotionally, you might be a, a choleric. Natural born leaders, so very strong willed people. That's where that red fire energy, so just, you see that, again, the lion have all that uh, imagery there. They're assertive and in charge. They tend to dominate whatever they do. So if you're ever working in a group setting, you will know the choleric very clearly. They're probably the ones talking over everybody. They like things done their way. They're argumentative. They're kind of just really just strong-willed and strong-headed people. And their motto is, we like to have it our way. So that's one of the you know controlling sort of personality types. So if you identify with this, you are likely a choleric. And this is, again, for brothers and sisters. Um, the next is a sanguine. Okay, this is represented, represented by the animal, the golden retriever. Okay, so um, extroverts as well. So friendly, super, um, just, they're reactionary, but they're very, they're emotionally expressive. Uh, they love people in large groups, so they kind of tend to be like the life of the party. They just, they're bubbly. Okay, that's where that yellow color, just it's just happy. They, they seem to be a little too happy, <laughs> maybe too chipper all the time. Uh, they're talkative and excitable. Okay. Uh, they're optimistic. Uh, they're, they love to laugh and are usually, again, the life of the party. And their motto is we like to be popular, so they're very well-known Okay, they're always maybe just social, just very social pe people. Okay, so if you're a sanguine, then just keep this in mind. Again, that golden retriever, happy sort of personality type. Okay. Then we have the phlegmatic. Okay, so now we're into the introverted signs. So they're introverted and they're represented by the otter. Okay, they're non-reactionary. They're emotionally expressive. They love to analyze people, so they tend to just be a little bit more quiet, analytical. Okay, they're humble and calm. They have very calming nature, so they're not excitable. They don't when they talk, they're not like loud and boisterous. They're just calm. They have, you know, they're versatile. That means they're flexible. They're kind of go with the flow. They're great listeners. So if you have uh, a phlegmatic in your life, they're the ones you can turn to, and they're just very, very. Just have that calming, healing presence. Um, and their motto is, we like it peaceful and calm. Okay. And then the last one is the melancholic. Okay, they're introverts as well. Um, they're non-reactionary. They're not emotionally expressive. So the melancholic is similar to the choleric in that way. Okay, they're, but they're, the difference is that one's reactionary, the other's not, right? Uh, they're serious and very analytical. So if you're a numbers kind of a person and you're just like, you know, you like to just stay focused and on task and you, you know, you're not, you're not like a dreamer always thinking about things, but you're just very focused on what's happening in front of you. You like things systematically done. You're like organization. You're likely a melancholic. Task oriented and natural problem solvers. They're very disciplined and organized. And their motto is we like it done the right way. Okay, so these four temperaments, again, are all of us fall predominantly into one. There are blends, but you should by now know where you are. How many people feel like they identify with at least one? Yeah, okay, good. So once you know yourself really well, as I said, and there's a book, it's called The Temperament That God Gave You. Um, it's a non-Muslim author. I can't remember the author, but you can find it even in libraries if you don't want to buy it. Um, you can just check it out. But it's uh, a book that our teachers recommend reading because it does give you more context into the science. 
but also helps, uh, as I said, with children, with, with parenting, because you'll start to see your children's temperaments. You'll start to see if you have an extroverted child and an introverted child, you'll see that they are, they're different for a reason. And the two primary things that really help to measure, uh, this is, you know, pretty detailed, but like just a quick way to assess what uh, your what a person's temperament is, is how reactionary are they? Are they reactionary? And how long does that reaction last? Okay, so let's say you're, you know, if you have a conflict with someone or in a confrontational situation, the choleric, right, this person, they're going to fire right back. Okay, so it's like a hostile sort of exchange. They're not ones to back down from confrontation ever, and they will not forget. So if a choleric personality type is not afraid or intimidated by confrontation and They'll likely cut you out. Like you're just done. I have no time for you, and because they don't, they don't. It's not. They're not very forgiving, so they'll hold that grudge for like years. Okay. The sanguine, they might react in the moment because you're catching them off guard, so they might, you know, have a response right away. But then guilt will, you know, overtake them. So maybe ten minutes later, they feel bad, and they'll come to you and go, "I'm so sorry." Uh, can we forget about what happened, please? And a lot of times in marital situations, this is very common, right? One partner or the other will do something like hit below the belt, say something really mean, but then they'll just feel so bad for it a few minutes later, and it kind of can throw people off. Like what, you know? So it, it you know, it's it's very common to have the, these this dynamic. But the sanguine will want to fix it right away, even though they're reactionary. Now the phlegmatic, they're the type that if they're in a confrontation, they almost freeze. They don't know how to deal with it in the moment because it's completely like they just shut down. So they won't say something right then and there. They'll just stand there listening, observing. And then three, four days later, you'll get that text message or phone call okay, that says, you know, what you did was very offensive. I'm very hurt by what you said. And so they're non-reactionary, okay, but they're forgiving. So they want to fix it because they're still emotionally, you know, invested and they care. So it's like they don't re react right away, but then they want to patch it up quickly. So they'll say, I still love you. I still, I forgive you. So they're quick to get over it and they won't hold a grudge. The melancholic is the toughest <laughs> one to crack because this person is not reactionary at all. So they will, if it's a confrontation, they'll just, again, remain quiet. And you won't hear anything from them from from them for maybe years. Okay, so like you won't even know half the time with a melancholic why they're upset at someone. They won't say anything until maybe years down the line, and then they go, "Well, ten years ago, you know, you said this to me, or you did this, you disrespected me, you know." And you're like, "What? You've been holding on to that for that long?" But they are very capable of holding on to things for a very long time. So they hold on to grudges, they're not very easily forgiving, and they're non-reactionary. So think about your children. Do you see, because you should see patterns already. You should see that child who is very unforgiving, if you have one of those, if something happens and they're just like brooding forever. I don't forgive you, I'm so mad at you, you know? And then you might have the other child who as soon as something happens, they're just like, it's okay, it's not a big deal. And they're like quick to forgive and move on. This, this is the, their temperament. It's revealing itself. But when you study it really in depth, it helps you to, again, know how to reach them better, right? You're not just doing a one-size-fits-all parenting. You're actually tailoring it to their personalities. Like this is, you know, unique to you. You're unique in this way. Therefore, I have to, you know, parent differently for you. And honestly, this science is, um, you know, it's been used for, for decades by educators, by psychologists. Unfortunately, now, you know, it's not as, as common anymore. Uh, but you see it, and even in the professional world, you know, there's companies that, that do personality typing and testing, right? What for? It's because they know that if you actually, you know, figure people out and kind of see patterns of behavior, you're able to place them better in the company or give them, assign work and tasks to them that's more suitable for their temperament. For example, like, you know, a melancholic person is great for, you know, like account accounting work or office work, right? Because they're not very personable. So they're not somebody that you would put at the front end of the office to meet and greet people.
people or, you know, in a business. Because their personality types, they don't have that disposition. They're serious, analytical, critical thinking people. Great for doing things like in the back office, right? And then a sanguine, right, though? A sanguine would just wilt like a flower if you put them in an office or put them in, in a job where they're not interacting with people. They need to be in the front end. They need to be out talking to people because Allah, you know, gave them that personality where they can just really engage well with people. So if you know your children, then you can see their strengths, right? And then help them to develop their strengths and also prevent them from doing things. Like I had, I remember I did a talk once and then afterwards one of the moms came up to me. She was totally devastated. I, I did a similar presentation where I talked about the temperaments, but she was just crying and I was, you know, I was trying to calm her down and she just felt horrible. She said that she realized that her two uh, sons were very different. One was an extrovert and one was an introvert, but their whole life, basically, she measured her introverted son to her extroverted son and he was never good enough. And she always felt like he was lagging, lacking or just lagging behind because her extroverted was outgoing, he was just very successful, he was athletic, he did all these things that were just, you know, just really shined, you know, and, and her ex, her introverted son was not that person, he was very timid, very quiet, if he went to a, a social gathering, he wanted to carry a book with him everywhere he went, and he would just find a corner, but she always felt like she was, and she did, in the, after the talk, she realized that had she known this before, she would have just seen their individuality but unfortunately she she you know really damaged in her own words her relationship with her second son because she made him feel always inferior so you know it was a, a moment for her but i you know this is why it's so important to study these things early because you won't do that inshallah you'll actually start to see your children for who they are and you'll start to tailor again your parenting to them but if you don't have this in your tool belt and you're just going to treat them all the same then you're you're not going to make those connections which we talked about in the beginning that reach you're not going to have very much reach with your children so this is what why it's so important to, to really you know learn your children's personality types be attentive to their differences and honor them and validate them because just like you're unique I'm unique we're all unique so are your children and even though we have ideals about how we want them to be if we see them exclusively as extensions of ourselves it's a total injustice because they're not, they're not extensions of us. We, you know, there are children, but they're individuals and they might have sparks of us here and there, but you have to let them grow into their own person, still guide them, still, you know, show them the right way, but don't judge them so critically and harshly that just because they do things differently than you do, or that you think is, you know, is good or ideal that you start looking down on them and then treating them harshly and using words like, oh, you're, you're a loser. And, you know, parents, they can really damage their children. They're not aware of the harsh words that they say when they're critical. But it can be very, you know, life, these are lifelong, you know, issues that, that, are, um, that happen when you, when you talk to your children that way. They'll deal with that for their whole life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, because as we talked about the emotional expression, right, that's going to be a big, you know, uh, sort of indicator of what a person's love language is, because emotionally expressive people do like, like the sanguine is absolutely going to love words of praise and affirmation, right, because that's their, their expressive, right, and phlegmatics as well, phlegmatics love to connect, they love, they're, they're very emotional people, they're just not as reactionary as the sanguine, but they're similar, so these two signs are similar, just as the melancholic and choleric are similar. They're not as uh, emotionally expressive, but they might respond a lot to acts of service, for example, right? Or quality time. Because even though I don't need you to, you know, shower me with words, I still appreciate you around me, right? So, yes, there's definitely a correlation there. And again, when you're learning these things together, you're going to start seeing patterns for yourself, your spouse, your children, Everybody in your life, you're going to start to suddenly see them through their lens instead of seeing them through your own subjective lens, which is usually not accurate, right? We don't always read people accurately. 
Uh, but we're, you know, unfortunately, because we only have our own selves to rely on, we think we've got it down. There's a lot of overconfident people who think they know people really well, but if they really don't know them. They're just applying, projecting their own views onto them. But when you do things this way, you really are knowing people. Because it's like, I've studied you. I've, we've looked at this. We've looked at your love language. We've looked at your temperament. We now have, you know, something to help identify the nuances of your personality. And therefore... You know, we're becoming more fluent in reading each other. And if the whole family's doing it, the siblings know each other. It's like my children, they know their temperaments. We've talked about love languages, and it comes up. You know, they, they use it even for themselves. Like, oh, you know, if they're, you know, if they're uh, having, you know, uh, like an outburst, they'll be like, oh, so Mr. Choleric, you know, is coming out now, you know. But it's a good thing for them to use because they, it, it prevents them from labeling and harming each other with language, you know, which is children can do that. Siblings do that with each other all the time. They start fighting. There's no understanding, right? It's just like, oh, they just, they're angry because they don't understand their sibling's behavior or words or whatever. So then they just start taking everything personally. But if you actually frame it this way and empower them to know that you're different than them, they operate differently than you, be respectful of how you engage with them. And, you know, take these things into consideration, then everybody's validated, right? It just creates um, more empathy, which is what we want. We want to be more em empathetic. We, we should want our children to be more empathetic. These, these are all prophetic qualities. The Prophet ﷺ was very, like he, when he would, was with people, he really took time and, and made them feel like they were completely seen and visible and heard. He really paid attention to, to people. We're, again, because of our distracted worlds and natures, we, we're all just sort of, you know, robotically moving through our worlds and our families and our home life is like that, but this requires you to actually be more present. So that's why it's very important that we study these sciences. Yes? So it seems like based on uh, this, uh, every government has their Yes. Absolutely. 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 And the objective here, yes, is to identify where you are, but to not just look at yourself like, a, you know, this is who I am and that's it. You're a work in progress. And they say that actually uh, in the, when you're saying the four temperaments, I, I'm not sure who came up with this, but that all of the four khulafa are represented by one of each four. So you can see, and then they said that the Prophet he had perfect balance, right? So he's a perfect balance of everything. And our objective is to look at his model, and you'll see that everything, all the negative qualities that go into each one are resolved when you get to the process of it, because you don't see that there, right? He's, he's just he, he's the perfect representation of how we should be. But when you, um, yes, you, if you look at yourself again as a work in progress, and you'll realize that my task, my spiritual task is to, you know, to, uh, to tend to all these things, whatever my negative qualities are or the things that I need to align with his way, I have to work on that. So if I have a problem being more, you know, if I'm not as affectionate, if I'm a melancholic or a choleric and I have an issue being affectionate with my children or my loved ones, this is not from, you know, this is not the prophetic way, right? There's hadith where he talks about that, about, you know, being more affectionate with your loved ones. So how am I going to work on that? I have to dig deep, be more vulnerable, kind of find the words if it's hard for me, work on that, right? But looking at yourself constantly as a work in progress and trying to br uh, bring more balance. Okay. Yes? Right. Absolutely. Yes, you're br bringing balance because the sanguine, what do you think, let's just talk about, for example, spiritual diseases. What do you think might be a spiritual disease that a sanguine personality would, would fall into from the, from the diseases of the heart? Showing off, exactly. If, I, if, I, if, if you're a sanguine and Allah is giving you this ability to just be like, super friendly and talkative and you can go, and you're outgoing and you can go out there and do anything this is potentially going to be something that you have to work on right or a risk for you that you're probably going to you know because popularity is now is what motivates you that you're starting to do things just to be seen just to be recognized to be praised 
So this is a disease of the heart potentially for you. So this is where, yes, you have to bring balance. If you're always in the front, if you're always in the center of attention, maybe you're leaning too much on that. And even now with social media, you know, this is unfortunately a big thing that social media promotes, to be seen, to be seen, to be seen. So even people who aren't necessarily sanguine are, you know, are afflicted with these with this disease. And so it's definitely something to consider. But each one of them, like choleric, they're, they're one of their primary diseases uh, that they have to work on is anger because they're very reactionary and fiery. And so if you're a choleric personality, you have to be true with yourself and say, yeah, I have to rein that in. I'm too intense and I can intimidate people. I'm, maybe I am scary. Maybe I need to be real with myself and just say, you know what? It's not uh, that I'm a terrible person. Because the, the reason why I love the science is it does really validate the fact that there is design in human personality and temperament. And we're all just designed differently and uniquely, but it's not that it's a blemish, you know? Because sometimes we, we, we break other people down or we break ourselves down and just attribute all these negative qualities and take it on like we're horrible human beings. And especially when you're comparing it to the Bible's life stuff, then you just feel like the worst, right? But if you actually sit there and say, SubhanAllah, it's just design. And that's why I love that, you know, um, the, the four khulafa are represented in each of these because you can see that. Like Omar, we know, he's, he was very jalal, right? And he was very intimidating. But he was also incredibly soft. And he, through his journey, literally, he, he transformed. So there's hope to say that no matter where you are, there's hope for positive transformation. If you, like the brother was saying, see yourself as you know, a work in progress, like wherever your negative qualities are. But when you empower your children with the science, again, it validates them. You're not attributing them all these horrible qualities and just labeling them and like making them feel like they're, they're nothing. You're saying, this is just your personality type and these are the areas that, you know, you need to work on and these are your strengths. So mashallah, you know, Allah has given you this great ability and it's just, it's a very, it's a much more positive way to help under, bring more understanding. Inshallah. Yes. Right away. I mean, you can see him very early on. Oh, yeah. That's why that book, The Temperament That God Gave You, it's really uh, like for parents and you know, educators to look at for children. So you'll see, like, yeah, you can see the signs very early on. And people, like I said, will they can change. Yeah. So it's not like it's, you know, set. Because as you grow and, you know, environmentally things happen, you're, you're, you might shift or you might start taking on sort of a blend between two different and so there is a primary and a secondary so when you take the tests and they're online and even in the book you can uh, it'll determine for you what your primary is and what your secondary is and you'll see like a crossover so yeah it's a very very helpful tool I'm sorry oh yeah sorry yes so this is phlegmatic You know, Allah, I don't know, maybe because the four temperaments is initially based on, right, the fluids. So, if you know, if we're really true to the science, then there is a physiological sort of aspect there, right? And that's what the science is, is that all of these different fluids, you know, it, it's, it explains the variation of human behavior. So, yeah, I'm sorry, the other ones too? Yes, England? The, I know the text is very small. Um, but I can, if you uh, if you like to give me your email, I can always send you like the, the more clear descriptions. Okay, inshallah. But any other questions about this? Yes. Sure. Right. Every single personality test out there is based on the four elements, and that's why they're all very like multiples of four. You'll have sixteen personalities. So they're all based on this ancient science. And that's why, you know, when you, you look at it, it's, it's so fascinating. I mean, this has been around for millennia, subhanAllah. Right? Alhamdulillah. All right, Jazakallah khair. If there's no other questions, inshallah, I think we're right on time. So we can end, inshallah, in dua. Jazakallah So we'll finish in dua. Inshallah, the next one will be in a month. Uh, yeah, we'll announce the date. I don't, I, I think the date is set on the website, but I'm not sure. Do you know the date? Okay. Inshallah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. All right. So we'll end.
سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك ونتوب اليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر جزاكم الله خيرا thank you so much for coming inshallah we'll see you next time and if you have any questions i um, don't have it written but i can uh, provide my my email address to anybody and offline we can exchange more information. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrib al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. I know, mashallah, with the current weather situation, a lot of people aren't really coming out, and I totally understand. I have friends who have asthma, or their kids have other respiratory issues, so it's very difficult to be out. But um, thank you for being here. Um, alhamdulillah, may Allah Subhanahu provide uh, relief to all who are suffering. I, I missed, unfortunately, the prayer, but inshallah, may Allah accept that prayer, and hopefully, we'll see some rain in the next few days, and shot lots of relief. Um, for those who have not attended this before, this is the third workshop that we've done. Just to, so I get an idea, how many of you have actually maybe watched uh, the, the other two that, that was posted or were here? Okay, alhamdulillah, great. So, um, you know, before we jump into this, because this is um, the third session, I wanted to do a review of the uh, previous session, just to kind of bring everybody up to speed. So I'm going to go over some of those uh, slides quickly, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and into, into the discussion, inshallah, for today. So last time we were here, Bismillah, we talked about, um, well, here's the outline. Uh, closer? Okay, sure. All right, I'll, I'll actually sit a little. So here's the outline, but uh, we'll just go ahead and get into it. So we first talked about spiritual principles and practices that, for every Muslim home, that we should all be doing our best to implement in our homes. Um, and so we said right away from you know the, the very first one here is to love Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala wholeheartedly and practice daily gratitude to Him. So we differentiated between half-hearted love and wholehearted love. What does that mean? You know, if you are, for example, um, you know, uh, there's many, mashallah, in our, in our community, many people who have obvious reverence for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? They will um, put it, you know, on the highest bookshelves. They might even wrap it in, in really beautiful cloth. Um, and that's, that's a great sign of reverence and, and adab uh, for, for, to Allah and for his book. However, if you're not reading from the book or acting from the book, then there is some you know, disconnect there, right? You might be showing the love in one case, but then you're not following through. So this would be a good example of half-hearted okay, love of Allah. And a lot of times in our homes, we might not be aware of, of how we, uh, we don't, we're not fully sincere sometimes in the way that we show love. Um, but we would never deny our love, right? If someone asked us, of course, alhamdulillah, we love Allah, we, we believe in Allah, we believe in His messengers, we believe in His book, in His book. but when it comes to action and follow-through, that is where the evidence of true love is, right? So wholehearted love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really taking seriously the what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's expectations are of us and really being obedient, right? Listening with full attention and, and, and presence. And so... That, obviously, you know, when it comes to action, the very first thing that we're going to be asked about are our prayers. So making sure that in our homes we establish uh, very clear rules about praying all five prayers on time and doing our best, inshallah, to do those prayers together as a family. Um, and I obviously, with you know, with, as time permits, because when you're going... To, uh, during the day hours, if you're working or your kids are in school, that's not possible. However, the other prayers that are able, you are able to do together as a family, the evening prayers, 
the early morning prayer before you go to school, and then obviously on the weekends. Those are all opportunities that you should try to create again. This uh, sort of just, it's what you do in your home. You pray together as a family and making and being very seriously committed to that practice. Um, and so that's, you know, like, again, we're, we're talking about how to, how to establish love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet said of in our homes. This is one great way to do that. Also love and a recitation of the Quran. So if you, um, you know, we talked about this as well. It's very important to take our uh, relationship with the Quran seriously. So a lot of parents are good about that for their children. You know, they may put them in Sunday school or have a private tutor or use an online program to get their kids to have a connection with Allah, but they might neglect that for themselves. They may not have ever taken a class, for example, on Tajweed or, um, you know, ever studied, you know, anything, you know, even Tafsir or anything that really sort of uh, you know, broadens their relationship with the Book of Allah. They may have never committed to those studies. And so that is obviously going to impact, this is again another example of, of the wholehearted versus the half-hearted. If you yourself are not doing these things, and you've, if you recognize that you need to improve your relationship with the Qur'an, do it. Start with yourself. Look for teachers. And in this day and age, there's really no excuse. We have, mashallah, especially here in this community in the Bay Area, we are very, very blessed with uh, ample uh, opportunities, ample uh, supply of teachers who are qualified to teach male and female, uh, some privately, some in different massages or uh, institutions nearby, but also online. I mean, there's now so many different resources. So we have to, though, take it seriously and realize it is a farbain to know how to read the Book of Allah. So when you recognize that, then not, you don't just look at it for your children and then pressure them all the time, because parents will be very good at policing how much Qur'an their kids have memorized, if they know how to read Arabic. They're very good at that, but again, it starts with you. How are you? What's your relationship like with the Qur'an? So making sure that love of, of the Qur'an is there, and also, more specifically, I wrote here, love of recitation of the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is beautiful. And uh, it's beautiful in meaning, it's beautiful in, in everything, in sound. That's why we have this beautiful art of, of tajweed, of learning how to recite. So it's not just this book that we read from, but we actually engage in a very spiritual way when we recite. And so if you create that in your home, then you can, inshallah, practice either reciting together, but especially for young children, I mean, this is very important that we, uh, we, we say their du'as over them, you know, so instead of just reading a bedtime story at night, for example, that you spend a good 10, 15 minutes reading all of the protective surahs and du'as over them before they sleep, and actually doing it in a beautiful voice. And then when you connect it back to the five daily prayers, that's also a really beautiful way to make the prayer beautiful. Instead of it a rushed process, or a very dry process where it's just like, you know, everybody just kind of stands there, you know, does their mechanical actions. When you have a beautiful recitation, if you, inshallah, are working on it, or your children, everybody's working on it, then it makes the prayer really enjoyable. And so when you're done, everybody feels, you know, just like, wow, that was just a really nice experience. Instead of, again, it just being, you know, mechanical and outward. We, we can br bring all that beauty out through connecting it with the uh, recitation of the Qur'an. So these kind of can work together, these two things. And then obviously the daily dhikr that we do is very important. If, if we're not doing reminders on a daily basis, especially protective du'as, then we're just kind of setting ourselves up for problems. Because the dunya is a very difficult place. You know, we've talked about this. It's a place of trial, of tribulation, of sickness, of worry, of stress, of debt, of just anxiety. There's so many things that are just part and parcel of this dunya, of being here alive in this world. Therefore, we have to take whatever means we can to protect ourselves, protect our spiritual hearts from being affected by these things, right? It's like medicine for the soul. And those are daily awrad, because they actually have protective du'as, right? When you actually have a wird, or it's a, which is 
which is a litany of prayers, all from the Sunnah of the Prophet that you are committed to on a daily basis. You are seeking protection from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala from all the dangers and the, the, the just the things that you might not even think about. But this should be a practice for your family. It's not just something. I think we've we've gotten to a place where, where spirituality is something very very deep and personal, which it should be. But then, as parents, we have to also create you know these things for our children, so that habits, so that they can carry them on. So we have to actually do things with the family as well. You can't just isolate yourself. Uh, and and you know do things only when you're by yourself. You know if you're waking up inshallah for the hajjid or when you add isha, that's when you kind of just settle in and you read Quran. And it's just this deep personal thing. Good for you. We should all do that inshallah in our time. But if you're not doing it with your family, and you want your children which we all do, we want our children to be uh, inshallah believers, we want them to go out into the world, be pr productive and successful people. We can't expect them to succeed if we're not doing the work while they're young to plant those seeds for them, right? That's what this is about. So you actually have to be willing to do things as a family and to re recognize the importance of, of making spiritual practice a family thing. It's not just an individual thing. You know, and individually, mashallah, if you want to do things outside just for yourself, nobody's saying not to do that. But you shouldn't do it like it shouldn't be one or the other. Um, they, sh you know, try to do both. You know, really make it. Uh, and this is where it's so important that both husband and wife are on the same page about this. You know, and I, and I, I've definitely dealt with couples where they, they're, uh, you know, the, the spouses are sort of spiritually on two different paths. And uh, mashallah, you know, we have to come together for the common good of the children. So even if maybe you are not fully, uh, you know, uh, practicing maybe where you should be, it's okay to still try to create uh, that culture for your family and not hold yourself like, oh, you know, well, I'm not doing it. Why should I say it to them? No, remind them. It's better that you, it comes from you because maybe by you reminding them repeatedly, let's say, for example, if you're missing some of your prayers, but yet, you're, you're, you still realize the, the amana of, 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 of your, you know, your duty as a parent and you want to remind your children to pray, you shouldn't stop yourself and say, well, I'm not praying five times a day. Why am I going to tell them to pray five times a day? This is what's supposed to be from Shaitan. Okay, don't do that. Because by, remind, by being the, in that position and role as a parent, by reminding them, maybe, maybe by those frequent reminders at some point, your heart flips and you realize, subhanAllah, I need to start being more serious about my prayers, right? But if you just abandon it all together, you're, you're leaving your children to, their, to themselves, you're no longer benefiting from, uh, you know, the reminders, and so what happens? It's just everything kind of starts to trip, fall apart. So you kind of have to just say, no, as a parent, it's my duty to make sure they're taken care of and they're doing what they should be doing. And they should, you know, and it's interesting because Spiritually, we may have these conflicts, but then when it comes to other things, I don't think we think we think about it that way. For example, diet, right? Uh, I'm sure all parents, regardless of how they eat, right? When it comes to parenting, we're always like, no, 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 don't eat that. That's not healthy, right? It's too much sugar. It's too much, you know, um, whatever, salt, whatever it is. But we're, we're good about moderating and being moderate with our kids and keeping them on task when it comes to those issues, right? Um, or reading, or you know, education. We're good about those things, and uh, we don't really reflect our own, you know, uh, commitment to those things when we're telling them. Because we recognize, as parents, it's our duty to make sure that they're, you know, safe and that they're eating well and that they're doing their work. So, but for some reason, when it comes to spirituality, I think, and this is a clear sign for me anyhow, that this is what's supposed to from Shaitan, because he's trying to, you know, just divide and conquer, just kind of make everybody sort of independent and slowly kind of fall apart. Whereas, so the remedy to that is no, keep, let's keep each other accountable. Let's do things together. Let's try to pray together, let's re recite Quran together, let's do our dhikr together, right? Doing these things together is the remedy of, uh, because you're a united front against shaitan, right? Especially children, when they're so easily distracted by so many other things. It's a lot easier for them to want to pray if the whole family is praying. Then you're yelling from your room, go pray, Hassan, go pray, the hug. And then every two seconds, did you pray? Oh, I forgot. You know, and then now you get upset with them. 
why not say let's pray together? Because we're stronger when we're together, right? So just having this understanding very from the beginning and applying it across the board will alleviate a lot of the stress that parents put on themselves. When you recognize the importance and the value of doing things in Jama'at, in together. Our deen is a deen of Jama'at, right? We do everything together for that reason, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows we're, when we're alone, we're weak. We're, when we're doing things by ourselves, we, we're, we're, we're weak because our nafs is weak. And then we have, you know, like I said, all these other distractions and shaitan is right there. So it's just, it makes it harder. But trying to do things together is a lot easier. So as parents, keep this in mind, that for my family, I am not going to make spirituality something where I'm just barking orders at my kids and telling them what to do, and I'm doing my own thing, and there's just huge disconnect. But we're going to do this as a family. We have a spiritual family culture that we're creating. Yes, you have a question? Um, sorry, go. I'm not yet. So I, I get the whole doing it together and family. Mm -hmm. And you've probably often heard this where the mom is praying. Yes. The dad is not pregnant. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I come from a similar situation. Right. Um, you know, where my husband is not a regular, you know, five time prayer person. Right. But yet I've got, you know, all boys and you know, there's no girls either besides me and I'm mm -hmm. doing it. And I where do you see this going in future? And right. you know, and I think you already probably have present day situations where parents are coming, Oh, you know, we they pushed, they barked orders, the mom right. did it all the time, all the time. What does that look like in like 10, 5, 10 years for my kids and for me? Right. In I mean, house it's, house. Yeah, that's definitely a challenge. And I mentioned that there are going to be situations where the husband and wife are on two different spiritual paths. But I think ultimately the intention should always be to uh, to bring together the family in, in a beautiful way. If it's like, you know, resentful, like let's say if you want to pray and you have, um, I don't know if you have teenage boys. They're little. They're so little. Like the oldest is nine years old. Okay, mashallah. Soon he'll be at the age where he can lead the prayer. But in the interim, you can still lead them in prayer and teach them and kind of just, again, prepare them for this beautiful role of being the imam. But also it's really good for you to honor your spouse's role in front of them. Mm -hmm. So even if your spouses are praying all five times, of prayer, of the prayers, if he alhamdulillah knows how to pray and he recognizes the value of prayer, it would be really good, I would say, to honor him and just say, you know, mashallah, uh, the, the uh, father the, being the imam of the family, it would be really nice if you could lead us in prayers, why don't you, and tell your boys, go ask Baba, can you please lead us in prayer because you're the imam of the house, you know? Sometimes men need to be reminded of their incredible role in the family, you know, and it's really good for them to hear that. And even if they're not doing all five prayers, just to have that um, support and recognition from the children, from you, to honor him, to honor his place as the leader of the, the household, in, even in spiritual matters, even if he's, you know, personally weak in certain areas, you just keep reminding him, this is your role, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to you, we recognize it, we honor you, this is a, do you see that, what that would do for him as, as being, because every father wants their children, obviously, to look at them in that way, right? To be the hero, right? Every father and mother, we all want that. But it's important sometimes to gently, tactfully, beautifully send those little reminders and not to say, you don't even pray. I, you know, when you come from that place of negativity, it's, it's never going to work, right? And I'm sure you don't do that, but a lot of times, sometimes we can give in to our, our feelings in the moment, work. right? And it doesn't work. But trying the opposite, whenever you give anything um, to someone, who a reminder, packaging is so important. And I, I say this all the time. I'm a true believer and I've done it. I've seen it. I've been a witness to it for many years. That you can relay a message to anybody as long as you're very careful in how you package it. That's why words matter, tone matters, timing matters. You have to be considerate and uh, empath being an empath is being so aware of the other person's, uh, just who they are, and we're gonna kind of talk about that a little bit, um, that you can tailor whatever you want to say to them, as opposed to just dropping a bomb, you know? And a lot of times, sometimes our communication style is like that. I feel something, I just need to drop it, you know, without giving any consideration. Is it going to be received the way you want it to be received? So I think in this situation, just gently, sort of beautifully reminding him of his role as the Imam, inviting him to lead the prayer one or two, you know, whichever prayer that you can, is a good start. And just continuing to nurture that, you know, inshallah. And of course, come to that. Yes? Um, I have a question sure. about prayer. 
So, um, <clears throat> hanging in the mush heap versus mm -hmm. at home. Yes. So in general, um, mostly in the mess we do see men. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious if there's a recommendation either way for men if they can pray, like go to the masjid and pray alone versus staying at home and praying in congregation with your family. That's an or excellent taking them question. to the, the masjid altogether. Right, that's an excellent question, mashallah. And I think, you know, alhamdulillah, I would say every prayer maybe would, would require its own, you know, response. Like if there's certain prayers that are easy for you to, to come to the masjid and do and it's facilitated for you, um, and it kind of works out, you know, that your family you know, either is with you or is at home, but it's sort of easy. That's that's it would be recommended, obviously, to come to the masjid as often as possible. But if you're, it's a hardship for you, and you're kind of forcing yourself, or it's like causing extra stress just to get to the masjid. And then there's other duties at home that also need to be taken care of. You know, I remember a long time ago there was a situation where a sister would complain because she had little ones, you know, and they needed milk and they needed groceries, they needed stuff, but the husband was such a stickler about praying all the prayers at the masjid that he was abandoning his duties at home to get, you know, to do that, and in that case that would be blameworthy. Your rights, uh, you have to fulfill your rights to your family. But if those things are met, inshallah, and then you're able to, and it's not going to cause problems uh, for for your wife and for your family, inshallah, why not? Of course, it's best, especially for the brothers. We know the hadith, there's more reward, inshallah, for praying at the masjid. So, yes, inshallah, I would think that would be recommended then. Mm -hmm. So just a small follow-up question sure. about your opinion. Um, I see there's a big division in terms of bringing your kids to the masjid. Yes. Some people say, yeah, sure, it's great, and then some people mm -hmm. say, Almost it's hot on because they're very distracting. Right. So I'm just curious if you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love kids, and I, uh, you know, I, to me, that's, um, I feel like the masjid, especially in this day and age, we have to do our, like, due diligence to create as many beautiful memories and bonds with the masjid that we can. And that should start off, you know, when they're young. And then people might disagree with me, but I think as long as you have, you know, um, speak to your children and teach them the adab of the masjid, teach them that, you know, it's there's certain spaces that might be okay to play around and be with your friends and, you know, have fun. But in other times, for example, as soon as the prayer starts, you know, have them pray with you. So hopefully that should resolve the distraction during the prayer time, right? But being very clear about the rules, like when the prayer starts, or if there's a speaker, if there's a program happening, you have to play quietly or go somewhere else, but not kind of having, I think, this just free attitude that um, the message is like a playground. I would say not to do that, but also not to say not to come, not to bring them at all. Those are two different extremes that I think we can, the medium is very simple. Inshallah, bring them because we want to create those bonds with them and, you know, and, and have them love the space. But at the same time, uh, with their age, appropriately explaining to them the boundaries, what they can and they can't do. And if you find it's difficult, maybe they're too young. You know, there's some, and I, I, I would say not to fault them for that because children are children, and it's terrible that people get to this place of, of yelling at children and shaming children. Allah, may Allah make us never do that because they're in the world of imagination, they're in the world of play, and they're just being children. But we can weaken ourselves because we know our kids best determine if maybe it's too soon and hold off and, and bring them to programs or, or prayers later but not to have this fear of oh someone's going to scold me no the masjid is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single one of us have a haq to it it's your space as much as it is mine and nobody should ever make you feel like you're not welcome here even if you bring your children but I think you know out of adab all of us should take into the consideration the other congregants and realize if, if our children may be, again, too young and, and too uh, lively and rambunctious, then maybe hold off until they're, until later, inshallah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. So um, we're just, for those who are walking in, we're doing a quick review. You know, this can manifest in a few different ways. A, obviously trying our best to know him and, and study him and study how he was so that we can emulate him, right? So we have to know the Prophet you, It's hard to say, well, follow the Prophet if you don't have deep knowledge of what that means. What does that mean, right? It just, it just, it means to really 
uh, look at how he conducted himself, how he lived, how he existed, how he treated other people, his mannerisms, his disposition, and try your best to to emulate that as as best as possible. On Friday, you know, we were here. I was here filling in for. Dr. Ranya, and uh, we took that time to talk about a very famous hadith that I personally love, that I just feel is, is just summarizes so many things um, that we can all learn from. So I'll just go ahead and read that uh, here for us as well, just so for us to reflect on. So Sayyidina Ali said that the Prophet said, uh, he said about the Prophet said the following. He said he was always cheery of disposition, easygoing and compassionate. He was not boorish or coarse, ruckus or vulgar or critical. He did not overpraise or jest, and he would ignore that which he disliked. He would not dash the hopes of anyone who hoped for something from him, and they would not be disappointed. He withheld from himself three things, debate, excess, and that which did not concern him, and he withheld from the people three things. He would never criticize or disparage anyone. He would not seek to shame anyone. And he would not speak about anything unless he hoped to be rewarded by Allah for it. Okay? So this is, again, just a summary. And you can get a pretty good image and picture of how the Prophet was, right? Just the easygoing, cheerful part, first of all. As parents, Think about that. How are you as a parent? Are you an easygoing, compassionate, cheerful parent? Or are you the opposite, boorish, vulgar, critical? Take yourself into account. Because if you think being, you know, and I know it's praised a lot in this culture, um, and there's, you know, good and bad in everything, but the model that's gotten a lot of popularity is this tiger parenting you know, uh, model, where it's just like being emotionally sort of cut off, very critical, high expectations, high standards, and not to say there's wrong, anything wrong with having high expectations and high standards, but I think even just the image of a tiger parent is, to me, a conflict, because it's very aggressive to me, right? It's very harsh. It's, uh, it's just, it's not uh, something that I would uh, uh, in any way associate with the parenting model that we're taught. Right, the parenting model of the Prophet who was very gentle, right? And so I think we, we can take the good from all of these things that we might find. Okay, well, I like this aspect of it. But if it becomes the way in which we engage our children, where we're just emotionally cut off and we don't ever uh, recognize their good, even if they are doing amazing work where it's just never, you know, if they get A minuses, why isn't it an A plus? You know, that kind of attitude, I, I, don't, I don't think that's in line. Um, with, with the way, with the prophetic model, which is to be, again, easygoing and compassionate, understanding, and to be balanced, right? So you kind of have to just take yourself into account. How, what is my rapport with my children? Do they feel, do, affection is very important. Are you affectionate with your children? Or are you just kind of, you know, because it's not easy for you, it's not comfortable for you, maybe you were raised with an overly affectionate parent, so you're kind of, um, just, you know, yes, you know, you kind of, you know, everything's very, very minimal in that regard, or maybe non-existent. These are all things we have to hold ourselves to account for. Yes? So, like, living, like, where we do, especially in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. I feel like everything is very competitive. Yes. And to keep your kids at that high standard while, like, you know, I mean, we always try to, like, you know, give them that affection and that love mm -hmm. and that love and every, all that stuff, but it's hard sometimes to find that balance between keeping them up to par, and right. also, like, you know, can you elaborate on maybe how Sure. Can... No, I agree with you. We are in a very highly competitive uh, area and time, you know, there's just, it's, there's a lot of pressure on students, but I think checking in emotionally and just being available emotionally is the remedy of that. I, I don't think we should necessarily, like I said, lower the standards in terms of, especially education, and, you know, that is important, and we talked about this, having high standards as Muslims is important. We should be uh, trying to always do our best in everything. So I don't think we need to compromise that, but it's a matter of the tone that I'm speaking about, right? So as long as we're emotionally still giving and loving and understanding, like if your child didn't do well on something, 
instead of immediately reacting to the disappointment of you know the grade that they received and and um, blaming and shaming and getting them angry, which I know a lot of parents do because they're you know they're in mode they're they're just thinking immediately of the repercussions, right? A bad grade, a bad test score is going to affect GPA. It's going to affect college applications, and it's it's just too much stress that we think about, right? So we immediately go to that negative place, but instead really being emotionally connected to your child to say, wait a second, what happened? You know, am I, maybe I need to support you more. You know, maybe your load is high. Maybe you need a tutor. Maybe you need something to really, but that type of then, right? And, and just being willing to be compassionate before you immediately get to that negative place, I think is the- Maybe is how you react. Yes, your reactions, your tone, the um, and pausing before you. I mean, I think the reaction is, is it, it, you know, is, uh, is something that we, we talked about temperaments, which we'll, we'll inshallah go over quickly here. But it, it's helpful to know your own temperament and your children's temperament to kind of figure out a healthy rhythm, right? Because some children don't respond well to that critical, you know, hypercritical parenting style, and you might actually shut them down. Whereas others, have high, you know, they're high achievers, they're high, they kind of are pushed by that almost. So it's really important to be well versed in this for yourself and your children to know what's the appropriate model or, or style for each child. You know, we talked about that too. Every child is different and you have to be so in tune with your children based on their temperament, their personality type, um, to know how to communicate things effectively for them. But the one-size-fits-all model of parenting, or if I'm just, this is who I am and you have to accommodate, you know, that is, I think, what I have a problem, what I'm trying to address. Like, it's negative, it's, it causes problems in other areas. So, inshallah, just being gentle. And that's why I think, again, when we're studying the Prophet's example and we're studying his sirah, it's very clear that in so many ways, I mean, just reading through this, it's always about balance, right? He didn't over-appraise. That's really important too, because you don't want to be the opposite, where your children are making huge mistakes, but then you're so afraid of not of pushing them away that you uh, gloss over everything and you look over everything and you give them passes. And a lot of parents do that too. They're so afraid that I'm going to lose my children, they're not going to love me anymore, so they overlook everything. So the balance is the important part here, right? Being and, and trying to find that. So can I ask one more? Sure, of course, please. So like, so how? So usually how it works in our family is like, you know, my husband is more of a, you know, authoritarian. He kind of gives them that, a little bit of the hardness. Yes. And then I follow through with like being a little bit more gentle with them. And when I work with them, I'll kind of, mm -hmm. you know, you know, try to like calm what he's, what the way he is down. But that's right. his personality. He's a little stronger. Right. And he's, you know, he loves his kids. He does his best to like, you know, give them affection as well. But like when he's in that mode. Yes. That's like how he is. He's very authoritative, and like mm -hmm. so. When I, you know, he sends me back them back to me, and he's like, you know, can you work with them on something? Right. Like, so I try to do it with more like, is that okay? Like that. Absolutely. And this is why when you do the st the study of personality typing, even with your kids, it's so helpful mm -hmm. because what you do is you actually explain that mommy style is this way, Baba's this way. But what it does is just kind of, you know, it, it, it validates everybody's personality differences. And it also lets children know not to take things personally, right? Because if they feel like they're being targeted because, you know, Baba's so critical or, and then mommy's so, you know what I mean? It kind of gives them, I think, a, a false um, uh, impression of what's really happening. It's not a, tar a personal attack on anybody because that's when feelings get hurt. And then there's all these miscommunications. It's a miscommunication, right? But when you explain that, listen, we're all very different and we have different styles, and that when Baba's speaking this way to you, it's because this is literally, and then you kind of, I mean, that's why I love, you know, encouraging families to do this t together because you're giving, you're defining things that are kind of either misunderstood or just not really understood at all, and you're, you're giving uh, words to it, right? So it's like when you see certain behaviors, now you can identify that as, oh, like for example, I mean, when we get to the temperance, I'll explain better, but like, if you see a choleric te uh, per temperament type is someone who's very reactive, right? And so if, you, if they have an intense reaction to something. So if your husband, let's just say, for the sake of this uh, discussion, if he is a choleric personality type, then he would be very reactive and critical and harsh, right? But if your children know 
that, oh, okay, that's just a part of like Baba's personality type that emerges when certain things happen. But internally, he's also, the, he, the, these are all the other positive qualities that Baba has, right? Then it kind of helps them understand, again, this is just who he is and it's who, how he operates, but I'm not going to sit here and think he's just being mean to me. Right, because this is unfortunately in the child's mind. If they don't understand, they'll take it personally, and then all of a sudden it can fracture their their relationship with him. And then that's where the imbalance comes with you, because there's more expectations from you, right, to to to, to help them, and so it can just cause it kind of spirals, right? But when we define these things and actually give, you know, uh, again, um, clarity, it just helps children process things better. So I have, you know. Uh, People that I know, for example, if they see these personality types come out, they'll, instead of labeling even the child or the individual, they'll, it's kind of like an identity that they, that within them, and they'll go, oh, so like, Mr. Choleric is coming out now, right? But it's just a way of, again, you know, kind of not um, teaching children that this is just part of how human be, you know, beings are. We have a design element to our personality type, and... And uh, if you see that, it's okay. Just kind of remember the, their good intentions. This is your father, obviously. He loves you. He cares about you. And, you know, don't, don't take it so personally. He's like that with everybody. He's like that at work. He's like that with me. You know, and it's sort of like, oh, okay, I understand now, right? So that's why uh, the typing of, of, or the temperament testing is so important. And we talked about that the last one. So if you haven't had a chance to see the, the video um, that MCC posted, that's it. Inshallah, it should... Inshallah, the Prophet said, I'm following his sunnah, following his ways. First, that has to start with uh, Sita, studying him, right? Studying his, his story, studying his life, studying everything about him. And so there's different resources we can do that with. We can actually study his, you know, Sita intact. We can study his attributes through the, uh, the Shema'il, his physical attributes. We can study his characteristics, his, his qualities in other ways. Uh, you know, there's a text called by Qadiyad called Ashifa. So there's different resources that actually give you real in-depth analysis of how he was. You can do that self-study or, or study with, with your family and just really bring everybody, again, to the same understanding of how he was and then start really taking yourself into account by how are we emulating his example. So making that important. And then the, the daily du'as that he's left for us, it's very important that we all do our du'as. From the morning when we wake up, and we open our eyes, there's du'a before we enter the restroom, before we get dressed for work or school. Teaching our children all of these things is a good way, again, to connect our heart to the Prophet Sallallahu because he left those du'as for us. So making sure, again, this is part of how our, our family, um, what our family does, the routine, right, of our, our day. And then Friday should be a really special day. Um, you know, I know it's hard because many parents work, but for the parents that are at home or at least get to see their children during the day uh, before, you know, the day is over, the entire Thursday night until the evening of Friday is the day of Jama, right? During that time, there should be a celebratory sort of feel in the home because, uh, you know, the Hadith, the Eid, uh, Friday is the Eid of the believer, right? So we should treat... Friday as a special day and really try to do things together. So whether that's salawat on Thursday night, some extra prayers, or having, um, you know, maybe a, a class on, on sirah, going over a particular hadith, doing something that honors the Prophet ﷺ. These are really important practices that we can all encourage together again. And I hope the theme that of, of doing things as a unit is really getting across, because I want that to be clear, everything we're talking about isn't just individual study or assignments that you give to your kids. Where it's like, here, you know, color this dome of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's masjid, or work on this workbook, or work on this worksheet. No, it's about sitting together as a family and actually having real, in real time discussions and honoring the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that way. And then, um, you know, these are other principles that we should all understand, which again, we're just doing a review. Ihsan and Ibqan, which are uh, excellence, right? Spiritual excellence, meticulousness, and, thought, and thoroughness. So making sure that when we um, are teaching our children about how to be, just how to exist, that they understand this concept of Ihsan to try to also always strive for spiritual excellence, or excellence in everything. Excellence in their work, excellence in how they take care of themselves, hygiene, personal hygiene. They should be clean. Our children should be taught from a very young age to take their cleanliness serious, right? To not walk around, and you know, you see it all the time, kids with like dirty, long nails, uh, you know, or like just food all over their face and clothing. We should 
teach our children to not be comfortable with that. It's not part of our tradition to do that. We, cleanliness is very, very important. But this is all from a young age you can teach this, right? And then in their work, in their schoolwork, in anything they do, in their chores, to not do things, again, just half-heartedly, not really wanting to do it, feeling it's a burden, and then they give you the bare minimum effort. This is something we shouldn't stand for. If they do something wrong, ask them to repeat it at a higher standard. If they don't know how, take the time to teach them. Because if you let these things go, you create habits that will affect their spiritual practice. If they become people or individuals that don't have a high standard for themselves, why would we expect them to be, you know, saintly in their prayers or have, you know, high sort of uh, achievements in terms of their spiritual efforts. They're, they're going to fall short there too because they've never been, you know, pushed to, to, to try to achieve better, okay? So making sure they understand that. And then tafakkur and tadabbur, which is to reflect, to contemplate on the consequences of things. We should teach them these words. So these words we should know. We should know them as, as vocabulary words from our deen and teach them the concepts to their chil our children. To actually reflect is to go outside, to look at you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, to think about what's happening in the world, uh, globally, everything, not just in your own bubble, but to think about the bigger picture, and then to also weigh the consequences of things, to understand that every single action has a, con a, a consequence to it. And when you teach your kids to do that thought process early, then you're building their conscience, right? You're helping them build their conscience, which obviously we want them to have. As Muslims, we want them to, to be able to like really sit there and instead of us telling them right and wrong all the time, that when we're not with them, that they know what not to do. That they know what to do and what not to do. If we're not with them and they're hanging out with their friends, if you built their conscience enough, inshallah, if a, the prayer time comes in, they're going to remember, and even if they have to be that one that says, hey guys, i got to stop playing football or soccer, we're on the court, we're having fun, but it's prayer time. right? If they have to be the one to do it, they will do it, because you've wired them to, build, to have this uh, awareness, to reflect and to weigh consequences of things. So it's very important to do that at a young age. And then muraqaba, to meditate, right? to watch over and, uh, your spiritual heart to really just think about, you know, uh, whatever you need to do individually and to teach your children. Some kids respond well to doing dhikr, some kids like to pray, some kids like to read the Qur'an, right? So, whatever it is. Yes? Yeah. <coughs> so, so, I'm just hearing in terms of what you're saying, in terms mm -hmm. of doing things together. Yes. But I also hear, like, just as adults and parents in the household, I'm mm -hmm. a really um, explicit leader. Mm -hmm. about how we're going to um, commit to the, what we call home training. Yes. Um, and raising our children, like that's just not, it's not accidental. Absolutely. Um, not just osmosis, but the adults really- A hundred percent. Unify. Yes. Um, and cooperate. Um, because I think it's hard to do that. Right. It's not impossible, but you have that, there has to, it's, it's, it has to be like, you know what I mean? Of like, course. Because I think for kids, it sends mixed messages. Um, and it's hard for them to understand, you know, like, with one parent, it's mm -hmm. okay to do this, right. but with this other parent, it's not. I agree. Or, you know, yeah. like, go make salat, but, like, what does it impact? If if our children don't see the impact of salat on us, right. you know, like, that's the best quote-unquote seller, you know what I mean? Absolutely. We're out of salat, and then we're barking, or we're doing whatever. Mm -hmm. Or as adults, we don't apologize to our children when we're in the wrong. Right. You know, so things like that. But I, and so I'm hearing just, you know, in terms of collective. Yes. Um, but also, I think, a collective mindset. Absolutely. As well, you know. That Absolutely. That. No, Jazakal Khan, you're 100% right. We need to, and that's why parents need to be on the same page. Even if, like I said, they're on spiritual different, spiritually different courses, they have to see the common mutual benefit of being on the same page when it comes to raising their children. And not to, to, to do that the whole thing where I was, you know, I don't know if, if you walked in a little late, but I addressed that if you're not doing what you need to be doing spiritually, and you think that because of that, you shouldn't have any part in the spiritual welfare of your children. That's it. That's not. That's not right. Even if you're weak in certain areas, your priority should be to do the best by your children, right? And not to say, just like I said, you know, as far as health or other areas of concern, 
we don't do that whole thing like well it's a reflection right so as, as parents yeah you need to come together and have a very serious conversation like listen wherever we are individually on our path that's between us and Allah may Allah guide us to whatever which is best but when it comes to our children can we please have a united front can we please have a united way of parenting them when it comes to their spiritual practice and all of these things because we have to do right by them we have to give them the best right and if we're going to shortchange ourselves and our own souls that's on us but we shouldn't let that you know affect our way of parenting our children it's irresponsible to do that and i think that kind of also does take some pressure off even maybe secular parents or parents who are just not religious at all because they realize you know what fine I, I, for me myself i mean unless they completely don't believe and you're really dealing with a different set of issues but if they are you know alhamdulillah rec they recognize that they're they're nominally or at least you know in practice in some areas they're muslim but they have short you know comings or they're weak in certain areas i hope that by having a really important discussion with the spouse who maybe is the the more active one that they will see the the benefit of just abandoning their own individual you know it, you know perspectives or, or opinions on certain things and just saying it's about the best for the children and whatever is the best for the children I'm going to do so I'm going to support them praying five times a day I'm going to encourage them to pray five times a day. I have friends who are uh, you know married to to people who are not Muslim but it's the non-Muslim parents who will tell that their children go pray right it's the non-Muslim parents who recognize the value for their children to be doing these things even though they don't do it themselves so this is really good, you know, this is the kind of mindset we should have and, and that's where um, I hope that by attending these types of programs together, right, we can kind of come together, couples can come together with, uh, you know, some, some a mutually uh, understood and accepted agreement about how, how to do this. But you're right, there's, you know, there's definitely, you need a collective mindset in order for this to succeed. And so that, that is, you know, the, the starting ground. If you feel like your spouse might um, be, you know, it's just it's going to be difficult for you. Then present this to them. Like, listen, I want to start doing things differently because our children's souls are at stake here. You know, the world outside wants to devour literally our children's souls. I mean, they're re it's ready. It's just everything's already in place. You know, from from everything you see uh, in social media and media in general, and just the society outside. The you know the 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 spiritual health of the child matters very little. They're just consumers and that's all they are to, to the world outside. So if you really recognize that, then hopefully as, as parents you'll come together inshallah and see what can we do to protect our children and we need to have a united front. So let's start implementing these different things. And then, you know, take pace yourself. This is can't be done overnight if you're not doing it. It's not something that you could just, you know, instantly have everything a certain way. It has to be done by priority. And priority is the prayers are absolutely priority. Connecting with the Palm Slice is absolutely priority. These are things that's why thank you. Thank you for your comment. And so uh, the last point here is muhasaba, you know, self-inventory, again taking yourself into account, teaching your children to do this every day. And this can be done as a as a you know as a dinner discussion even, you know, where everybody kind of looks back at their day and says, what was your, you know, high point? What did you do uh, today that was a good thing that you're proud of? And is there anything that you did that you weren't proud of? And seeing what, what sharing, you know, happens. This is, communication is just so important. You know, I think I, I read something recently about children and how, um, you know, the different distractions they have, whether it's television or social media. And part of the study also accounted for the time that they spent having serious conversations conversations with their parents and it was less than um, I think it was less than five minutes for sure maybe three minutes of actual conversation with their parents on a day-to-day -day basis as opposed to hours online playing video games watching TV socializing with their friends so if you're thinking like you think about that what type of influence could you possibly have with your children if you're barely speaking to them for five minutes a day and then they have all these other influences so when you have these types of practices in place, they force you to do things together. They force you to look at each other, to have conversations, to actually connect emotionally with each other so that you're not just strangers that live in the same home, right, and eat, and eat the same meals, but you actually are communicating about what's happening to you on a daily basis. So that's why these are so important.
Now, just to kind of move quickly again, because we have more content to cover. So, you know, again, two other concepts that um, felt were really important is t teaching our children how to protect their heart by a being simple yeah. in their generosity. Okay, because a lot of times, children, um, mashallah, they do have good yeah. natures and they can be very giving. You know, they want to to be accepted by their peers, they want friends, they want, you know, everybody to love them, so they might give too much of themselves, of their, uh, whatever it is they have, their possessions, their money, their wealth, you see kids getting taken advantage of a lot, so we have to teach our children, that obviously generosity is very important in our faith, but to be, you know, prudent in our generosity, to be wise, and to not feel that you have to always please every single person and give every single thing to, to, you know, to everyone around you, but to just kind of, again, so that, this again, practices, and if you emulate that, then they can follow, obviously, your lead, but just having them, you know, learn that, and then also, very important is to mind their own business. I think a lot of kids, especially when you reach junior high and high school ages, they get in trouble a lot because they're, they haven't been wired to just be like, I'm staying out of that, you know? I, I, they, because everything in this society is about wanting to know, you know? We live in a you know, tabloid society where it's very gossip and like wanting to know everybody's business and now with like social media and like, you know, these instant videos and everybody's got quick little, you know, whether it's memes or whatever it is, uh, up within two seconds when something happens, it's just this, this, um, this need to know everything. But you have to teach your children, and you also also have to again practice this yourself. That I'm not going to care about things that don't have to do with me, and I'm going to turn that just mechanism off. Like I'm just I'm not interested. And uh, and so when they're at school, and if their kid friends are get into something or something's happening, there's a fight or whatever it is. I mean, kids, you know, they they, they get riled up very easily. That if they're again no, like no 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 no, that's trouble. I don't want to be you know I don't want to go down that road then inshallah it will protect them. But these have to be things, again, you talk about as concepts. Because if you're just saying, you know, just saying it, like mind your own business, without connecting it to the spiritual, like this is your hadith, you know? The Prophet have taught us these concepts. But why? Let's have a discussion about it. Why do you think he would explicitly tell us, right? <laughs> why would he tell us that the excellence, part of the excellence of a person's Islam is, my, is leaving that which does not concern us. What do you think? What's the benefit of that? Right? And then kind of letting that get into a family discussion, letting it sink in so that, again, you're planting these ideas, these seeds for them, so that when they're in facing a situation, hopefully, inshallah, we can only pray that it wakes them up, you know? And that's the thing is that we have to know we don't control outcomes. We talked a lot about that during the first session. We just can control what we do. Whatever happens is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what we can do as parents is do our best to protect them, right? So teaching them these concepts. Now, and then we, we went over uh, leadership basics in Islam, which we're going to get to in, in, in a little bit. I'm going to repeat this slide. So, and then we talked about the power of five. So this is, you know, again, something for all of us to just remember and to, to, to know well. That there's this magic ratio, according to experts, called the five to one ratio, and it's a ratio of positive to negative comments. So if you can keep your positive to negative comment ratio to five to one, this is a very healthy standard for any relationship, okay? whether it's your marriage or your relationship with your children. But if you, you know, are more critical or more negative. Then you're, uh, you know, you're 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 setting yourself up for a lot of problems because it's going to build resentment and eventually it might just, you know, cause cause irreparable damage to your relationship. So you really want to again hold yourself accountable as a parent. How positive am I? You know, as a spouse, when I come in home after a long day's work, am I immediately um, negative and just why didn't get this done? Why didn't get that done? Do I hear that from my kids a lot that I'm uh, always annoyed and cranky and upset, or why am I so mad all the time, or my spouse? Do I hear that? If you're hearing that, this is where you have to take yourself into account. How can I change? So just remember, five to one, hold yourself accountable. And then we talked about the five love languages. So again, very important for all of us to um, to study. This is uh, 
a book, I can't remember if it's Chapman or John Gray. I don't think it's John Gray. I think it's maybe. Is it Chapman? Okay, Chapman, thank you. Um, that he wrote this book on the five love languages, and this is very helpful because you need to know how you want, you love, how you want to be loved, and teach that to your spouse first and foremost, and then your children, and, and also learn how they want to be loved. Because it's important, not everybody loves the same. We don't communicate exactly the same. And this is why really getting in touch with yourself is so important in terms of knowing who you are, what your needs are, which is what the theme of, of our conversation will be today, inshallah, a little bit more on this. So, you know, um, and then we talked about the temperaments, the four temperaments in Islam. We kind of went through this. So I'm just going to, again, go through this quickly because this is, a lot of this content is available on the previous video. You can go through it. But we talked about this ancient science of the four temperaments that was um, founded by Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, and then later developed by Galen, another Greek philosopher, and then Ibn Sina. And they had this idea, basically, that human behavior can be determined based on different fluids and the balances of different fluids in the system. And so if you take a test, uh, it'll help you determine what your temperament is, and then it identifies different characteristics and qualities of each temperament. I know the slides that are really small, but the four temperaments are, the first one is a choleric, is an intense sort of personality type. They're type A, very high achieving people, high standards, very reactionary, extroverted. Um, and so they have, you know, good positive and negative qualities, but it's, uh, you know, they like to have it their way. They like control. So again, you should know, is this who I am? Is this, does this kind of relate to me? Am I the type of person that really does like to have things done my way and it's hard for me to give up control to other people? And if I'm reactionary, you're likely a choleric, okay? Um, excuse me. Then we have um, Sanguine, which is also an extroverted personality type, but they're a little different. They're reactionary, but they're more the bubbly life of the party, very uh, popular. They, they just really like connecting with people. They're chatty. They're always, you know, just kind of always in a good mood, it seems like, okay? Um, and so, again, the, the popularity and being well-known and well-liked is really important for them. So if you're a people pleaser, if you're just always eager and, and the one that says yes to everybody's requests and you're always available to help people, then you likely are a sanguine, especially if you have that really cheerful disposition that we talked about earlier. And so again, knowing this for yourself and then trying to figure out um, who everybody is in the family is also very helpful. But there's actual tests um, you know, we're just kind of going over it, summarizing these things quickly, but they're tests to help you determine what you are. Then we have phlegmatic. These are more peace-loving, very calm uh, energy people. They just like, um, you know, harmony. They're very relationship-oriented. They're not very reactionary at all. They're kind of the more subdued, passive personality type, okay? Um, and it takes time for them to, 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 you know, confront issues and problems. They're not like the type that are you know, going to take things on head on, they need to process, very thoughtful people, okay? And then the last one is the melancholic. These are your um, introverted, uh, highly analytical, very pragmatic, black and white world. You know, you either, it's right or wrong, you know, and uh, they, they can be very, very critical. Um, and they're, they're hard to kind of uh, open up emotionally. It's not easy for them. So they can be an enigma. It's very hard to figure them out. So if you or your spouse is like that, again, it's good to know this because it can help you determine what areas you might need to work on. Because it's not to say that just because these are your, this is your temperament, that's it, you just accept it. No. Every single one of us from a spiritual perspective has our own mujahida, right? Our own uh, struggle. And our struggle individually is to better ourselves to make ourselves in line with the Prophet Sallallahu Whatever that means, whether it's working on the diseases of the heart or working on, again, looking at the way that we engage with other people. If people, like and we talked about this on Friday too, but if you walk into a room and you have a heaviness and a constricting presence, you're not warm and welcoming, you can be cold, and people might have told you that, that you're very uh, cold and you're just seeing, you know, like you're just not, you don't have that warmth. This is something that you want to work on. It's not, you shouldn't be like, well, it's just who I am. No, because it's not in line with the, the Prophet's license example. And his example is what we're all supposed to try to come, you know, to, to, to meet. Wherever you are in this, you know, spectrum, we all have something to work on. 
And so we have to recognize where we are, though, first. And then we can recognize where we have to go, right? What we have to do to get there. So this is very important to take these tests, and you can find them online. There's a book I recommended called The Temperament That God Gave You. Um, and you can look it up in the library. There's, you know, copies of Barnes & Noble if you just want to skim through it first. Uh, or purchase it right away from Amazon or whatever your options are that, uh, or you prefer. But there's tests in that book, and there's also online tests that you can take that help you determine your temperament and then help you with your children. Now, this is a study that I would say don't just keep it to yourself. You have to share it with your family. Have your spouse take the test. Have each child take the test. Yes, even younger children can take the test. You can help them take it. It's just a questionnaire. But what that does is it gives you something to work with. Because now I understand, wow, okay, if I'm a choleric and everybody else is a melancholic, for example, wow, that's pretty serious, you know, intense you know, personality types that we all have in the home. No wonder maybe sometimes our conversations are hard, right? Or if you have a, you're a sanguine, and you're just always chipper and happy and you're dealing with a spouse who's just very serious and not easy to connect with and you're like man I can't no matter what I do everybody loves me I, I love everybody but this just can't get through to him or her then this again it helps to for you to realize like you know what don't take it personally it's not that he doesn't or she doesn't love you it just might very well be that this is their personality type and that you have to now uh, work with it and there are ways you know to, to, to or areas where you can study further to figure out how can we um, work better when we have different uh, conflicting or completely oppositional personality types okay so this is sort of a summary of um, again our last session now for today uh, you know again because we're talking about um, you know that, that list that I kind of skimmed through uh, before, I want to go back to that real quick. But before we get there, in the very first session we talked about this hadith. Okay, Ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyati. Okay, this is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Very important that you, you know this hadith, okay? It's very, it's longer, but the short of it is right there. Every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his or her flock. We talked about this because this hadith is, is is in my you know opinion and I'm sure many uh, people would agree is is I think the best analogy for parenting okay because it talks about shepherding the idea that the shepherd what is what does the shepherd do what is their objective right the shepherd's sole objective is to do three things to nurture to guide and to protect their flock right is that not the objective of all of us as parents? Don't we want those same three things? To nurture, to guide, and to protect our children. So in every way, when you look at the behavior, the actions, the, 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 the tasks of a, of a shepherd, they're very similar to that of a parent. Okay? And we kind of dissected this very thoroughly, looking at you know, just the way the shepherd walks, his staff. We kind of picked each part of the shepherd and went into what that means, and we concluded and that these uh, objectives uh, that he, um, or excuse me, these things that, that the shepherd aims for to nurture, guide, and protect um, can be achieved only through, or not only, but, but through three key objectives, which are what? Control, okay, through education and skills. So if you want to do, if you want to nurture, guide, and protect your children, you need to establish control first. You need to know what you're doing. Shepherd doesn't even walk out there without knowing how animals behave, without knowing how to feed them, how to, you know, protect them. He needs to acquire knowledge, right? Then reach, and this is done through communication and creativity. And then safety, uh, and that's done through planning and precaution. So as parents, we're going to talk about how what the what these three objectives mean. So we're kind of in these first few sessions focusing on that first objective, which is control, establishing control. All of us are here, obviously, because we want to be more effective in our parenting. We we're having these discussions because we want we're you know we're, we're we want to hold ourselves in to to a higher standard and learn how to do things better. And so this is where education matters. We have to start with education, right? And and learning about personality, human behavior, temperaments, child children, how children behave, right? The needs of children. Um, 
And then also, obviously, from a spiritual perspective, what our rights and obligations are. We're trying to understand all of that. And then we're looking at different parenting models, different psycho psychological tools that are out there. So we're in the education phase right now. So these workshops right now, that's what we're doing. And so for today, I wanted to talk about this, um, you know, the slide that I had before about leadership basics in Islam. So if we recognize, right, for effective parenting, we, we need to understand, I mean, for, from again, going back to education, you can't be an effective parent if you're not an effective leader, right? If you don't know how to lead, you're not going to be able to be a parent because parenting is literally leading. That's what you're doing. So what are the uh, goals? The ones that are underlined are what we're going to talk about today. Understanding ourself well, our own needs, understanding the, the other people in our care well, that includes your spouses and your children, and then their needs. So these four areas are where all of us should be right now, if, especially if you're attending these sessions. Inshallah, your objectives, as I said, are clear. So you should be in this mode of trying to figure out yourself first, okay? And I know when you think of parenting, it's like immediately we want to jump into children. Yeah, that's important, but again, it's so much related to us as individuals. If we're not clear on who we are, how do we possibly understand our children and then effectively lead them? If we're neglecting ourselves, we don't, we're not you know, in tune with who we are. So it has to start with the self. And of course, you know, this is another you know, maxim in our tradition. Whoever knows their, their nafs well, right, their, their themselves well, they'll know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala well. So if we want to spiritually develop and become better, we have to start with self-knowledge, okay? So let's just get into the discussion. Do you know what you need? If I asked you what does any human being need to survive, what would you say? What is it? Depends. Basic, okay, basic, basic survival needs of a human are what? Food, Food water, shelter. water, shelter, air, right? I mean, air, I mean, subhanAllah, we're feeling that right now, are we not? Right, we're, we're in a situation where subhanAllah, I'm sure, maybe it's been a long time since, since many of us made some serious shukr for clean air, right? Right, but that's something we take advantage of, or we take for granted, you know? We, we, uh, we don't realize what a nema it is to have clean air. But now that we're breathing through masks and coughing every two seconds, we suddenly are aware of that, right? So these are very basic human needs. That's pretty easy to figure out, right? We all need shelter, we all need uh, food, water, air, we need love, right? But what about thriving? What does a human being need to thrive, to become their best optimum self? Okay? And is there a correlation? I'm sorry? A sense of security. A sense of security. Very good. Alhamdulillah. Yes, absolutely. And obviously from a spiritual perspective, I mean, if you want to thrive or succeed, you cannot do that without nurturing, right? Your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, uh, that, and that's, for, for us, it should be very clear. The measure of success, according to our tradition, is right, it starts and ends right there. Where are you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So if you want to see uh, yourself reach your highest potential, you can't do that if you're only focusing on material wealth and gain or other things, right? It has to be done through that process of I need to really work on my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if, as long as I'm focused there and I'm committed there and I'm proving myself there, inshallah that's the measure of success, right? That's the ultimate <coughs> so we should be clear on that. So let's, you know, this is a quote from uh, Maslow, okay? And I wanted to just read this quote. So for the man who is extremely and dangerously hungry, no other interests exist but food. Life itself tends to be defined in terms of eating. Anything else will be defined as unimportant. Freedom, love, community feeling, respect, philosophy may all be waved aside as fripperies which are useless since they fail to fill the stomach. Such a man may fairly be said to live by bread alone. But what happens to a man's desire when there is plenty of bread and when his belly is chronically filled? At once, other and higher needs emerge, and these, rather than physiological hungers, dominate the organism. And when these, in turn, are satisfied, again, new and still higher needs emerge, and so on. 
This is what we mean by saying that the basic human needs are organized into a hierarchy of, rel of relative propotency. Okay, so what is this? This is, again, in other words, in order for human beings, for us to achieve higher, to aim higher, to feel more motivated towards being better, we have to make sure that our innate needs are first fulfilled. Okay? And then, so that's obvious, the food, shelter, water. And then that gives us, once those are fulfilled, it gives us energy to motivate ourselves to seek out higher things, okay? So why is this important? Because when it comes to parenting, we have to see where are we in terms of this hierarchy? What are we, type, what, where are we in terms of providing this, first for ourselves, and then for our children, okay? So let's look. So this is... Um, the hierarchy that he's outlined. So he, and it starts from the bottom. So I, I wrote it in reverse, but it, it goes up. So physiological needs must be met first, then safety, love, belonging, esteem, and then self-actualization. And that's like the highest level. When you've reached that place, that's when you become your best version, okay? But in order to get there, according to this theory or you know his 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 uh, idea is that you have to meet all these other first so here's a visual for you so physiologically if we can meet our basic needs right then we're able to move past those needs and we can focus on the next set of needs which are security uh, of employment right of resources family health prosperity uh, property now i want you to think if you are having problems in your home in your marriage, in your health, at work. Do you see what happens is you get stuck because your needs aren't being fulfilled. So when you're stuck, it's hard to go to the next place. And so I want every every person, and this is again in order to, to in order to for us to you know see ourselves in this, but also look at our homes, look at the people in our lives that, that matter, especially when it comes to marriage. You should look at your spouse and see where are they, where am I versus where are they? Because if you're having you know marital issues and it's affecting your house and it's just causing a lot of problems, issues. What are what's happening? Why am I at some place and my spouse isn't there or vice versa, right? And so this kind of helps you understand that that if you are in a place, let's say you are in a place of um, you know self-actualization where you're just wanting to really spiritually, you know, you have all these ambitions and goals, you want to take classes, you want to, you know, go on these incredible trips, you want to make Omra, you want to do Hajj, you know, a lot of, there's couples, I, I've talked to several, where it's like one is on that trajectory, they just have such high aims and goals, and then their spouse isn't quite there, right? And they're frustrated, because it's like, you know, I want them to be there, they're not listening, they don't, you know, they don't, they're not really there. Maybe if you understood where they are with their needs, it might give you some understanding and perspective. Maybe your needs are met. Maybe, alhamdulillah, you came from a family and an upbringing where you were loved, right? You had plenty of, of a security growing up, right? Because we have to take these things into consideration. If you come from a household where your parents were together and they were very affectionate and your siblings and everybody's just super lovey-dovey and then you, you never had to worry about your meals and, you know, everything was taken care of for you, you had you know, a lot of privilege and opportunity, and then, you know, you, it obviously, I mean, look at this, if, if you get all of these things, it leads to the next level. So if you have safety, it leads to love and belonging. So you have a lot of friends, your family relationships are secure, everything just sort of, mashallah, beautiful. And then that leads to what? Higher self-esteem. You're more confident. You're more, uh, you know, maybe outgoing, right? You're more social because your, uh, your confidence level has been facilitated with all these needs being met. And so then that takes you to the next level where it's like, okay, kids are growing up. Now I want to develop myself. I want to start taking classes. I want to do this. I want to find, you know, and there's people who are like that. They're in this place, but then they look at their spouse. Spouse isn't quite there, right? Spouse is, is still, they're not, you know, maybe spiritually there. They're negative. They're closed off emotionally. Uh, there's some, well, let's get to the root of it. Where, where's the disconnect? Have you figured out, are there needs being met? So this is where you have to look at yourself. Are my needs being met? Do I feel um, you know, safe and secure? Or am I worried about 
my home and having a roof over my head, you know, my, paycheck to paycheck. I mean, if you're living like that, especially here in the Bay Area, that's going to cause you a lot of stress, is it not? There's people who are literally struggling. They don't know what if, if they're going to have a job at the end of the week or at the end of the month. And then they have to worry about bills and, and kids' school and, and all the other stuff that, ha you know, payments and insurance and everything else that pay people really, you know, worry about. So how is that going to affect... Again, all these other areas and parts of, of, of you that you want to obviously develop and you want to become better and you want to improve on, but if you're stuck because a need isn't being met, do you see how it's going to prevent you from growth? So it's important to understand where your needs are and then to see how can we remedy that? What can we do? Because if you're just expecting, sometimes I think we look at people um, not, you know, with, with really true understanding. We just look at them as, as a whole. And if we're not happy with the whole, we're just not happy with the whole. But when you actually start to understand the different, you know, look at looking at a person as, as being much more uh, multifaceted, you know, and there's different things happening that are independent of you and not making everything about you, then you increase your empathy for them, you increase your understanding for them, and you can maybe hopefully try to help them to realize, like, you know what, maybe you're, you know, you're in this situation or you're not feeling, you know, motivated because this particular need isn't being met. Let's focus on that, right? So this is something that's very important to study because, and we're going to talk about how um, this affects children as well. So, um, Let's actually get to that slide. So for children, it's similar, very similar, um, but we should know this is what children need. So as parents, first work out your own needs, determine what areas you need more of or what you need to work on. And that's why you know I've talked about this in many previous sessions, but if you are feeling emotionally depleted or there's just, you're just not, you're not, there's something you know is wrong or you know that, we all, I think, have a pretty good, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, sort of just, uh, w we know when something's off, right? So listen to yourself. Listen to that part of you that says, you know, you've been pretty down for a long time. You've been um, unhappy. You've been unsatisfied, whether it's with your work or with your family life, or maybe there's a relationship that's very toxic and it's affecting you and it's affecting your own com confidence, your own just happiness altogether. Just sitting in that um, and being, you know, defeated and not really having a plan of action obviously only exacerbates your problem because it's a vicious cycle. You're going to stress and worry about it, and that stress and worry causes other problems, right, physically, mentally, emotionally. So just, you know, realize that you have to be in tune with yourself and realize if you're not happy about something, there are ways to, inshallah, get, you know, to get relief, whether it's spiritual and you just khalas are going to become, I don't know, if there's something like if it's a health matter and, you know, you there's really no course, may Allah give you shifa, of course, we always have hope with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but if you're in a situation where you have a health problem that you just really don't have much, uh, you know, way of, of, of fixing or, or, or uh, curing, then your remedy could be just spiritually, I'm just going to focus on my connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and really try to, to, to do whatever I need to get, you know, to just to, to strengthen that. But if there's other things, like if it's a relationship issue, you know, for there's so many now opportunities for you to get help. There's so many opportunities for you to actually work on improving that relationship. But actually feeling inclined to doing that instead of just saying, well, it is what it is. God, I can't do anything about it. And a lot of people have that very complacent attitude about their problems. Like, I can't do anything about it. Just I just got to deal with it. No, that's a shaitan. He wants you to be in despair. He wants you to be miserable. But subhanAllah, our deen is not a deen of hopelessness. Right? We should never uh, feel settled with being hopeless. And so if you have needs that need to be met, you have to look around and say, where are the resources that I can get help? And be willing to be vulnerable, be willing to share with people, obviously professionals, with people that are, you know, I'm not saying to go out there and just complain about your problems to everybody, but seek out help. I think for some reason, I, I you know, in the work that I do, I just feel like there's just this, you know, give it up. People have just given up in so many different areas. It is to their own detriment. 
And uh, so that's why it's so important, again, to have these conversations and to be self-aware, to realize, like, I shouldn't be settled. If I'm not feeling happy, I need to work on it. I need to figure out what that, what, what the solution is, and actually be empowered to do something about it, inshallah. But if you're not aware of your needs and you just don't care and you're just living robotically and mechanically and your whole day is just going to work and coming back and eating and sleeping and there's just no deep connection with your soul, then yeah, you're, that's just your existence. And eventually, you know, you're just going to wither away and that's it, that's that's it, that's all. That's that's the chapter of your life, you know, that's, I mean, that's the, the story of your life, you know. Just someone who was okay with misery and just didn't really want to do anything further. No, we have to push back against that and say, no, Allah subhanahu wa yes, trials and tribulations are part of this dunya, but we always have hope. We always expect better, and we are always to strive for better, right? So meeting our needs first, and then looking at our children's needs. So children, they need the same. They need the physiological needs met first, so making sure we're providing for them healthy, obviously, food, um, sleep, making sure their sleep is, is you know, is good, and, and not, you know, especially if you have teens, Please, and I, I'm, you know, that no, no teenager has, <laughs> has paid me to say this, but I really, because I work with teens a lot, and I remember, I really remember my own struggle as a teenager. We as parents have to be much more sympathetic to our teens because they're going through major physiological changes, and sleep is a huge need. I have literally done, uh, you know, sessions with teens, and I'm like, what is the one thing that you, if you could have the most of? They're not talking about money and fame and wealth. They're li they will say sleep. That's the first answer. But I think a lot of parents, you know, especially if you, again, come from that, you know, highly critical, you know, parenting model, it's just like, no, get up, stop being lazy. And you're always barking at your children for wanting to sleep. That's not fair. They're going through major, major changes, and we have to be a little bit more understanding. It's just like the infant. The infant's brain is going through all these changes, right? And we don't wake up an infant who needs to sleep for long stretches of a time because they're changing. We understand that. Adolescents go through the same process just years later. So be more understanding about your teen's need for sleep and try to accommodate it. Do you want a nap? We can nap before we have to go to this party. Why don't you go take a nap? It's okay. I'll do this. I'll do, you know, just to help. Look at that. Be more sympathetic because it's a, it's a basic need. And then you want them to go and you know, write or work on uh, projects for hours and hours on end and be up until one o'clock in the morning because you better not turn that in late. And we're just so intense with that, but then we don't realize that we're not meeting their basic need, but then we want them to achieve, you know, in this very intense, high pressure, you know, uh, competitive time with, a, with a, you know, it's, just, it's too much. Yes, I think it, is your hand up? Yes, please. Yeah, that's just how it a lot of ways, you know, I'm sympathetic because I'm learning. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I realize as a parent, like, yes. you're an elementary teacher, a middle school teacher, and a high school teacher. <laughs> and your strength might be in elementary when your kids are in middle school. You know yes. what I mean? But I also wonder, just my struggle just in terms of father and teenagers, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Whether it is five or six, or even at the latest in a father. Mm -hmm. And that dichotomy of, okay, I know you need to sleep, but also it's not right. about it. You know what I mean? And so just that struggle right. um, is real. No, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because it's important. If you're waiting for your teens to become teens and then you expect them to pray Fajr, this is what I would say is a problem. Prayers need to start, what are the age? Between 7 to 10 is when you start disciplining and teaching your children how to play. By 10, they should be praying their five prayers. So I think that's pre-adolescent. What you're doing is you're creating habits for them before they reach the age of like, you know, feeling like a log in bed and they can't, they literally feel like they can't get up. It's, they're, they've already accustomed their muscles to it, they know, their brains are wired, you know, my, my son, alhamdulillah, he's, he's turning 10 next month, but this year, since uh, Ramadan, alhamdulillah, he's been praying all of our, all the prayers with us, and mashallah, may Allah protect and preserve it for him, but he is our alarm clock half the time, he wakes up way before us. And he'll be the one who comes and wakes us up for Fajr. Because he's nine years old, but we started him for that reason. And this is the wisdom of Islamic parenting. Because they tell you, start early. Don't wait until they're 12 and 13. And now it's like, oh, it's fun of them. You have to do it. And you're intense and you're pressuring them. And then you wonder why it's hard for them. They haven't been habituated to it. So I would say work early on establishing that practice for them. But also be understanding that if, you know, 
look at their sleep um, because uh, understand how sleep cycles work. Like I had to educate myself about sleep cycles because I didn't know, and you know, if there's any physicians in the room, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe like a full, good quality, uh, you know, block of sleep is about an hour and a half, and this is how you when you hit REM and you actually can feel if you wake up and you feel like a little bit refreshed, it's because you've gotten your deep sleep and it takes about an hour and a half for a cycle. So if you are uh, not timing your sleep and fudger so that you can hit those marks, what's gonna happen is you might wake them up in the middle of that one and a half hour block and that's when you get the, ugh, I can't get up, right? So we should educate ourselves, like, you know what, time your sleep so that by the time fudger comes, Inshallah, you will have you're not completely you know burdened, and this all of us can learn from this. If you have a hard time with fudger, I bet you it's because that's what's happening. You're interrupting the middle of your sleep cycle, and that's why it's so difficult. Because the, this whole you know, and I don't know, I, I you, you read different things, and I get it. There's different you know studies that are done, but I think there's this feeling that sleep, you have to get this number of sleep, uh, and everybody, if you don't get a certain number of hours of sleep, you're just, you know, you're going to be, you can't function. That's not the case for everybody. Many, many people can function on very little sleep per night because they know how to time their sleep cycles accurately. So that's why, you know, I mean, in our tradition, for example, it's it's known, you know, the Prophet he did the hijjah every night. And many of the greatest, they would, they were known to sleep very little at night because their nights were meant for worshiping Allah. But what did they do? They compensated during the day. They would take naps. Even, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah was to do the qaylula, which is the nap, after, afternoon nap, right, between the and Asr. So this, or, or was it Asr and Maghrib? Asr and Maghrib? Asr and Maghrib, right? So, uh, but, but, you know, to do those prayers during that time, this is a practice. But why? Because it's, again, wisdom. It teaches us that... Sleep is like a nafs, right? If you indulge it and you become habituated to sleeping stretches of 10 hours, don't think that oh, that's just me. I love to sleep. I like to I need to sleep that much. No, you've just, you know, accustomed your body to wanting that type of sleep because you've given in to this, you know, to this, to this habit. Train yourself, you know, and start being smart in how you sleep. It's not quantity, it's quality. So with your children, do the same thing. If they're having a hard time with certain prayers, Target that. Look, let's look at when you're sleeping, and let's wake up at times that are going to not interrupt that cycle, inshallah. And then, you know, inshallah, they can, if they have time after they pray, go back to bed, get another little quick, you know, cat nap before they have to get up for school. But be understanding is what I'm saying. If on the weekends they don't want to go to every family party because they'd rather sleep, don't uh, be angry with them. Stop and say, you know what? Okay, it's okay. You know, your needs are also important. Because I think sometimes we, we put our own needs first and, you know, they're going to get mad and they're going to have to answer to these people and they're not, not going to understand. Well, you know what? They, maybe they need to understand. Maybe they need to understand that your children are, you know, overscheduled and overburdened and they're exhausted and they're human beings. So you have to be the defenders sometimes of your children and not give in to the pressure of I'm going to get, you know, uh, yelled at or someone's not going to like me. You know what? You can't cater to everybody. And that's just, I think we just have to stop doing things on those, you know, pretenses because we uh, compromise our relationship with our children. If you're willing to literally, you know, be, uh, you know, have no sympathy for your child for the sake of someone else that you might see once a year, I mean, to me, that's very strange, you know? Why don't you tell that person, I'm sorry, they couldn't make it, you know, and let your child know, I love you, I know you're so exhausted, you work so hard during the week, may Allah bless you and give you tawfiq in all you do, because I'm so proud of you, you get to home, stay home, just, stay, just rest, you know, there's food in the fridge, enjoy your time, I mean, what kind of a relationship are you going to inculcate with your child if that's the kind of parenting model you have, where you literally know their needs and you understand their needs and you don't... Uh, dismiss their needs as being frivolous little teenage complaints and whininess and laziness and stuff like that. But this is, you know, again, being aware of our needs, being aware of their needs. This is what the educate. This is why this education is so important because it connects you, you know, to them where they're at, not where you're just standing and you're expecting them to meet you where you're at. You know, see where they're at. You know, build that understanding. So. Um, Again, physiological needs are the most base. Then they need obviously safety and security. Okay? And this is where, as adult, uh, you know, as adults and caretakers, we have to make sure that they're.
their needs are met, we have to be vigilant, make sure that who they are around, um, that they're safe, you know, around the people that we expose them to or leave them with. So that's our duty and making sure that, you know, even when it comes to their, um, their health, you know, making sure they have adequate health care and they're obviously free from any type of abuse and neglect. So if you have an abusive, um, you know, personality type where you, you know, are really hard on your kids, you got to take yourself into account here. You're not meeting their basic need of safety and security and you will not and you cannot expect them to become better and to become the better versions of themselves if they're living in fear. You know, they're living in fear because you're, you're abusive. You know, unfortunately, this, these are very common issues in our community where parents are, are very, very you know, abusive towards their kids and they don't realize that that type of, t there's no such thing as, you know, that whole tough love excuse. No, it's not tough love to, to be abusive and to use mean names and nicknames or, or just be really hard on your children. That's not any form of love. Um, and then we have uh, also their social needs. So the, so the next, you know, once their safety and security is met, then you need to make sure that they have obviously unconditional love from you, but also other, um, their peers and have interactions with people in their own peer group. They have plenty of play. We talked about young children, especially before the age of seven. They need play. You have to give them room to play and not shush them, quiet them, stop it every two seconds. That's not normal. If you have a noise issue, then just remove yourself. But and I'm t speaking for, as someone who, as I'm getting older, I'm noticing my sensitivity to noise more and more. But I've had to also do that for myself. And my husband, Marshall, he's the one who's like, no, just let them be there wrestling. They're, you know, they're they're loud. We have, you know, or it's a it's a home, but there's there's rooms that I could go to, but sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm already settled into my space, but I'll have to get up and go because I realize they need that outlet. They need, you know, they need to play. So we have to, you know, watch ourselves as, as adults and realize these are needs that, that we have to meet for them. And then um, esteem, you know, making sure that we encourage them that they are protected. If, if you know if your children are in a school setting where they've reported to you that they are being bullied and you're just like, oh, I, I had a conversation with a teacher and that's it. No, it, you have to make sure it's shut down it, because the child may not feel inclined to talk to you about it again because it's embarrassing, right? Like, if, and sometimes you'll just think, well, I don't hear anything. I guess that everything's fine. That's passive parenting. You can't just wait for your children to always tell you everything. There are usually signs to problems. You know, if they're not speaking very much, if they just seem a little more agitated, irritable, and their their schoolwork, you know, is going down. Pay attention to the to your children. Sometimes parents, because we're so overburdened and all, you know, we're doing so much. It's like if there's no if there isn't a fire right in front of me, I guess there's no problem. You know, I don't have to worry about it. But there could be embers. There could be sparks. You know, underneath. And they're just waiting to ignite. So how about being vigilant? And if you, you know, being in touch with the teachers, making sure that any type of bullying is absolutely eradicated from their life, so that you, you know, they don't have that pressure. If they keep complaining to you, they don't want to go to school. Like every other day, they're making excuses. I'm sick. I'm not feeling good. That's probably a sign something's going on. Find out who it is. Talk to those parents. If it's a, you know, if it's an Islamic school, um, obviously, you know, you have more opportunity, but even if it's in a public school, talk to the teachers, talk to the administration, be that nagging parent. Do it for your children's sake because we are in a crisis. We're in a time where children are, and it's happening even in our own community. This uh, topic of suicide is not something that we can say oh, it doesn't happen. No, nope, it happens, and it has happened, stuff for a while. And children have expressed these very horrible, um, you know, ideas to, to, to people because, you know, that, that's where they're at. They, they feel like they don't have any other so you have to be your child's advocate. This is a basic need, making sure that they're protected from bullies and that they have, um, you know, safe and, and good companions to be around. Okay. Did I see a hand up? No. Okay. And then, um, and then uh, obviously self-actualization. This is what we all want for our children. We want them to be successful in every which way. But this can be encouraged through looking at what their interests are, hobbies. Really trying to connect with your children to figure out what their interests are instead of just giving them a list of things that you think are better for them. If you're forcing your kids to take piano lessons and they tell you, I hate it. Why? Just because you can go brag to your family, oh, they play the piano? 
It's crazy. If they have no desire to do piano, don't let them do piano. If they have no desire to be, you know, doing anything, a sport, if they don't, if your boys are not athletic, it's okay because not every boy has to be an athlete. Okay, some boys are, are just not interested in running around all day and sweating. They would actually rather go and maybe, you know, learn something and produce something. They have, you know, more other, build something. So encourage that, nurture that, and don't hold them to these standards like, oh, this is, you know, how, this is the only successful uh, model of what it means to be a boy or a girl. Get out of that type of thinking and actually be in tune with your children. Listen to them, ask them. What do you 